had saved the revolution at Valmy. But they were anything but throwbacks to the age of chivalry. True, like the aristocratic officers of the old regime, they saw war as a test of the self. But unlike those officers, they did not see this test as involving primarily skill, precision, and elegance. They did not see it as a performance grounded in rigid mastery of the body and emotions. To the contrary, they saw it as a test of a person's very essence, his moral qualities and intentions. It was not a question of self-control, but of self-expression. In the hallucinatory images of fighting at close quarters, weapons ripping into the flesh of enemies, can be seen the same exaltation of death, the same hope for regeneration through blood that ran through the Girondin War rhetoric of 1791-92. to An allegorical sans culotte print entitled 500,000 Republicans Defending the Constitution illustrates precisely this fascination with elemental, physical combat. At the back, farthest from the action, are cannon, and below it stand soldiers with muskets, although mostly raised up, with their bayonets in the air like pikes. But, in the foreground, the weapons are pikes, swords, axes, and in the center, a sans culotte swinging a huge, exquisitely primitive wooden club. Coupled with these images of sweaty masculine aggression were ones of sacrificial death and martyrdom. In September 1793, the convention began to publish Collection of Heroic and Civic Actions of French Republicans, a periodical whose readers may well have numbered in the millions. It was distributed free to schools, political clubs, and the armies. Its editors liked nothing more than gruesome accounts of heroes doing their best to die bloodily for France. For instance, Felix Caban, grenadier in the 3rd Battalion of Garrus, hit with a bullet in the thigh at the Camp in Sar, fires 20 cartridges and sustains the shock of the enemy cavalry. Taken to the hospital, he pulls out the bullet with his corkscrew. On 23rd July, he receives a bullet wound on the back of the head, but fires 200 cartridges and kills six Catalans with a knife. On 23rd August, a cannonball falls at his knees and buries him with earth, while another makes a deep gash in his right side. At the same instant, a poisoned bullet penetrates his hat, gouges out an eye, and remains lodged in the right eye socket. Carried to the hospital, he falls into a state of asphyxia that makes him seem dead. They are ready to bury him, when suddenly he cries out, Wretch, you want to bury me alive? I still have some blood left to shed for my country. The convention itself played host to a steady parade of the atrociously mutilated, over a hundred altogether. Soldiers without arms, without legs, with terrible chest wounds, even one who had lost the upper jaw, nose, bones, eyes, and eye sockets. None of us would refuse glory at the price it cost you, Carnot declared to him, unconvincingly. Most spectacularly, a virtual cult of martyrdom developed around two very young volunteers, Joseph Barra and Agricole Viala, who had been killed by counter-revolutionary rebels. The report of the 13-year-old Barra's death reached the convention in December 1793, and Robespierre praised it as a perfect example for French youth. On cue, Writers rushed to produce speeches, stage plays, and poems commemorating the boy. The painter Jacques-Louis David left an astonishing, unfinished painting of the dying Barra. It bears little relationship to the actual circumstances of the boy's death, and the general who first reported the case later protested, I think he should be shown as he was when he received the final blows on foot holding two horses by the reins, surrounded by brigands, and replying to them, 
You fucking brigand, give you the arses? Certainly not. David's figure, naked, androgynous, unmarked, and serene, neither conveys the story of the real Bara's pluck, nor tries to evoke the horror of the real wounds paraded by soldiers on the floor of the convention. Rather, it associates sacrificial death with a deeply sensual, disturbing image of beauty and purity, turning it into nothing less than an object of desire. As the poet Augustin Jimenez wrote at the time, It is beautiful to perish. Il est beau de périr. The fantasies had one final, disturbing aspect. Just as martyrs were to be exalted and envied, enemies, moral monsters, were to be utterly abhorred and eradicated. Once the war began, not only did the rhetoric of a war to the death intensify, it also was joined by a ferocious outpouring of hatred against anyone who dared take up arms against France. They were damned as sanguinary hordes, barbarians, vipers, monsters. The English, who posed the greatest long-term threat to France, and whose own revolutionary heritage made their enmity look like betrayal, came in for the worst of this abuse. National hatred must sound forth, thundered Bertrand Barrère, a member of the Committee of Public Safety, in 1794. Young French Republicans must suck hatred of the name of Englishmen with their mother's milk. The English are a people foreign to Europe, foreign to humanity. They must disappear. Orators throughout France called for the extermination of the English, and the convention formally endorsed the idea when it issued a decree forbidding French commanders from giving quarter to English soldiers. Only the dead do not come back to fight again. Barrère and Carnot both remarked. True. When another deputy earlier proposed sending assassins to kill British Prime Minister Pitt, the members shouted him down in horror. In this instance, at least, the warfare of the late 18th century seems more restrained than that of the early 21st. Still, the convention seemed ready to approve mass murder. Historians often dismiss the significance of this exterminationist rhetoric noting that, unlike in the cases of military discipline or the pike, it had very little real impact on the armies. In practice, they observe, French forces largely ignored the take-no-prisoners decree. The story even circulated of soldiers who received orders from visiting deputies to kill prisoners, only to retort that the deputies would have to do the deed themselves. The deputies might denounce the fraternity of men-at-arms as an aristocratic sham, but commanders in the field knew perfectly well that their men would be the ones to pay the price, in the form of enemy revenge, for shooting prisoners. The rhetoric does matter, however, for it shows just how completely the French state had now rejected the older regime of limited war. War is a violent state of affairs. Lazare Carnot commented laconically, It must be waged to the utmost. Robespierre went even further, invoking the high court of history beloved of the philosophes. In a draft for a new Declaration of Rights, he wrote, Those who make war on a people to halt the progress of liberty and destroy the rights of man must be attacked by all, not as ordinary enemies, but as assassins and rebel brigands. In defending the take-no-prisoners decree, he frostily insisted to the Committee of Public Safety that between free men and the henchmen of despotism, there could be no common ground. Any notion of treating the enemy as an honorable adversary was simply absurd. Robespierre was now, strikingly, casting the war in religious terms as a clash of proselytisms. But, after all, he and his radical allies believed that any means were justified, for this was to be the last war. Prepare for universal peace, insisted Carnot, even as he was working frantically to strengthen France's military capacities. 
the clearest sign that the old regime norms no longer held did not involve the treatment of foreign prisoners, but foreign territory. Under the old regime, it had been understood that any formal transfer of territories, and any modification of the political and social systems in them, would wait until a formal peace settlement, and then proceed, at least in theory, by mutual agreement. But soon after de Maurier's victory at Jemap in 1792, the convention signaled that it would no longer respect the rights of enemy powers, declaring that it would grant fraternity and aid to all peoples who wish to recover their liberty. That is, encourage revolution throughout Europe. True, it soon backed off from this breathtakingly ambitious program, and then, less than a year later, explicitly renounced philanthropic ideas in war altogether. From now on, it stated, French armies would behave towards the enemies of France in the same way that the Allied powers are behaving toward us, and will apply the ordinary rights of war. But this change of direction did not imply that France would return entirely to traditional practices. In fact, France soon began to annex conquered Belgian and German territories without waiting for a treaty. The full gamut of revolutionary reforms followed there, including attacks on religion, the elimination of feudal privileges, the abolition of nobility, and, most important, the introduction of a state apparatus capable of squeezing the territories for the war effort. The rejection of the old regime norms, it should be emphasized, was not entirely limited to the French, even if they articulated the point most forcefully. Across the Channel, English public opinion exploded in outrage at the take-no-prisoners decree, yet prominent English politicians had themselves demanded much the same policies even before the outbreak of hostilities. The mode of civilized war will not be practiced, wrote Edmund Burke as early as 1791. Nor are the French entitled to expect it. The hellhounds of war on all sides will be uncoupled and unmuzzled. With France and Britain still at peace in 1792, the British diplomat Lord Auckland had called for executing French prisoners and dispensing with the courtesies of the age. Thankfully, British commanders greeted such advice with even less enthusiasm than did their French counterparts. Still, it was in France that the rhetoric was fiercest. It was also in France that the government made the greatest effort to spread the apocalyptic vision of war to the general population. It subsidized the writing of stage plays, which were performed in major cities and army camps. Six thousand copies of a stage fantasy about the worldwide triumph of the sans culottes were sent to the Army of the North along with 400,000 copies of the new constitution and well over one million copies of Hébert's newspaper La Père du Chêne. These numbers dwarf anything previously seen in French history. And furthermore, each copy had multiple readers. And the efforts were not limited to the literate. The people still sing much more than they read, the composer Thomas Rousseau reminded the war minister. In response, he received a commission to send the army 100,000 songbooks. Eyewitnesses agree that French soldiers sang continually, on marches, in camp, in battle, Courons en masse, mes amis, pour écraser nos ennemis, que ces lâches guerrières sortant de nos foyers et mordant la poussière, au joli son, au joli son. En meurdant la poussière, au joli son du canon. Le patrie attend de nos bras, la mort de tous ces scélérats, qui mordant tout la poussière, au joli son, etc. Let us run en masse, my friends, to crush our enemies. May these cowardly warriors leave our land, biting the dust to the lovely sound, to the lovely sound biting the dust to the lovely sound of the cannon. The fatherland expects from our arms the death of all those wicked men 
who will all bite the dust to the lovely sound, etc. This song, just one of hundreds from the period, appeared in 1794 in the newspaper The Evening in Camp. The song was not very good, to say the least, but it was simple, easily understood, and sung to a popular tune, and the editors could reasonably expect that within days it would be warbled, off-key but enthusiastically, from the Channel to the Pyrenees. It is frustratingly difficult to say how soldiers and the general population reacted to this propaganda barrage. Revolutionary newspapers reported that they greeted it with wild enthusiasm, but then such descriptions were propaganda themselves. It is easy enough to find the songs and newspaper articles echoed in soldiers' letters, but the soldiers knew that their letters could be opened and read. Still, it is missing the point to think that such propaganda succeeded only if it turned its readers and listeners into obedient zealots. Simply through its amplitude, through the incessant repetition of its images of death, martyrdom, and extermination, the propaganda drove home a set of simple but potentially transformative ideas. This war, it was emphasized, was indeed different from anything that had preceded it. It was extreme, all-encompassing. It would not end with a compromise treaty, but with utter victory or defeat. The fact that twice, in the summers of 1792 and 1793, there seemed nothing to prevent Allied armies from taking Paris, gave credence to the message. And in this way, the propaganda prepared the population for the drastic, unprecedented demands of the real war effort. In 1793-94, the French state finally began to take more effective steps to translate the classical dream of total mobilization into reality. Two men in particular embodied the shift. First was Carnot, the organizer of victory, a skilled mathematician and engineer who had once advocated the traditional tactics of maneuver and siege against innovators such as Guibert. Carnot knew the business of war better than did any member of the convention. But he too had drunk of the classics and was not immune from the temptations of fantasy. As a young officer in Arras at the end of the old regime, he had participated, along with Robespierre, in a literary society that gathered the sort of young professionals who devoured Rousseau and Voltaire. It provided a setting, bizarre in hindsight, for these two future leaders of the terror to exchange comic verse and read love poetry aloud. At the start of the war, it was not entirely surprising to find Carnot one of the officers advocating the return of the pike to European warfare. Much more of a fantasist was Louis Saint-Just, who once famously declared that the world has been empty since the Romans. Born the son of a non-noble army officer in 1767, he spent his adolescence and early twenties feverishly seeking a literary and political reputation. Among his more regrettable achievements was a long erotic poem called Organt, which included scenes of rape and bestiality. Elected to the convention at only twenty-five, he made his reputation in passionate speeches calling for the death of Louis XVI and quickly attached himself to Robespierre, who became his idol and brought him into the Committee of Public Safety. Saint-Just's cold insistence on purging and executing those revolutionaries who diverged from his rigid standards of classical virtue earned him a reputation as the Archangel of the Terror. But it was Carnot and Saint-Just, backed up by the other members of the committee, who directed the war effort in the crucial years 1793-94. to 94. Using savage methods to overcome daunting obstacles, they managed in an incredibly short time to mobilize and redirect the resources of the French nation to the overriding goal of military victory. The three key elements to their success were manpower, 
political control, and the reconstruction of the army. With these in place, the total mobilization promised since the debates of 1791 to 92 would start to take palpable form. Manpower was obvious. As the reformer Dubois Cancey had observed back in 1789, with the French population of 28 million dwarfing that of other Western European states, France had the theoretical ability to overwhelm enemies with ease. The trick was actually getting men into the army. The levies of volunteers in 1791 and 1792 did little but make up for the shortfalls caused by the disintegration of the old royal force. And so, in early 1793, the convention tried again, this time ordering France's departments to supply an additional 300,000 men. It was a move toward conscription, and it met with widespread disobedience, even revolt. It did probably succeed in raising 150,000 men, but this number was not sufficient. At the start of August 1793, a moment of maximum peril for the infant republic, deputies from the convention in the northern departments called for total mobilization. In Paris, Hébert picked up the cry, and spokesmen from across the country demanded that the convention formally order a general rising, a levée en masse. On August 23rd, the convention complied. From this moment, until our enemies will have been driven from the territory of the Republic, all Frenchmen are permanently requisitioned for service in the armies. The levée had its own strong elements of fantasy. Although generally seen as a prelude to the age of conscripted mass armies, the measure in fact looks back to the ancient past as much as to the future. In calling for it, Hébert tellingly exhorted men to arm themselves with pikes, swords, scythes, and cooking spits, and for women to heat oil and sulfur to pour on the enemy. The text of the decree, drafted by Carnot and rewritten by Barrère, owed more than a little to classical reverie. The young men will fight. Married men will forge weapons and transport supplies. Women will make tents and uniforms and serve in hospitals. Children will turn old linen into lint. Old men will have themselves carried into the public squares to rouse the courage of those who fight, to preach hatred of kings and the unity of the republic. In practice, admittedly, the convention did not bother much with lint-spinning children, and managed to avoid scythes and cooking spits entirely. Instead, it quickly transformed the high-flown language into a deadly serious summons to every adult male between the ages of 18 and 25 to report for military service. By doing so, it succeeded in raising another 300,000 men which brought the size of France's armed forces up to well over 750,000, far larger than those of any of its adversaries. The convention still faced huge obstacles in equipping, training, and deploying these masses. In September 1793, for instance, the principal French armory was producing muskets at a rate of only 9,000 per year but the Committee of Public Safety acted decisively to address the problem, setting up a workshop to improve the precision of machine tools, which increasingly allowed for interchangeable parts. A crucial innovation, given the tendency of musket parts to fail under battlefield conditions. By October 1794, 5,000 munitions workers were making guns at the rate of 145,000 per year, and a single Parisian factory was producing 30,000 pounds of gunpowder per day. Meanwhile, it was becoming clear that levels of education and physical fitness among the new recruits did not come close to matching those of the volunteers of 1791, while their sheer numbers overwhelmed the army's capacity to make use of them. But again, with surprising speed, the government adapted to the new conditions. In 
as early as January 1793, one of the best military thinkers of the period, Philippe-Henri Grimoire, had written that a democratic France supplementing art by numbers would need to abandon aristocratic notions of sophisticated maneuvering and simply direct overwhelming strength against particular points. The idea initially met with little favor among the generals, but it was taken up by Carnot, who applied it in person at the Battle of Watinis on October 15th to 16th, 1793, after the British and Austrians had frittered away their chance to take Paris during the summer, and it had immediate success. Watinis was a crucial moment. At first, the French forces under General Jean-Baptiste Jourdan made little progress against the better-trained Austrians, despite two-to-one superiority in men. However, the French detected a weak spot, and the next day, over Jourdan's objections, Carnot insisted on concentrating the French overwhelmingly against it. Three marching columns advanced with most of the troops initially kept out of range of direct enemy fire, to prevent them from panicking. Instead, in a tactic that would become characteristic of the revolutionary armies, a smaller number were first deployed as skirmishers to snipe at and weaken the enemy. Then, the bulk of the army was brought forward all at once in a rapid, disorganized, but successful charge to the sound of revolutionary songs. Fifty thousand savage beasts, foaming at the mouth like cannibals, hurl themselves at top speed, wrote a French émigré officer about such tactics. The battle was not as richly symbolic as Valmy, but it mattered nearly as much to the survival of the revolution. Within months, Carnot and the Committee on Public Safety were issuing decree after decree, urging the new tactics on all French forces. The general rules are always to act en masse and offensively. Be attacking, constantly attacking. Stun like lightning and strike like thunder. The use of skirmishers greatly increased. Staff officers started to divide the armies into divisions of 5,000 or more soldiers, great mobile masses of men. Victories followed. They did so, however, at a terrible cost, for the wild infantry charges entailed huge French casualties. In the two years 1794 and 1795, according to the best available research, 200,000 French soldiers died. But thanks to the requisition, the convention easily replaced them, and the generals adjusted with cold pragmatism to the change. As the historian Gunther Rothenberg writes laconically, soldiers had been expensive. Now they had become cheap. The painters and poets might dream of heroic self-sacrifice, but in practice, victory demanded the more grisly and prosaic tactic of feeding young men into the pulverizing hell of enemy artillery and musket fire. Carnot's presence on the battlefield illustrates the second element of the convention's winning formula, tight central control of the war effort. Again, this was not something the idealists had envisioned. The persistent radical dream had been virtuous, patriotic intentions would automatically generate desirable outcomes without any need for rigid discipline and order. No battle plans, no order in the army, no officers, no generals, no superiority of rank. Everyone is a soldier, and they all fight as heroes. This was how the Girondin playwright Olympe de Gouges imagined the victorious French armies at Gemap. And it was, of course, absurd. Not only did the soldiers need battle plans and generals, but also the generals themselves needed coordination, direction, and all the support they could get from Paris. This work of organization was not going to come from a general staff, which did not exist, and it was not going to come from the war ministry. The apparatchiks who prevailed there were more than willing to compile thick dossiers on the political reliability of the officer corps. 
on Ney and Hoche, future marshals of Napoleon? Worthless. But they did not provide much real assistance to the military. Instead, the real work was done by the Committee of Public Safety and by members of the convention sent into the field as all-powerful representatives on mission. Here is where Saint-Just stood out. In late October 1793, after Watanis, but with the military situation still perilous, he came with another representative to the Army of the Rhine in the Alsatian city of Strasbourg. He delivered inspirational rhetoric, but he also delivered the terror. Between his arrival and early March, a military tribunal in the city handed down 27 death sentences to soldiers and officers, mostly for the unforgivable crime of failure. Saint-Just imposed a huge forced loan on the city, and when he realized how many troops lacked proper shoes, demanded that the citizens bring in their own. With the rasp of the guillotine in his words, he quickly collected 17,000 pairs, along with 21,000 shirts. The methods were brutal but effective, and helped the French to chase enemy forces out of Alsace by the end of the year. Saint-Just appeared not as a representative, but as a king, as a god, Jules Michelet would later write. Throughout France, the years 1793-94 to saw the execution of no fewer than 84 generals and the dismissal of 352 others, a performance incentive if ever there was one. The following spring, Saint-Just accompanied the Army of the North in a decisive campaign that removed the Allied threat to French territory. When the commander of the Austrian garrison at Charleroi asked to negotiate, Saint-Just haughtily insisted on unconditional surrender. That would dishonor the garrison, the officer protested. Saint-Just's chill reply echoed Robespierre's warning against battlefield fraternization. We can neither honor you nor dishonor you, just as you have not the power to honor or dishonor the French nation. There is nothing in common between you and us. In late June, as the observation balloon hovered above the battlefield of Fleurus, Saint-Just galloped among the troops, urging them on. In the fusion of military and dictatorial political authority that he represented, there can be glimpsed a hint of the Napoleonic future. The political control exerted by the convention was decisive to the war effort. But its efforts would have been useless without a final reconstruction of the army. In 1793, political purges completed the decimation of the officer corps, leaving nobles accounting for barely 3% of it. A motley group was taking their place, predominantly former soldiers and non-commissioned officers of the old Royal Army, as well as former civilians elected in the new volunteer battalions. Among both groups, representatives on mission detected a frightening abundance of inexperience, ignorance, and incompetence, often compounded, in the case of the old soldiers, by illiteracy. In Marseille, officers of a volunteer battalion included a mason, a locksmith, a miller, a carpenter, a cooper, a tailor, a stocking maker, a machinist, and an apothecary. And among such officers, some of the most competent actively shunned promotion, seeing the deadly price that failure in a higher rank might entail. In early 1793, Battalions of the old Royal Army remained separate from, and often in dangerous rivalry with, battalions of new recruits. The convention, however, worked frantically to address these problems. In February 1793, the old line army and the new volunteer battalions began, slowly, to amalgamate into a single force. And as this occurred, the convention began to show a distinct preference for placing literate, experienced former soldiers from the line army in leadership positions. <laughs>
In other words, Robespierre, Saint-Just, and Carnot were opting decisively for competence over ideological purity. Heroic martyrs were all well and good, but, above all, France needed men who knew how to fight. The committee also began to restore harsher military discipline. The Parisian artilleryman Bricard noted the results of the shift in August 1794, when six drummer boys from his battalion were found pilfering. The two oldest were shot, one crying out piteously for his mother, while the younger four were made to watch. The great beneficiaries of these newly practical attitudes were the newly promoted officers. In the years 1791-94, to thousands of men from relatively modest backgrounds, who never could have dreamed of high rank under the old regime, achieved it at astonishingly young ages. Lazare Roche went from sergeant in 1792 to general in chief of the army of the Moselle a year later, at age 24. François Marceau, a common soldier turned attorney's clerk, rose through the National Guard and became general in charge of a division in 1793, also at 24. Guillaume Brun, a proofreader and failed poet turned revolutionary journalist, entered the army through the National Guard and made general in 1793 at age 30. The average age of new generals in the 1790s was just 33. Among them was the intense, literarily inclined young Corsican officer named Napoleon Bonaparte. These new soldiers were, needless to say, of a very different stamp from the aristocrats who had commanded the French armed forces before 1789. They did not have courtly manners, and many, like Napoleon, spoke French with a heavy provincial accent. They preferred uniforms to fancy civilian dress. They did not have elaborate estates or sumptuous Parisian mansions, yet. Once they entered the army, it usually became their entire life. They saw themselves as professionals devoted to the task of war, not as members of a privileged order of the state who could move seamlessly from court to campaign and back again. They did not spend hours a day practicing dance steps. In a little-noticed but significant development, in early 1792, the dancing master at the military school at Brienne was dismissed and left destitute. Much of the rest of this book is concerned with these new officers and the bloody trails they blazed across the European continent and beyond in the years after 1794. Before turning to this later period, however, one final episode of the French Revolution deserves attention. For during the terror of 1793-94, and the events I have just described, the idea of total, physical extermination of France's enemies did not remain comfortably theoretical, as in the case of the take-no-prisoners decree. In one theater of operations, it turned all too piercingly real. The enemies in question, however, were not English or Austrian, or Prussian, and the fields of battles were not in Belgium or the Rhineland. Instead, the torch of total war was first applied to a region of France itself, the Vendée. Chapter 5. The Exterminating Angels the hirelings of despotism will be vanquished by the exterminating angel of liberty. Georges Danton, 1791 You must decide in advance about the fate of the women and children I will encounter in this rebellious country. If they must all be put to the sword, I cannot carry out such a measure without a decree which relieves me of responsibility. Louis-Marie Thoreau 1794. January 28, 1794. Chateau Meur, 
Department of the Vendée. Vincent Chapelain is nervous. The 36-year-old mayor of this tiny hamlet in western France, he has been trying for months to restore order in the wake of horrendous civil war between the forces of the revolutionary government and rebels fighting for the French monarchy and the Catholic Church. It has not been an easy task, for our rebel army remains active nearby, and the memories of savage killings on both sides are still unbearably raw. Nonetheless, Chapelain has managed, in his own words, to patriotize the local district, where he is the chief remaining representative of the Republic. He has successfully confiscated hundreds of guns, recruited a National Guard unit to maintain order, and put local government back to work. He has also removed church bells from more than 20 churches to be melted down and recast into armaments for the national war effort. Now, he believes, it is time for forgiveness and an end to the violence. But more violence is coming, in the form of columns of Republican soldiers, blues, who are crisscrossing the Vendée, with orders to kill all remaining brigands and make the region uninhabitable for them. A few days before, Chapelain himself played host to one detachment of 200 soldiers, giving out food and wine and providing beds for those who got too drunk to stumble back to their bivouacs. Another detachment passed through a village five miles away and shot 25 young men who belonged to the National Guard, as well as two local officials wearing the official sash of the Republic. The Blues claimed that the men were really rebels, and now yet another detachment has arrived in Chateau Mur itself. Chapelain, as mayor, goes out to meet their commander, General Louis Grignon, a 45-year-old career soldier whom the Revolution has vaulted to the rank of Brigadier General. Still recovering from a leg wound inflicted by the rebels the previous fall, Grignon has given his troops orders to burn every building they come across and to kill every human being. I know there may be a few patriots left in this area, he has allegedly told them. It doesn't matter. They must all be sacrificed. Now he screams, Who are you? at the trembling Chapelain. The mayor lists the various offices he holds and cites the authority of the former commander in the region, General Antoine-Marie Bard. Grignon fiercely replies that he doesn't recognize any local offices and doesn't recognize General Bard either. From somewhere, a voice cries out, the mayor is a suspect! And that is enough. Grignon gives orders for Chapelain to be shot. At the last minute, however, a soldier recognizes the mayor as someone who stayed loyal to the Republic all through the war. Chapelain himself frantically insists that, far from helping the brigands, he has helped hunt them down. Finally, Grignon relents. By this point, however, his blues have already killed eight of Chapelain's guardsmen and ransacked his house. Crignon then makes Chapelain guide the blues down the road to a neighboring village, La Flosselière. Chapelain offers to provide a list of the leading rebels there in the hope of limiting the violence, but the general waves him off. When the column arrives, the soldiers run amok, killing six men and pillaging the houses. They raped the women, Chapelain will later recount. Thirty of them taking turns on just one. Another didn't escape, despite being sixty years old with a disfigured eye. Over the course of the afternoon, thirty more people are killed, including six men who had valid passes, but the bad luck to be passing through on the road. Grignon then moves on to the town of Pouzoges where he has dinner in the local chateau. Several young women are being held prisoner there, and Grignon and his staff invite them to coffee. Later, Chapelain hears soldiers boasting that the women have been raped and shot, all except the pretty one, to whom the officers had taken a fancy. Finally, on January 31st, Grignon and his column move out of the district. We burned and broke heads like usual 
he reported to his superiors in a laconic report. But Chapelain would remember that, for two and a half miles, you could follow the column as much by the trail of bodies that they left as by the light of the fires they had lit. Civil wars are the cruelest wars. By definition, neither side recognizes the legitimacy of the other, at least at the start. There are no honorable adversaries, only traitors. By definition, the fighting takes place on home territory. And, by definition, friend and foe are difficult, if not impossible, to tell apart. As we have learned, even during the century of relatively restrained warfare that preceded the French Revolution, civil war took a terrible toll on several areas of Western Europe, notably the Cévennes Mountains of southern France, after the Protestant Camisard Revolt of 1702-4, and the highlands of Scotland after the Jacobite Rebellion of 1745, with thousands dead in each case. The Vendée, however, occupies a different dimension of horror. According to the most reliable estimates, from 220,000 to 250,000 men, women, and children, over a quarter of the population of the insurgent region, lost their lives there in 1793 to 94. The principal campaign against the Vendée's Catholic and Royal peasant armies, which lasted from March to December of 1793, set a new European standard in atrocities. Then, at the start of 1794, the Republican general Louis-Marie Thoreau sent twelve detachments of two to three thousand soldiers each marching across the territory in grid fashion, with orders to make it uninhabitable. These hell columns burned houses and woods, confiscated or destroyed stores of food, killed livestock, and engaged in large-scale rape, pillage, and slaughter. In some cases, they killed only suspected rebels. In others, as at La Flossilière, they liquidated men, women, and children indiscriminately, including patriots who had remained loyal to the Republic, on the grounds that no one still living in the Vendée could truly be loyal. In the port city of Nantes, the Republican authorities devised appalling new methods of mass murder to eliminate the brigands more efficiently and to reduce stress on the killers. Most hideously, they lashed thousands of prisoners into barges and lighters, which they then towed out into the Loire estuary and sank. The Vendée was the most horrible civil war that ever took place, remarked Thoreau the man who did more than anyone else to make it so. Ever since the Revolution, the Vendée has divided the people of France like nothing else except Vichy. From the very start, counter-revolutionaries transformed it into a virtual religious icon, a symbol of pure, simple faith, of resistance to revolutionary evil, of martyrdom. In 1939, the Catholic Church even began a process of beatification for several hundred children allegedly slaughtered in the twin villages of Les Lucs at the end of February 1794. Today, monuments to the Vendée and generals, to crucial battles, and to revolutionary atrocities dot the region, in a manner that recalls southern U.S. commemoration of the Confederate lost cause. Writers favorable to the revolution, meanwhile, while deploring excesses, have insisted that horrors were committed on both sides and that the insurgents did, after all, side with France's enemies during wartime. Historians remain so bitterly opposed that one of the best short books on the subject, by Claude petit Frère, has a bibliography with separate sections for pro- and counter-revolutionary works. In the past twenty years, the Vendée has achieved new, worldwide prominence thanks to a distinctly contemporary and disturbing twist in the arguments. In 1985, a native of the region, Renal Secher, published an incendiary book on the war entitled A French Genocide. He presented little original research, wrote sloppily, 
and claimed a conservative total death toll of 117,257, with absurdly exaggerated precision. But the book appeared at a moment when the French were confronting the legacy of their collaboration with Nazi genocide, and far-right politicians seized with delight on Secher's implicit message that the First Republic, not Vichy, had been France's worst, most criminal regime. The 1980s were also a time, however, when historians across the political spectrum were taking a more critical view of revolutions in general. And Secher's allegations struck a deep and resonant chord with many readers beyond France. Simon Schama and Norman Davies repeated them uncritically in best-selling books, and the idea of a Vendean genocide became widely accepted. In 1993, no less a figure than Alexander Solzhenitsyn traveled to Les Lucs to inaugurate an elaborate new monument to the Vendée and its victims. He and its builders ignored careful new research, demonstrating that the supposed massacre in the villages had not, in fact, taken place, at least not on the scale and with the degree of premeditation that had been claimed. Was the Vendée a genocide, a deliberate and systematic attempt to exterminate a distinct ethnic population? Secher was not, in fact, the first to say so. As early as 1795, the proto-communist agitator Gracchus Babouf accused the revolutionary government of turning the scythe of death against the totality of the Vendean race, and called its representative in Nantes, Jean-Baptiste Carrier, populicidal. But Babouf made the charge as part of a demented conspiracy theory, and his book was rightly ignored at the time. Secher has used genocide as a rhetorical trump card, designed to expose detractors to the charge of minimizing, or even justifying, the original crime. But it is no insult to the memory of the victims to recognize that in this case, the word is misplaced. To begin with, the revolutionaries did not consider the Vendeans a distinct ethnic group. The word race, which appeared frequently in revolutionary rhetoric, did not yet have its modern biological connotations and meant little more than group. Today, we shiver on reading the revolutionary radical Bertrand Barrère's call for measures to exterminate this rebel race, August 1st, 1793. But the context makes clear that he was discussing only armed rebels, and two sentences later, he insisted that their families be treated with compassion. Several of Thoreau's columns did deliberately slaughter avowed patriots, as at La Flosselière, but not because they believed that a person was indelibly stained by Vendean birth. To the extent that they carried out these killings systematically, it was either because they believed no true patriots were left in the Vendée after nearly a year of war, or because they thought the murders a military necessity. Significantly, Vendean patriots outside the rebel province were never persecuted on account of their birth, as one would expect had a true racial theory been operating. Furthermore, as the historian Jean-Clément Martin has demonstrated, the massacres committed by Thoreau, Carrier, and others did not belong to any sort of master plan of extermination. True, revolutionary leaders rarely missed an opportunity to call for the destruction, extermination, pulverization, or even depopulation of the Vendée. But they made such threats against most of their enemies, including aristocrats, royalists, refractory priests, and the entire populations of Austria and England. Jules Michelet once quipped that Barrère exterminated the royalists twice a week from the speaker's platform. If the Jacobins turned particularly apoplectic on the subject of the inexplicable Vendée, it was because they saw it as the keystone of a much larger structure of counter-revolution, all of which deserved destruction. The sanguinary language is not at all without significance, but there is still a world of difference between Barrère's overheated speechifying and, for instance, 
the 1942 1C conference at which Nazi officials methodically planned the extermination of European Jewry. On three or four occasions, a handful of revolutionaries speculated about killing on a large scale, with poisoned brandy or even poison gas, but there is no evidence that anyone ever tried to implement these ideas. The convention did call for the physical devastation of the Vendée. Woods and thickets burned or cut down, crops destroyed, livestock seized, women and children deported from the rebel region. It also declared all rebels captured in arms or wearing the white cockade of the Vendean armies to be outlaws, subject to summary execution. Some of its agents ordered such executions on an industrial scale. 2,000 people in the town of Angers alone. Whereas the Committee on Public Safety told others to take whatever measures they deem necessary. But when Thoreau requested a decree explicitly authorizing him to kill women and children, the committee hesitated for weeks and then issued only an ambivalent endorsement of his intentions. Arguably, they were giving tacit approval. Still, the politicians in Paris, distracted by their own ferocious political battles, were reacting to facts as they developed on the ground, not systematically planning mass murder. Many deaths were the result of the independent action of local revolutionary tribunals. Thoreau himself later wrote that his columns acted without any authorization. In the Vendée, conflicting orders from the committee, the radical war ministry, and numerous representatives on mission produced administrative chaos in which military officers often acted on their own initiative and with virtually no coordination. Although Martin and his colleagues have refuted the theory of genocide, they have been less successful in advancing their own explanation for the Vendée's gushing tide of blood. There remains no cogent, reliable overview that accounts for the war's extraordinarily gruesome nature. Babeuf, in his delirium, strikingly compared the revolutionary forces to the Spanish conquistadors in Mexico and Peru. There, it was said to people who had never heard of Jesus the Galilean, acknowledge your God or die. Here, those who have never developed the ideas of liberty are admonished, believe in the tricolor or feel my dagger. The element of religious or ideological fanaticism was indeed crucial. But then, it was present in the Camisar revolt of the early 18th century as well. What made the Vendée so much worse? The difference was total war. It was not simply that the Vendée took place in wartime. So did the Camisar revolt. So did the 1745 Scottish Rising. It was that it took place in the context of a kind of warfare whose scale had little or no precedent whether in the mobilization of population and resources, the ambitious and ill-defined war aims, the demonization of entire enemy populations, or the threats to the French leadership in case of defeat. It was a perceived war to the death in which, as we have learned, parts of the revolutionary leadership were beginning to romanticize combat in a new and sinister way. In this sort of war, the threats of extermination dealt out on all sides were in fact meant in deadly earnest. Enemies of the revolution, whether Vendean, aristocratic, Austrian, or English, were perceived as an existential evil. They were inhuman monsters. They were barbarians condemned by the high court of history for a failure to accept the blessings of revolutionary civilization. They were obstacles to the triumph of liberty and therefore to the coming of a final, universal peace. They did indeed deserve death. In its very theory, warfare was turning exterminatory. On most of France's battlefields during 1792-94, the practice did not live up to this theory. But in the Vendée, three exceptional conditions combined to produce a convergence between them. First, 
after December 1793, the revolutionary forces in the region did not face serious military opposition, and therefore could act without the possibility of reprisals that elsewhere helped limit atrocities. For instance, staying the hands of French generals ordered to execute British prisoners. Second, the experience of civil and guerrilla war, with massacres on both sides and the constant threat of ambush, generated powerful states of hatred and fear that allowed soldiers to overcome their natural human repugnance for slaughtering helpless prisoners and civilians. Third, for a brief but decisive period in late 1793 and early 1794, control of military operations in the Vendée, to the extent that it existed, passed partly into the hands of the revolutionary faction known as the Hébertists, after Jacques Hébert, editor of La Père du Chêne. As we discussed in the previous chapter, the Hébertists were the revolutionaries who combined the most fervent dedication to classical fantasies of total war with the least actual military experience. They were also those most likely to demand that insufficiently victorious or sanguinary generals be sent to the guillotine. Thoreau followed what was to a great extent their plan and acted under their influence, while fearful, as he later put it in a self-justifying memoir, that the least refusal what am I saying? The least negligence would have led to the scaffold. It was thanks to these factors that in the Vendée, the rhetoric of total war was fully translated into blood streaked, exterminatory fact. The Vendée did not even exist as a distinct region before 1789. It was born out of war, in the western coastal region south of the Loire River in parts of the old royal provinces of Poitou, Anjou, and Brittany. In 1790, the National Assembly abolished the provinces and created 83 new departments, one of which bore the name Vendée after a hitherto insignificant river. The insurgent region centered on it, but spilled over its borders and included a variety of terrains, economies, and patterns of political activity. Like much of western France, this region vibrated to a basal continuo of rural tension throughout the early years of the Revolution. In 1789, the wretchedly poor peasants had demanded better roads and lower taxes. The Revolution gave them mostly higher taxes and largely excluded them from the land boom brought about by the confiscation and sale of church property. In many of the more isolated areas, the revolution's subjection of the Catholic Church to secular state authority cut deep into the tissue of communal life, with villages enraged at the dismissal of long-serving priests. In reaction, bubbles of anxiety and rage burst angrily on the surface of rural life. The most serious rioting took place after the fall of the monarchy in the fall of 1792, when crowds of peasants, armed mainly with pikes and scythes, occupied several towns in the region, leading to fighting that left up to a hundred dead. Then came the draft. In February 1793, as we have learned, the convention called for a levy of an additional 300,000 troops. With supplies of willing volunteers largely exhausted, local officials across the country prepared to draw lots for conscripts. But in several regions, already shuddering with discontent over taxes, the religious struggles and the execution of the king, the idea of sending more young men off to die for the republic, touched off explosions. In hundreds of communes, crowds of peasants, often numbering in the thousands, descended on villages and towns armed with whatever sharp implements and firearms they had to hand. They made a frightening spectacle. In Machcoul, in the Vendée, the sound they produced reminded seven-year-old Germain Béthuy of a tempest on the sea. Looking onto the road that led to town, he mistook the rioters for a loud black cloud. Local officials saw them as irrational, murderous brutes, and fled if they could. In 
the revolt had begun, with the demands of total war abroad sparking what would soon turn into total war at home. What were the peasants hoping to accomplish? We have few accounts of the revolt that have not passed through a thick filter of hindsight and mythology. But it seems that, to a large extent, the rebels were following a familiar and not at all irrational script. For centuries, the jacquerie, insurrection against nobles, town dwellers, and especially tax collectors, had been the last resort of France's perennially impoverished rural classes. Fear, rage, and exaltation could make them murderous and susceptible to the millenarian messages of charismatic leaders and prophets. They expected savage repression by the government, and their leaders could hope for little other than a minimum of torture before execution. But the revolts also served a purpose, for once the initial wave of exemplary retribution had passed, the government often quietly granted some of the peasant demands. The 1793 rioters in western France initially remained true to this pattern and, at least at first, hoped principally for the end of conscription and the return of long-serving priests, not the overthrow of the revolution. They sought out leaders among local nobles, who mostly at the start showed little initial enthusiasm for the cause. True, several belonged to a secret counter-revolutionary organization, the Breton Association. But almost by definition, the most virulently counter-revolutionary nobles had left France by this time to fight for the émigré armies. The Marquis de Bonchamp insisted correctly to the peasants of his district that a revolt would bring them nothing but pillage, slaughter, and misery. Louis Célestin Sapineau de la Verrie tried his hand at homely metaphor. You want to dash an earthen pot against an iron pot? We'll be shattered! In several cases, the frustrated peasants replied by offering their nominees a choice between the roles of leader and victim. Initially, they did not even trust Sapineau with a horse. And as for the former naval officer Francois Athanase Charette, soon to be one of the most famous of the Vendean commanders, the peasants literally dragged him out from underneath his bed. Poorly armed, untrained, and reluctantly led, the peasants nonetheless had sheer numbers on their side, and in hundreds of towns and villages they easily overcame the National Guard, which consisted mostly of poorly trained, inexperienced countrymen like themselves. The army, which had helped maintain rural order earlier in the Revolution, was now mostly off fighting on the frontiers. In some towns, the rebels murdered Republican officials and sympathizers, and in Mashkul, a district official turned rebel named René Francois Souchou condemned hundreds of them, including Germain Bethuy's father, to death. The prisoners were tied together at the arms to make rosaries, marched to the edge of the moat of the local chateau, and shot or stabbed. When the Blues recaptured Mashkul a few weeks later, Souchou rushed out to greet them, wearing a red liberty cap claiming he had been held in the town against his will, but to no avail, for he was quickly denounced and killed. In Paris, news of the revolt caused consternation and was treated as proof of yet another gigantic conspiracy against the revolution. Charged with informing the convention of the situation, André Mercier de Rocher, an administrator from the Vendée, witnessed a hallucinatory scene in which the ultra-revolutionary Marat waved in his colleagues' faces a model of a dagger he proposed distributing to the population. Look carefully at this blade, he repeated, as if uttering an incantation. How sharp it is! How cutting! Barère told him that the deputies had more urgent business to take care of. Marat accused Barère of treason, and the two almost came to blows. The convention soon passed its draconian measure, allowing for summary execution of rebels. As soon as it could muster regular military units, the Republic did start, in most regions, to bring the revolts in the West under control. In Brittany, 
Republican troops routed peasants at the bridge of Carguidu and retook the city of Chateaubriand, executing 96 rebels in the process. In other areas as well, experienced soldiers slowly and painfully began to douse the brush fires provoked by the conscription decree, which continued principally in the form of low-level but dangerous guerrilla campaigns known as the Chouanerie. But the Republic was stretched too thin. Even as the insurrection smoldered, the disaster of Nierwinden exposed northern France to Austrian attack, and the widening of the war, to include Britain and Spain, placed further demands on an overburdened, undermanned, and inexperienced army. In the Vendée, the result was disaster. The heart of the Vendée, known as the Bocage, was nightmarish terrain for an army. The modern visitor, seeing its well-paved roads, broad fields, and lush meadows, will get little sense of what the land looked like at the time of the revolt. Moderate temperatures and plentiful rains made it inordinately fertile. But a multitude of small hills, ravines, and streams left much of it unsuitable for farming, and fields lay fallow for years on end. In place of crops, there sprouted an infinity of brightly flowering gorse, heather, thistles, and small trees, while fields were lined with ditches topped by large, strong, prickly hedges. Thanks to the saturation of the soil, streams and roads flooded at every heavy rain. The perpetually muddy, deeply rutted roads were rarely wider than six feet or so, making it almost impossible for carts and wagons to turn around. Military convoys rarely traveled more than seven miles a day. Mercier du Rocher remembered the bocage as enchanted, teeming with fruit trees and birds of every sort. But the Republican general Jean-Baptiste Clébert damned it as a deep, dark labyrinth. And Thoreau bitterly remembered the hedges that resembled palisades around the fort. He called the land an asylum of brigandage and crime. On March 19, 1793, General Louis-Henri François Marseille, a veteran officer and hero of the Seven Years' War, marched north from the town of Chantonnay, deep into the Bocage. He was accompanied by 2,400 mostly raw recruits, nine cannon, and two members of the convention. In the afternoon, as he stopped to repair a small bridge, a large crowd of armed men came into view on a nearby height. Marseille opened fire with his cannon, only for one of the deputies to countermand the order, claiming that he had heard the men singing the Marseillaise. Were they friendly? By the time a scout confirmed they were not, it was dusk. Marseille decided to pitch camp and fight in the morning. But the Vendeans, led by the once reluctant Sapinol, and armed with guns seized from government arsenals, had taken advantage of the confusion to sneak into the thick hedges that lined the narrow route. At nightfall, as Marseille's men started to set up tents and light campfires, a blaze of musket shots erupted at the front of his column, followed by screams from the attackers. Marseille frantically tried to move up additional battalions, but the confusion was overpowering. His young soldiers, crushed together on the road, could see little except the flash of gunfire, and hear little except the detonations and screams. The Vendeans shot at will into the struggling mass. Not surprisingly, the Blues panicked and fled, trampling each other and yelling, Sauve qui peut! Every man for himself! The next day, Marseille had no choice but to gather up the remnants and retreat all the way to La Rochelle, on the coast, outside the Vendée, having lost at least 500 men. Marseille's defeat a classic example of guerrilla warfare that the Vendeans would successfully copy many times, and that Marseille himself would expiate at the guillotine, marked the first great turning point of the rebellion. As Jean-Clément Martin has argued, despite later mythologizing 
there was nothing uniquely reactionary about the Vendée, compared to many other areas of France. But in the Vendée, because of Marseille's defeat, the Republic lost control. On March 21st, with the Blues in retreat, the various irregular peasant forces began to coalesce into a Catholic and royal army, some 20,000 strong, known as the Whites. It was led mostly by former noble officers, including Charette, Sapinot, Pontchamps, and the dashing 21-year-old Henri de la roche jacqueline But there were also commoners, including a tall, brooding, deeply pious carter named Jacques Catelineau, who became the Vendéans' first commander-in-chief. The Whites later formed a high council, which claimed authority over the insurgent region in the name of the dead king's young son, whom the convention was holding as a prisoner in Paris. It declared all revolutionary laws invalid, started to issue its own paper money, and reinstituted obligatory tithing to the Catholic Church. Even after their early victories, the Vendeans never adopted real military discipline. They remained essentially a force of untrained peasants who obeyed orders when they wished and left when necessary to take care of families and farms. They had no uniforms other than squares of white cloth adorned with a red heart and a cross. Even after capturing several cannon, they rarely managed to stand in formal, pitched battles against the Republican forces. They preferred ambushes in the broken up and overgrown terrain and sudden frenzied charges to the sound of their own rebel yell, Rampart! Victor Hugo later wrote, Invisible battalions watched and waited. These unseen armies snaked under and around their republican armies, leapt out of the earth in an instant only to disappear, bounded up numberlessly and vanished everywhere and nowhere, an avalanche one moment, dust the next. What sustained them, above all, was religion. Witnesses described them marching in solemn silence, telling rosary beads, stopping for prayers, and crossing themselves before charging into combat. Priests accompanied them and before battles gave out remissions of punishments for sin. In battle sermons, the priests cited biblical passages that supposedly predicted the triumph of their cause. Let us march! The god of battles is fighting with us. What can the blasphemers do against him? General Cathlineau, quite possibly in conscious imitation of Joan of Arc, spent hours prostrated before church altars and became known as the Saint de Anjou. At times, the wave of faith turned, frankly, superstitious. In the town of Cholet, whites seized an ancient, intricately engraved, but still functioning canon, cast for Cardinal Richelieu more than 150 years before. The peasants covered it with ribbons, dubbed it Marie-Jean, and declared that it would always lead them to victory. Perhaps the strangest episode of all concerned a former priest named Guillaume de Falville, whom the Republic had conscripted into the army. Taken prisoner by the whites in the town of Thouar, he showed them a sacred heart emblem and claimed to be a secret envoy from the Pope, who had ordained him Bishop of Agra. His captors not only believed him, but also made him president of the High Council and did not take action even after real envoys from the Pope refuted his story. He became a fixture of the army, riding among the peasants in a semblance of episcopal robes, followed by a priest carrying his mitre and crozier. In the spring of 1793, this amazingly unlikely army won several victories, capturing guns and ammunition each time, and held off the Republican forces. Then, in early June, it received an unexpected windfall. In Paris, the Girondins were purged from the convention after armed sans-culottes had insisted on the point by surrounding the manege with cannon. And in the resulting uproar, several major cities across France revolted in their turn against the government. 
these new rebels considered themselves loyal revolutionaries and had little love lost for the Vendée. The turmoil, however, left the Blues distracted and obliged again to divide their forces at precisely the moment when Austrian and British armies seemed poised to descend on northern France. On June 9th, the Vendeans captured Saumur, a major town in the Loire Valley, some 80 miles inland, killing at least 1,500 Republican soldiers and taking 8,000 prisoners. It was the Republic's moment of greatest peril. But the general unrest in the country does not explain why the Blues performed so badly against untrained peasants. Many other factors contributed to the debacle. The convention, trying to douse several fires at once, starved the Vendée of troops, and those they did provide were all too often ill-trained volunteers who tended to desert and to panic under fire. And the Blues suffered from the same problems as their counterparts in Belgium and Germany, chronic shortages of food, clothes, shoes, and tents. Newly promoted officers incapable of restraining their unruly, hungry men. The various commanders quarreled incessantly with one another, and with the deputies from the convention who hovered around them. All these problems were shockingly obvious to the general who arrived to take command of the Army of the Coasts of La Rochelle at the end of May. It was none other than Lao Soon, who once again, though not a pivotal figure himself, had gravitated to the epicenter of the changes in warfare, as if drawn by an irresistible magnetic force. I have found unimaginable confusion, he wrote from the Vendée to Bouchot, the minister of war. A heap of men it is impossible to call an army. The success of the whites, he continued, was due entirely to the incoherent and insufficient measures which have been partially taken against them. The cause of these misfortunes is the neglect and abandonment of all organization, of all military principles. He complained bitterly about the lack of food. We cannot secure a day's rations in advance, and if we attempted a march, we should inevitably have no bread. I have already discussed one other factor at work. Just a few years before, the French army could have drawn on considerable experience fighting with or against irregular troops, such as the Vendeans. Many of its officers and men had taken part in such operations in Corsica in the late 1760s, or in India in the early 1780s, or alongside American revolutionary forces. But the decimation of the officer corps and the overhaul of the ranks effectively left the army to rebuild itself from scratch. Lauzun, with his extensive colonial experience, was now the exception, not the rule, and the Vendée itself became the matrix against which future colonial wars were set. When French forces found themselves bogged down in Haiti in 1797, Lazare Carnot quickly labeled the Caribbean territory the Colonial Vendée. The whites, then, had important initial advantages. But they also suffered from a limitation experienced by nearly all guerrilla armies. An inability to operate far from their base. From Saumur in June, they could have followed the Loire east without opposition toward Orléans, just 70 miles south of Paris. Napoleon later commented, Nothing would have stopped the triumphant march of the royal armies. The white flag would have been flying from the steeples of Notre Dame before the armies of the Rhine could have rushed home to save their government. But Charette and Catalano hesitated to lead their men into hostile territory so far from home. Instead, they turned west. On June 18th, they took the Loire Valley town of Angers, and a week later laid siege to the major port city of Nantes. A victory there might itself have proved decisive in the long run, for it would have opened up western France to British arms. But in Nantes, the whites faced a more competent enemy than before. Five thousand experienced soldiers 
backed up by 5,000 National Guards, under the command of the tough and seasoned general Jean Baptiste Canclot. A badly coordinated white assault on June 29th failed, and Catlino, the Saint of Anjou, was mortally wounded. Discouraged, the peasant armies withdrew south, back into the hedgerows of the Vendée. The Battle of Nantes marked the last time the Vendéans posed a serious threat to the revolution. During the summer, the Catholic and Royal Army, now under command of aristocratic generals, won several more victories and held off the Blues, but did not venture outside the insurgent region. Meanwhile, the heavy, grinding machinery of national mobilization was finally being swung around, slowly but remorselessly, to crush them. On August 1st, the convention formally adopted its literal scorched-earth policy against the Vendée. It also voted to send a new force to the region, the French garrison of Mans, in the Rhineland, which had surrendered to the Prussians during the general military crisis of the spring of 1793, but had been allowed to return home. Desertion was steadily draining the whites, who had scarcely 40,000 fighting men left by the end of the summer. The Blues would soon have close to 75,000 in the region. The whites did deliver a significant drubbing to the former man's garrison on September 19th, but they could not put off the inevitable. On October 17th, a large blue force confronted the Vendeans in the town of Cholet, 20 miles south of the Loire, and decisively routed them. If war is defined as a conflict between armies, then the war of the Vendée was over. The slaughter, however, had only just begun. By the Battle of Cholet, the Catholic and Royal Army was already less a military force than a frightened city on the march. Wives, children, and parents of the remaining combatants had flocked to its ranks for safety, as had thousands of priests, swelling its numbers to well over 60,000. And they were right to do so, for by the fall of 1793, the massacre of non-combatants was becoming a common currency that the blues and whites traded back and forth in a gruesome inflationary spiral. It had started with the rosaries of Mashkul, but continued incessantly thereafter. In the spring, after taking the town of Montagu, the whites allegedly filled a 240-foot well with bodies of slain patriots. In September, the Blues retaliated, allegedly throwing no fewer than 400 victims, many of them still alive, into the mammoth well of the Chateau de Clisson which belonged to one of the Vendean generals. Throughout the insurgent region, both ordinary courts and special revolutionary tribunals handed down so many death sentences that a shortage of guillotines developed, and towns drew up schedules to share the limited supply. Both sides routinely put captured enemy soldiers to death. Each side justified its conduct by reference to the other. The Republican general François-Nicolas Salomon put the matter brutally on June 17th. Since this is a war of brigands, we must become brigands ourselves. We must, for a time, forget all military rules. None of this behavior represented much of a novelty in the history of European civil wars, but it quickly generated the sort of ferocious, unforgiving hatreds that can turn ordinary soldiers into mass murderers. On the side of the Blues, the revolutionary authorities did everything possible to maintain and intensify these emotions by relentlessly publicizing white atrocities in newspapers, pamphlets, songs, plays, and popular prints. In early October, even as the Blues were gaining the upper hand, Parisians strolling down the Boulevard du Temple could stop to take in a vaudeville opera entitled The Brigands of the Vendée, which featured predictably bloodthirsty rebels who pillaged 
burned, and slaughtered innocent patriots. Lest the audiences fail to draw the proper conclusions, one of the heroes spelled it out. Fall on them without pity! Don't spare a single one! In the Vendée, the Blues, who lived in constant fear of ambush or sabotage, hardly needed to be persuaded. But it was after Cholet, and the end of the serious military threat, that atrocities and war crimes started to coalesce into something even worse. It began with the extraordinary flight of the defeated Vendeans. Fearful of returning to their homes, which had now fallen largely under blue control, the vagabond bulk of the Catholic and Royal Army took the desperate decision to flee north, across the broad Loire, toward the English Channel. In skiffs and makeshift rafts, some 80,000 men, women, and children crossed in less than two days. Regrouping on the other side, they began what has been dubbed the Vire de Galerne, or the North Wind Turn, a forlorn attempt to raise Normandy and Brittany, and to open a French port to the British Navy, which had been seeking one since France and Britain had gone to war in the spring. Lacking even basic supplies, the huge shapeless column spread out for miles on either side of its route, scavenging for food. Marie-Louise Victoire Donissant, the widow of a Vendean general, remembered that on some days she and her family survived on onions dug out of the ground. On other days they ate unripe cider apples that caused violent diarrhea and even dysentery. This twenty-one-year-old grande dame, a marquise who had spent her childhood at the palace of Versailles, now found herself clothed in old blankets tied together with string and covered with lice. It was an irony not lost on the blues, one of whom later remembered that it was a curious spectacle to see these great ladies, who once had barely managed to shuffle along without the help of two tall lackeys, now trudging through the mud. Among the Vendean leaders, one wrapped himself in a lawyer's robe, another with a Turkish costume and turban taken from a theater on the route. The provinces north of the Loire did not rise en masse, and the increasingly hungry, frantic hordes had no choice other than a desperate lunge for the coast. In the middle of November, they arrived at the small Norman port of Granville, just north of Mont Saint Michel. But on the dismal gray waters, there were no British sails. Not surprising, since contact between the Vendeans and the British had been sporadic, and the fleet had not been told of the rendezvous. Worse, Granville was tenaciously defended, and the exhausted whites could not capture it. Reluctantly, they turned around and headed back toward the Loire. Scarcely thirty miles offshore, just beyond the chill gray horizon, lay the British island of Jersey, utterly unreachable. This sick, snuffling army now stumbled back in agony through country it had already stripped clean. Frigid autumn rains poured down incessantly, soaking the Vendeans' tattered clothes and slathering them with mud until the brown-gray mass of humanity seemed to dissolve into the brown-gray fields of western France. But increasingly, the palette was enlivened by scarlet showers of blood. The Blues had initially pursued the Vendeans with the same incompetence they had shown throughout the campaign. But slowly, their attacks started to take a toll. And, as the Parisian playwright had instructed, they showed no mercy. One commander in particular distinguished himself in ferocity. François-Joseph Westerman was a 42-year-old minor noble who had once served in the entourage of the king's brother. Turned revolutionary, he fought at Valmy and became an aide to Dumouriez, a connection that almost cost him his life after the general's defection. Thereupon, he acted as if he could prove his loyalty only through extreme rashness and brutality. During the summer of 1793, he took a major Vendean stronghold 
but lost it again in a surprise attack, with the Whites killing or taking prisoner nearly all of his 6,000 men. Put on trial for negligence, he told his judges that we can only defeat the Vendée by destroying it, and won acquittal. Pursuing the Vendéans north of the Loire, he would make a show of stripping off his jacket, rolling up his shirt sleeves, drawing his saber, and leading his men in bloody charges, after which he would dash off a letter to Paris, boasting of the death toll. After a month of agonized flight, the decomposing Vendean forces marched into the city of Le Mans on December 10th, meeting with minimal resistance. Witnesses claimed they had left so many bodies behind on their route that the air had turned unbreathable for miles around. In the city, they greedily took whatever food, clothing, and shoes they could find. Two days later, the Blues approached from the southeast. Westerman, eager to take credit for a victory, attacked prematurely, made little headway, and started frantically beating his own troops with the flat of his sword to keep them from retreating. But the next day, General Kleber arrived with 15,000 more soldiers. In the central marketplace, the remaining Vendean cannon blasted them with canister, but the Blues brought up artillery of their own and set about reducing the area to rubble. The outnumbered, exhausted whites broke and fled. Now the killing reached a new level. The brilliant young general François Severin Marceau stopped a hideous slaughter only by beating the call to arms, but not all the authorities on the scene approved. Three deputies from the convention rode back to their colleagues with satisfaction. Heaps of bodies are the only obstacle the enemy can put in the way of our troops. The massacre has been going on for fifteen hours. A Republican official, pursuing the Vendean survivors on the road to Laval, reported that the road was littered with corpses. Women, priests, monks, men and children, all were put to death. I took no prisoners. I did my duty, but there is pleasure in avenging one's country. Westermann gloried in the bloodshed as well. Without stopping for a moment, I followed the enemy on the road to Laval. The brigands fled into the woods, abandoning the army. But the citizens of the area tracked them down and brought them back by the dozens. All of them were hacked to pieces. I harried them so closely that the princesses and marquises had to abandon their wagons and splash through the mud. One Republican reported seeing a hundred naked bodies stacked neatly on the side of the road, reminding him of dead pigs waiting to be salted at the butcher's shop. Where rebels fell into the hands of local revolutionary tribunals, death sentences followed with implacable speed. Over the next eleven days, the survivors of the Vendée covered another 150 miles, with Marceau and Westermann hounding them. Approaching the Loire, thousands attempted to cross back to the Vendée on boats, rafts, even barrels. Thousands more were chased into nearby marshes to be shot or to drown. The remnants of the Catholic and Royal Army made a futile last stand near the village of Savonnet on December 23rd, and were annihilated. Westermann again made sure that the Parisian authorities knew the full extent of his merciless zeal, in a letter that has become justly notorious. There is no more Vendée, citizens. It has died under our free sword, with its women and children. I have just buried it in the marshes and woods of Savonnet. Following the orders you gave me, I have crushed children under the hooves of horses and massacred women who, these at least, will give birth to no more brigands. I do not have a single prisoner with which to reproach myself. I have exterminated everyone. In the two months since Cholet, 
more Vendeans had been killed than would be put to death in Paris throughout the entire period of the Terror. And the slaughter was still not close to ending. Durot's columns had not yet marched. What explains the ferocity with which the Blues hunted the pitiful remnants of the insurrection? The desire for revenge against Vendeans they considered guilty of massacres, ambushes, and the torture of prisoners certainly counted for a great deal. Equally important was the conviction, born out of the experience of guerrilla war, that all Vendeans were potentially soldiers. The Vendeans themselves had not hesitated to boast that their entire population had gone to war. Several women who fought openly for the whites became folk heroes. But in early October, Antoine Francois Momoreau, a delegate from the radical Paris municipal government, turned this fact against the whites. This war does not at all resemble the one the Allied powers are waging against us. It is against an entire population that we must fight. We can therefore consider as enemies the entire population of the area, including the women who serve as spies and even as soldiers where necessary. Even as cannoneers, for several have been killed in their ranks and blown to pieces, from which their disguised sex was later recognized. Three deputies from the convention employed the same deadly logic. All the present inhabitants of the Vendée are dedicated rebels. It is the women and the girls and boys older than twelve who are the cruelest. They practice unspeakable cruelties on our volunteers. Some of them have been cut to pieces and others burned, and it is women who are committing these atrocities. If the Blues had motive, they also had opportunity. After mid-October 1793, the remnants of the Vendeans could still overwhelm lightly defended towns and cities, but they could no longer hold their ground against a serious Republican force. The Blues could therefore act without fear of major reprisals. And, as military historians have long observed, armies never pose a greater threat to prisoners and non-combatants than when they have won a major engagement, are shuddering with pent-up tension and fear, and have their enemy at their mercy. One Republican official took possible reprisals so lightly that he invited more of them. He ordered white prisoners shot at the approach of the enemy, because the whites would then do the same, and Republican soldiers would not dare surrender. Still, if these conditions help explain the bloodshed, they are not sufficient. For one thing, they have characterized portions of almost all modern guerrilla insurrections. What ultimately distinguished the Vendée was the politics, and not simply the general background of the revolution. What also mattered was the influence of a particular radical faction during the revolution's most astonishing, exalted, and perilous stage, under conditions of total war. True, we cannot talk of revolutionary factions the way we might talk of modern political parties. French revolutionaries loathed the very idea of party, of anything that implied division within the fraternal body politic, and groupings in practice were often slippery and elusive. Nor can we talk of any particular constellation of figures absolutely dominating the Vendée, for as Thoreau himself remarked, a principal characteristic of the revolutionary army was incoherence. Nonetheless, during the crucial period between the Battle of Nantes, June 1793, and the end of Thoreau's Hell Columns, March 1794, a rough pattern is visible. A key figure in the Vendée in the summer of 1793 was a man we met briefly in a previous chapter, Charles-Philippe Ronsin. Born in 1751, he served briefly in the army in his youth, rising to the rank of corporal, but gave it up to write a series of mediocre stage plays, all of which went unperformed. In 
physically imposing, and given to tremendous rages, he became one of the poor devils mocked by Voltaire, flitting resentfully around the margins of a literary world that had shut its glittering doors to him. As with many figures out of what Robert Darnton has called the literary underground of the old regime, his anger found hot expression in the Revolution. In August 1789, he published a demented pamphlet claiming that a debauched, nymphomaniacal Marie Antoinette had tried to assassinate her husband. He also joined the radical Cordelier Club, political home of Danton and Marat. As he became politically prominent, Paris theaters finally started to stage his plays. In 1791, he had particular success with the play that called precociously for war on all Europe in the name of universal peace. After the fall of the monarchy, he became part of the circle around Hébert and went to work for the war ministry, which the Hébertists controlled. Sent to the Vendée as a civilian agent in May 1793, Ronsin devoted as much time to political purges as to the war effort. He conceived a particularly savage hatred for Lausun, and for several weeks the two fell into a complex, intense bureaucratic duel. It expressed far more than simply personal rivalry. On the one side was the angry, foul-mouthed former private soldier and playwright, a creature of the political clubs, who fluently spoke the language of mass murder. Later in his career, Ronsin would insist that in the city of Lyon, which had also rebelled against the convention, only 1,500 of the 140,000 inhabitants deserved to live. On the other side stood the infinitely suave, courtly duke and peer of the realm, habitué of Versailles, equally at home on campaign and in aristocratic boudoirs. Lauzun was capable, even in the white heat of the Vendean War, of writing to the Committee of Public Safety a letter in which there breathed something of the old spirit of aristocratic restraint. Here, Frenchmen fall under the blows of other Frenchmen. The villages which we are despoiling are our own, and the blood which is flowing is ours as well. These deluded men will cease to be our enemies as soon as they recognize their errors. Needless to say, it had no effect. In the battle between Rolsan and Lauzun, in short, two opposing cultures of warfare came face to face. But there could be little doubt as to the outcome. The playwright accused the Duke of losing Angers through incompetence. His conduct is really appalling. His tardiness, his persecution of the best patriots, and above all, his position as a ci devant former noble give cause to fear that he will allow our army to perish. The Hebertists in the war ministry supported the charge, and soon Lauzun was recalled to Paris and placed under arrest. A few months later, the public prosecutor issued a predictable indictment. Born in the caste of the formerly privileged, having passed his life at the heart of a corrupt court, he only put on a mask of patriotism to deceive the nation. On December 31st, Lauzun went to the guillotine. Meanwhile, Ronsin's allies rewarded him with a transfer into the army and the most rapid promotion in French military history. A captain on June 30th, he rose successively over the next four days to the ranks of Major, Lieutenant Colonel, Colonel, and Brigadier General. Napoleon himself had a slower time of it. Lauzun's fall formed part of a campaign in which Ronsin and his allies, during the summer and fall of 1793, fought to take control over the war effort in the Vendée. In September, they managed to replace Canclo, the defender of Nantes, with a sans-culotte non-entity named Jean Léchelle who soon received a new, unified command over all the Republican forces. Lachelle in turn gave way to an unstable former goldsmith 
who encouraged soldiers to disobey the orders of insufficiently radical officers. Ronsin also made generals of two actor cronies who had seen only stage battlefields, not real ones. But for the Abertists, as we have already seen, political orthodoxy had an absolute primacy over military experience. When appointing Thurau supreme commander in November, War Minister Bouchot instructed him to dismiss any officer who is not recognized as Republican or totally devoted to the popular system. Professional soldiers such as Cancro and Kleber could not conceal their disgust for the Hébertists. After one particularly humiliating defeat, Lechelle openly exclaimed, what did I do to deserve to command such cowards? One of Kleber's wounded men replied, What did we do to deserve being commanded by such a Jean Foutre? Roughly, fucking bastard. The soldier had a point. Ronsin had little discernible military talent, and his protégés proved complete disasters in the field. Of course, so did some of the professional soldiers they favored abstract, unworkable plans of battle and the reduction of the Vendean forces through sheer, bloody attrition. During the Vire de Galerne, one of these protégés, over Kleber's protests, lined up his entire force of 20,000 men in a single column to attack the Whites, with predictably disastrous results. In an attempt to cover up the mistake, he then accused Kleber of being in the pay of the British and tried to send him to the guillotine. Historians have long recognized that such bumbling contributed as much as rebel doggedness to the long survival of the inexplicable Vendée. But the very lack of military experience and the utter devotion to orthodoxy had another, considerably more sinister effect which historians have largely ignored. Failing to meet the convention's demand for a complete end to military resistance, the Hebertist generals had no way of demonstrating their progress other than a high body count. Meanwhile, their military inexperience left them relying on little other than the rhetoric of total war. As we discussed in the previous chapter, it was the Herbertists who made the most frequent and extreme use of this rhetoric in 1793-94, demanding the total mobilization of the French population and the total extermination of France's enemies, both foreign and domestic, as part of what they presented as an apocalyptic confrontation between good and evil. It is no coincidence that the most extreme ideas for cleansing the Vendée came from Hébertist generals. It was one of Ronsin's protégés who asked the convention to have chemists develop a means of poisoning the entire region. It was another who similarly requested mines laden with poison gas. Nothing came of either of these requests, but during the Vire de Galerne, the Hébertists did anything but restrain the army in its conduct toward the fleeing Vendéans. Even those high-ranking officers not aligned with the faction felt pressure to go along with the general tendency, lest they be accused of the grave sin of moderation and sent to join Lauzun on the guillotine. Westerman, already under suspicion, is the prime example of this deadly dynamic. In his case, however, it did not work. Just days after the victory at Savonet, the convention recalled him and eventually put him on trial with his patron, Danton. They went to the guillotine together in April 1794. But the deadliest attempt to translate the abstract rhetoric of total war into military reality was yet to come. After Savonet, only a few thousand men under Charette, who had refused to cross the Loire, still put up any serious military resistance in the West. The revolutionary government, therefore, had the luxury of deciding how to pacify the Vendée once and for all. Kleber proposed a sober plan involving a series of fortified outposts throughout the territory, 
with flying columns that would pursue and destroy the remaining bands of brigands. He stressed the exhaustion of the Vandean population and their readiness to abandon the struggle, as long as the Blues could gain their confidence, through painstaking discipline. He also warned, It is impossible to cover the entire extent of this vast territory with our troops. The only result of trying to do so would be to set the ashes of the rebellion in flame again. Against this plan, Duro proposed his own, the Hell Columns, or what he called a military promenade across the Vendée, from one end to the other. As we have discussed, the Committee of Public Safety, although not explicitly approving the plan, did confirm Duro's authority as Supreme Commander in the West and allowed him to proceed. On January 20th, the columns marched. Neither a sans culotte nor a creature of the political clubs, Duro was not himself a Habertist. Born in 1756 into a family of modest legal functionaries in Normandy, he had barely begun a career as a professional soldier when the revolution broke out. Like many other new officers of the period, he rose rapidly through the ranks of the National Guard and served in Belgium and the South before taking command in the Vendée. But the Hébertists counted Duro as a friend, and he knew Ronsin well. He would later, in fact, marry Ronsin's widow. He, in turn, feared the Hébertists and followed their advice. His plan for the promenade came in part from Ronsin's crony, Joseph Robert, who served as his chief of staff. The plan fit exactly into the Hébertists' vision of the Vendée. It was gratifyingly apocalyptic, fearsomely abstract, and hugely impractical. The results of the promenade were so gruesome that historians have never really stopped to consider just how fantastical it was in the first place. It is worth quoting the orders Duro gave to the commanders of the columns on January 17th. All means will be used to uncover the rebels. All will be put to the sword. Villages, farmsteads, woods, heaths, thickets, and generally everything that can be burned will be set on fire. The heartland of the insurrection, it should be noted, covers around 5,000 square miles over three million acres, and has one of the wettest climates in Western Europe. How exactly did Thoreau, in the dead of winter, expect to burn the woods and heaths? And how did he expect slow-moving columns of men on foot, carrying heavy packs, to catch rebels who could easily escape into their native woods? There is little indication that he gave any of these matters serious consideration. He was simply attempting a literal application of Barrère's rhetoric from August, which the convention had approved, but not taken steps to implement. To exterminate this rebel race, to destroy their hiding places, to burn their forests, to cut down their crops. In the short term, the columns were all too predictably inefficient in their principal mission. Antoinette Charlotte de la Bouère, the wife of a Vendean leader, later wrote a vivid description of how the most committed rebels, knowing they could expect no mercy from the blues, ran off each day to the woods, hiding in thickets, curling up for hours under blankets on the wet ground. They easily spotted the columns, which marched to the sound of drumbeats, and whose attempts at arson sent greasy clouds of smoke into the air wherever they passed. A cruel signal, she called it, but it saved three-quarters of the inhabitants, one would guess. As a result, in a cruelly ironic twist, the Vendeans most vulnerable to the columns were those like Vincent Chapelain, who assumed that they had nothing to fear. Predictably, the promenade did little to hinder Charette, who recruited more soldiers from among its targets, and who delivered a drubbing to two of the columns in early February. 
Duhau himself wrote to the Committee of Public Safety on January 25th to confess, I am in despair about being able to burn down the forests. Deliriously, he suggested they should be cut down instead. To him, the steady flow of volunteers to Charette only made his plan of extermination more urgent. Faced with the impossibility of carrying out their plan in a systematic manner, Duro's 30,000 men could deal out little but random rampage and murder. Not all of them carried out their orders. Officers under General Nicolas Haxo later claimed that he refused to obey immoral commands, whereas General Bard was suspended for a similar refusal. Patriotic towns and villages in the areas tried to prevent the columns from carrying out massacres, and one, Luçon, succeeded in having a particularly sadistic deputy of Grignon tried and executed for theft, rape, and murder. Nor did all the columns gain the barbaric reputation that those commanded by Grignon and Cordelier did. Nonetheless, after long months of unremitting bloodshed, plenty of Republican soldiers were ready to wreak vengeance on a largely helpless population. The letters written by the Blues speak for themselves. Here is the volunteer François Javier Jolicler, writing home on January 25th from Cholet as his column prepared to march. We are going to be bearing iron and fire, a gun in one hand and a torch in the other. Men and women all will be put to the sword. All must die, except the small children. Or a certain Captain Dupoy, writing to his sister in January. Wherever we go, we are bearing fire and death. Age, sex, nothing is being respected. Yesterday, one of our detachments burned a village. One volunteer killed three women with his own hands. It is atrocious, but the safety of the Republic demands it imperatively. What a war! We haven't seen a single individual that we haven't shot. Everywhere, the ground is strewn with corpses. Or a local Republican official, describing the blue tactics to a friend on February 24th. Destroy the water mills, burn the windmills, smash the ovens depend on the humanity of the cavalry each day to gather up those children who can be given a Republican education. Send them out to follow the grain convoys, their livestock. Put everyone else to the sword, both sexes, young and old. I have become cruel. The pains that this cursed war has made me suffer force me to be so. Or the provisioning agent Baudisson recalling the scene on the road from Cholet to Villiers. Everywhere the eye fell on bloody scenes. Inside the half-burned houses, what did I find? Fathers, mothers, children, swimming in their own blood, naked, and in postures that the most ferocious soul could not envisage without shuddering. The blood-drenched stories of what the columns wrought could be continued almost endlessly. Charles-Louis Chassin, a historian favorable to the Revolution, who published the definitive documentary collection on the Vendée in the late 19th century, has hundreds of pages of them. Historians loyal to the memory of the Vendée have even more. Even today, their histories read like Catholic martyrologies they indiscriminately mingle well-attested accounts from contemporary letters and depositions with tales recounted decades later in half-fictionalized memoirs. They give credence to wild stories of sadism that evoke the cruelties of the SS. Some of these may be true, but, as with the alleged massacre at Le Luc, many are probably exaggerated, misremembered, or simply invented out of whole cloth. The atrocities committed in the city of Nantes under the rule of Jean-Baptiste Carrier are better attested, in part because Carrier was later tried for them and executed. Carrier also had ties to the Hébertists, but in his case, 
mass murder did not follow from a fantastically abstract plan of campaign. As a representative on mission in Nantes in the fall of 1793, he was faced with the problem of how to deal with thousands of Vendean prisoners crammed into insecure, unsanitary jails, posing the twin dangers of breakout and epidemic, with more arriving each day. Horrifically, he and his fellow representatives decided to solve the problem by killing as many as possible. The guillotine, however, proved too slow and also quite literally too nauseating for the patriots of the city. No method of execution spills a greater quantity of blood. The authorities then turned to mass firing squads, but as one Nantes recounted to a deputy, shooting them takes too long and uses up too much gunpowder and too many bullets. So there then was devised the ghastly expedient of lashing the prisoners into barges and lighters and sinking them in the Loire. The revolutionaries devised many euphemisms for this mass murder. Sending to the water tower. Sending to Nantes by water. Most horribly, in post-1945 retrospect, deportation. Carrier sadistically reported to the convention that prisoners had accidentally drowned. Similarly, General Robert reported that 2,000 Vendeans had unfortunately drowned farther upstream while trying to escape, because they unfortunately had their hands and legs tied. What a revolutionary torrent the Loire has become, Carrier declared. It is reliably estimated that between 2,800 and 4,600 people died in these mass drownings at Nantes, and that another 1,896 were executed by guillotine or firing squad. Corpses washed up on the banks of the river for months. It is out of a principle of humanity that I am purging the land of liberty of these monsters, said Carrier on December 20th, 1793. As spring came to western France in 1794, the pace of the killings finally slowed. In Paris, one of the titanic political battles of the terror ended with Hébert, Ronsin, and several other ultra-revolutionaries going to the guillotine. The victors, led by Robespierre and Saint-Just, were hardly moderates, but they liked their bloodshed well-ordered and efficient not wild and anarchic. Their success was very bad news indeed for political suspects in Paris, who went before kangaroo courts and thence to the guillotine at a steeply rising pace. Between April and July, the terror turned in a totalitarian direction. But the victory was better news for the Vendée, where the episode of the Hell Columns was not repeated. In July, the terror itself came to an end. A number of deputies to the convention, fearful for their lives, persuaded their colleagues to arrest Robespierre, Saint-Just, and a number of allies. The next day, the man who had proposed peace to the world in 1790 and argued fiercely against war in 1791-92, only to find himself at the head of the most intense war effort Europe had ever known, died hideously by the guillotine to which he had condemned so many others. A failed suicide attempt had left him with a mangled jaw. To fit his neck under the blade, the executioner ripped the bandages off. The new rulers of the convention, though themselves stained by the terror, now sought rapidly to distance themselves from its excesses. In the fall, in the Vendée, the government started to issue amnesties. The region remained unsettled, and smaller-scale risings would continue for many years, as would the low-level Chouannerie throughout the West. But the War of the Vendée was over. As for Thoreau, he was recalled and put on trial. During his imprisonment, he wrote his long, self-pitying memoir, 
which insisted, in retrospectively chilling language, that he had done nothing but follow orders. What is the cause for this inconceivable obstinacy with which you are now prosecuting those under orders, the very passive executors of the government's wishes? You have now substituted softer measures for the terrible ones you thought you needed to end the war. None too soon, but admit at least that you intended the complete destruction of the Vendée and do not persecute your agents. Carrier had gone to the guillotine six months before. Duro, however, did not join him. He was acquitted, then reinstated in his rank. Between 1797 and 1801, he fought for France in Belgium, Germany, Italy, and Austria. In 1803, Napoleon named him ambassador to the United States, where he stayed for eight years, helping oversee the transfer of the Louisiana Purchase and gaining notoriety for having his secretary play music to cover the screams when he beat his wife, Ronsan's widow. Back in the French army, as Napoleon's empire was collapsing in 1814, he chose the right moment to surrender the citadel he commanded and to declare his loyalty to the brother of the executed Louis XVI, who awarded him France's highest military decoration. Durot died peacefully at home in 1816. Twenty years later, his name was carved on the Arc de Triomphe in Paris, alongside that of Napoleon's other generals, where it is still visible today. Seeing it makes one realize that Reynal Secher, despite his flagrant exploitation of the term genocide, has a point when he complains that France's Fifth Republic has yet fully to come to terms with the crimes of the First. The war in the Vendée was not a genocide. That, however, is probably the only positive thing that can be said about it. It was a tragedy of unspeakable dimensions, and its suppression was a ghastly crime, as well as an indelible stain on the revolution, which allowed men like Westerman, Ronsin, and Thoreau to rise and flourish. Responsibility for this crime cannot be laid entirely at the feet of the revolutionary leadership, which did not run as efficient a dictatorship as some historians imagine. But to the extent that there existed a dynamic of radicalization within the revolution, a competition for power that consistently favored exponents of the most extreme stances and policies, the Vendée condemns it and condemns those who helped to drive it forward. The Vendée was the face of total war, which followed its own dynamic of radicalization. It was the place where the modern version of the phenomenon was first revealed to its full, gruesome extent. As in most modern cases, its totality did not derive primarily from the battlefield clashes between organized armies. World War I is a distracting exception in this case. What made it total was rather its erasure of any line between combatants and non-combatants, and the wanton slaughter of both and at the behest of politics more than military necessity. In fact, from a strictly military point of view, Thoreau's hell columns had no serious purpose at all. His plan was a witch's brew of hatred, fear, fantasy, and pure folly. Its execution an unmitigated horror, and counterproductive to the extent that it spurred further resistance. But then, Extermination of the enemy, as opposed to disarming it, has hardly ever served a serious military purpose. We destroyed the village in order to save it. And to say that the barbarism of one side impelled the barbarism of the other is not much of an excuse. It is General Salomon's excuse. To defeat the enemy, we must become him. Thankfully, Nothing in the next 21 years of revolutionary and Napoleonic warfare quite matched the Vendée's level of bloodshed. But the Vendée nonetheless served as a precedent, a matrix of French experience, 
during those 21 years, the French Republic and Empire would face many cases of insurrection and irregular warfare, most often from traditional rural Catholics fairly similar to the Vendeans. The Vendée gave an apparent warning of just how dangerous such insurrections could turn and just what methods might be necessary to suppress them. And it was not just a general national memory that taught this lesson, but a living skein of military memory. Even beyond 1815, many veterans of the Vendée held prominent positions in the French army and continually referred back to it as the crucible of their military experience. A point worth noting, and which gives the war of the invasion of Spain a special character, is that, just like the War of the Vendée, it was entirely a people's war. Thus General Joseph Hugo, who served in both campaigns. The Vendée was not a genocide but it nonetheless stirs memories of recent genocidal horrors, enough to make one think that it must have scoured every last trace of romance out of European warfare. Except that it did not. Even as the Hell Columns were marching, the Vendeans were weaving their own romantic myths about the conflict, while Robespierre, as we have already seen, was constructing the romantic cult of the boy hero Joseph Barra, killed by Vendean rebels. Then, and for a century to come, the Vendée would exert a deeply romantic hold on the European imagination, so much so that some of the continent's greatest writers, Balzac, Dumas, even Anthony Trollope, tried their hands at portraying the war not to mention General Hugo's son, Victor, who made the Vendée the subject of one of his greatest novels, 93. This war of the ignorant, he wrote in it, so stupid and so splendid, abominable and magnificent, devastated France and gave it pride. The Vendée is a scourge, which is also a glory. But the Vendée was not what struck Victor Hugo and his readers as the most seductively romantic aspect of the wars. For that, they looked elsewhere, to what they saw as the incarnation of military glory in the life of a single man. Chapter 6 The Lure of the Eagle Ambition, like all disordered passions, is a violent and unthinking delirium. Like a fire fed by a pitiless wind, it only burns out after having consumed everything in its path. Napoleon Bonaparte, 1791 During his fifty-one years, Napoleon Bonaparte exposed himself to enemy fire in scores of battles, and survived at least four serious assassination plots. So it is not unreasonable to ask how history might have remembered him had he died earlier than he did. Of course, counterfactual speculation of this sort always has a parlor game feel to it, but in this case, it reveals a great deal about both Napoleon and the beginnings of total warfare described in the previous chapters. Imagine, for instance, that the man who still signed his name, Napoleon Buonaparte, had died in his first military engagement, a bungled assault by Corsican French forces against the island of La Madalena, off the coast of Sardinia, in early 1793. He might well have done so, for Corsican leader Pasquale Pauli probably sent the annoyingly ambitious young officer on this dangerous expedition precisely to get rid of him. Napoleon was then an unknown 23-year-old artillery officer who would have left few traces in the history books. But if historians later came across him in the archives, would they have found hints of possible greatness? Despite the tales that acquaintances later retailed of his precocious strategic genius, for instance, in schoolyard snowball fights, the answer is likely no. In 
the sources from this time mostly present Napoleon as a typical junior officer of the old regime. Born into the minor nobility of Corsica in 1769, a year after the island's annexation by France, he benefited from the 18th century attempts to professionalize the French officer class and won admission to the new military school at Brienne. Yet, after receiving his commission in 1785, he did not undertake anything like a dedicated professional career. As we have learned, like many of his peers, he spent more time on leave than with his regiment. Even when supposedly on duty, he favored solitary study over military business whenever possible. Although ravenously ambitious from the start, the young Napoleon knew quite well that minor Corsican nobles had little hope of rising high in the French army. A glittering military career could be found only in foreign service. As late as 1794, he toyed with enrolling in the Turkish army. To shine in France would mean following another path, and before 1789, Napoleon thought most seriously of becoming a writer. He did dream, passionately, of Corsican independence, but this seemed a lost cause before 1789. He therefore devoted much of his energy to sketching out philosophical dialogues, historical essays, even love stories. In this juvenilia, incidentally, he expressed an utterly banal late Enlightenment contempt for the sort of military ambition that feeds on blood and crimes, and that led such figures as Alexander, Cromwell, or Louis XIV to conquer and devastate the world. Now leap ahead a few months, and imagine that Napoleon's death came during France's late 1793 attempt to retake the port city of Toulon from the British. In the battle, he did in fact have a horse shot out from under him, and received a bayonet wound to the thigh, leading an English newspaper to report him killed in action. The historian Travillon, who discovered the article, quipped that, Everything I have learned since has increased my regret that the news proved inaccurate. Napoleon still would not have merited more than a few lines in specialized history books, but now he would seem less a typical noble officer than a quintessential young soldier of the Revolution. True, between 1789 and mid-1793, his attention had remained fixed on Corsica and on ingratiating himself with Pauli, the aging hero of the island's earlier campaigns for independence. General, I was born as the fatherland was dying, he wrote cloyingly to the old man by way of introducing himself. But after several snubs and rebuffs, Napoleon grew disillusioned and began scheming against Pauli, who schemed back, rather more effectively, forcing the entire Bonaparte family to flee to the mainland. Even before this flight, Napoleon had also shown genuine enthusiasm for the revolution. He rhapsodized in print over the leading figures of the National Assembly. Oh, Lameth! Oh, Robespierre! Oh, Mirabeau! Oh, Barnave! And, after reading of a political murder, told his older brother, That's one fat aristocrat less. He set up a revolutionary club in the Corsican town of Ajaccio and maneuvered unscrupulously to win election to a high rank in the local National Guard contingent. After arriving on the mainland in 1793, he composed a pamphlet in favor of the Jacobins, which brought him the patronage of Augustin Robespierre, Maximilien's brother, who found for him a coveted artillery post in the army besieging Toulon. After Napoleon's ideas for how to end the siege proved successful, he won promotion to brigadier general. He was just twenty-four. I would add to the list of patriots, wrote Augustin Robespierre afterward, the name of citizen Bonaparte, an officer of transcendent merit.
Thanks to the revolution, Napoleon no longer contemplated a career as a writer, but had thrown himself wholly into the cause of a revolutionary nation engaged in total war. Finally, skip ahead four more years and imagine that Napoleon had died in November 1796 at the Battle of Arcola in northern Italy. Again, he almost did, for at a crucial moment his horse slipped down an embankment, hurling him into a marshy canal. Several of his soldiers dragged him out again under heavy fire, and one was killed. By now, Napoleon had established a formidable reputation and would deserve a major place in any history of the Revolutionary Wars. Taking command of the Army of Italy in the spring of 1796, he had carried out a brilliant campaign, separating his Austrian enemies from their Sardinian allies, knocking the latter out of the war entirely, and then defeating the Austrians in one battle after another, until most of northern Italy had fallen into his grasp, a goal that had eluded French generals for centuries. This Napoleon, however, had a very different social and political profile from his earlier self. His days as a radical revolutionary ended when the Thermidor coup of 1794 toppled Robespierre and Saint-Just and brought the terror to an end. Napoleon himself, thanks to his radical ties, spent a nervous eleven days in prison after the coup. Thereafter, he rapidly altered his profile and behaved less as a convinced revolutionary than as a classic political general of the type pioneered by Dumouriez in 1792-93. That is to say, one who unapologetically placed his own interests ahead of ideology and campaigned for political influence in Paris as vigorously as he did for enemy territory. When the government tried to send him to the Vendée to chase the remnants of the White Army through the ruined province, he balked at this classic Jacobin assignment, malingering, delaying, ignoring orders, and almost leaving the army in protest. He also attached himself to a new patron he had met at Toulon, an unscrupulous deputy named Paul Barat, who had helped plot the Thermidor coup. When royalist crowds marched on the convention in the late summer of 1795, Barat called on Bonaparte, who turned artillery on them in central Paris, the famous slaughter by whiff of grapeshot, whose scars still mark the walls of the church of Saint Roche. But his ruthlessness served the same purpose as his earlier Jacobin pamphlet writing. It brought him attention and vaulted him up the ladder of promotions. Within a year, thanks to Barat, he had taken command of the Army of Italy. At least one fellow general, Suchet, whom Napoleon would name a marshal in 1811, dismissed him as a general known only by the Parisians, an intriguer supported by nothing. Only with the Italian campaign of 1796 to 97 would the Napoleon known to our own history books begin to come into focus. This little counterfactual exercise therefore shows us a Napoleon very different from the popular image of the man as always and everywhere the same uncontainable force of nature. His early career reflected the changing contours of war so precisely that it does a fair job of recapitulating the first chapters of this book. At each stage, Napoleon's strategies for advancement grew out of his uncanny sense of the existing possibilities for someone in his position. His own younger brother, Lucien, sensed as much and dilated on the implications for Napoleon's character in a revealing letter to their older brother Joseph, written in 1792. There are no men more hated in history than those who bend with the wind. I will say to you in full confidence that I have always detected in Napoleon an ambition that is not altogether selfish 
but which overcomes his love for the common good. I truly think that in a free state, he would be a dangerous man. He seems inclined to be a tyrant, and I think that he would be one if he were king. Prophetic, to say the least. Napoleon's bending to the wind, however, amounted to more than mere cynical opportunism. As we shall discuss, he was more psychologically complex than this, and could come to believe fervently in the roles he played, the mask becoming the man. Even in his Jacobinism, which he seemed to peel off like a tattered paper disguise after Thermidor, kept enough of a grip on him that twenty-five years later, after having claimed an imperial title and married the great-niece of Marie Antoinette, he could still express admiration for Robespierre and regret at his fall. An emphasis on Napoleon's adaptability is particularly useful for understanding the years of his rise to power, 1794 to 99. In these years, Napoleon sensed ongoing changes in the nature of European war and politics with preternatural precision, exploited them with incomparable skill, and rode them to a concentration of power heretofore undreamed of in European history. He is necessarily the central figure of these years, to the extent that the vivid, brilliant colors of his story leave everything else looking pale and wan. The changes of 1794 to 99 were some of the most far-reaching of the entire 18th century. In these years, the French gave up all but the slimmest pretense of fighting for a just and perpetual peace among the nations. They now pursued expansion and conquest with relatively little apology, and if they granted the conquered peoples a role in their new European order, it remained emphatically their order. At best, French leaders proceeded out of the belief that only a French-led Europe could continue along the path of historical progress sketched out by the writers of the late Enlightenment. At the same time, these years saw military officers again occupying leading positions in French politics and society, after the civilian ascendancy of 1789-94. to And, the period saw a sustained re-glorification of war, a growing conviction in the culture that it was an activity worth pursuing not only for a greater good, but also for its own sake. But these years emphatically did not mark a return to the old regime of war that had prevailed before 1789. War remained total in the revolutionary manner. At key moments, the French leadership continued to see the ongoing conflict in garishly apocalyptic terms, and this vision prompted them to attempt to use every political means at their disposal to mobilize the nation's resources. It led them to fight not simply to defeat France's enemies, but also to destroy them and to absorb the broken pieces of their regimes into new configurations of power. It led them to treat these enemies as monsters rather than as honorable adversaries. When enemy populations resisted French occupations, they were to be fed the acid medicine of the Vendée. In France itself, the nation and the military, after having supposedly melted into each other in the white heat of the levee en masse, did not solidify back into the earlier complex social latticework dominated by a hereditary military class. Instead, a far more radical process took place, which saw the military separate out into a society and culture far more distinct than before, from a sphere that could now be fully characterized, in opposition to it, as civilian. Finally, the re-glorification of war in no way entailed a return to the traditional aristocratic code of splendor, self-control, and dedication to the service of the hereditary prince. The new model of military glory was less a model of aristocratic perfection 
than of romantic transcendence. It had a relationship to the revolution's febrile celebration of patriotic self-sacrifice. But it now came to focus less on the revolution's cold and high ideals than on the prowess of individual warriors. In short, war was becoming evermore something that societies might desire, and this desire took physical form in the person of Napoleon. The France in which these changes took place has a poor historical reputation. The standard account long held that after the pitiless, austere virtue of the terror came a time of luxuriant debauch. In this view, the fall of Robespierre and his allies opened the door to a corrupt whirl of pleasures. Under the unscrupulous leaders who governed between 1794 and 1799, the poor suffered malign neglect, whereas the bourgeoisie engaged in a riot of conspicuous consumption. Preening dandies dressed their mistresses in diaphanous gowns. At the so-called Bal des Victimes, relatives of those guillotined under the terror tied red ribbons around their necks in macabre memory of the dead. A recent scholarship has done its best to dissolve this collage of clichés. Revolutionary ideals, it emphasizes, did not evaporate between 1794 and 1799. Throughout the country, some democratic practices spread and solidified. New state institutions to promote education, welfare, and justice took root. A cadre of influential intellectuals sought to stabilize the revolution by grounding it in scientific principles. The Bals des Victimes, it has been revealed, never took place. They were an invention of early 19th century Romantic authors. There is no denying, however, that between 1794 and 1799, a stable constitutional regime utterly failed to materialize. In the year after the Thermidor coup, the survivors in the convention bloodily put down challenges from the left and the right. They also eventually managed to devise yet another new constitution. In a self-conscious retreat from their earlier radicalism, they again restricted the electorate to the well-to-do and divided power among a bicameral legislature and a five-man executive directory. Through this profession of moderation, they sought to unite the warring political factions that had emerged from the terror, but they sacrificed their own democratic credibility almost immediately by decreeing that two-thirds of the new legislature would come from their own ranks so as to ensure their political survival. The collapse of the fragile revolutionary paper currency did little to soothe popular discontent. For a couple of years, it nonetheless seemed as if this newest, new regime might yet consolidate itself. A relatively moderate, neo-Jacobin political grouping emerged as a prominent force, committed to revolutionary reform, without accompanying terror. But by the summer of 1797, the right was rapidly increasing in strength and seemed close to replacing the republic with a restored monarchy. Louis XVI's younger brother was now claiming the throne. Rather than allow this to happen, three republican directors, backed by the army, carried out a coup, dismissing 200 deputies and their own two more conservative colleagues. Two further minor coups took place in 1798 to 99, stripping the regime of virtually all legitimacy. Worst of all, as aftershocks of the terror continued to rip apart local communities, criminality and political violence rose to unprecedented levels. To contain them, the regime felt that it had no choice but to call out the army and try civilians before military courts. By the fall of 1799, 40% of France had fallen under effective military rule. It was predictable that by this point, the dominant figure in the directory 
Emmanuel Sies, a hero of the early revolution, should want to take these various trends to their logical conclusion. I need a sword, he declared. Material conditions were just as bad in the armies. The government had done little large-scale recruiting or conscription since the levée en masse, so the burden of the fighting fell heavily on the same soldiers who had entered the ranks in 1791-94. to The economic collapse, moreover, left these soldiers with worthless pay and a miserable supply situation. We are not living, only suffering, wrote a lieutenant in the summer of 1795, who laconically described his daily rations. No bread, just two pounds of sprouted potatoes, and three ounces of dry, worm-eaten peas. On August 10, having caught a cat, we had no choice but to introduce it to our stew pot. The low point came in early 1796, when the Army of Italy saw a staggering four-fifths of its men spend time in the hospital. A soldier wrote home bitterly of having to march without proper shoes or coats in the snow-covered mountains. While at home, citizens enjoyed warm beds. Why did we fight? he asked in a badly spelled letter. They led us to believe it was for our liberty. But it was the reverse. We are slaves more than we ever were before. Yet despite these handicaps, the armies enjoyed a remarkable string of successes that contrasted dramatically with French domestic strife. The devastation of the Vendée had already reduced the Western insurrections from a mortal threat to a lingering, if serious, nuisance. And the victories of 1794 had driven the Allies back from the French borders. Then, in a winter offensive, when ice prevented the Dutch from opening the dikes to bog down the invaders, French forces surged north to occupy the Netherlands and transform it into a puppet state. In the spring of 1795, France signed a peace treaty with Prussia, which wanted to concentrate its energies in the east. Another French army penetrated deep into northern Spain, forcing the Spanish to switch sides and ally with their former enemy. With these flanks secure, the Directory then planned a triple thrust at France's chief remaining enemy on the continent, Austria. In the spring of 1796, three armies would attack eastward one from the Rhineland, one from Alsace, one from the Mediterranean coast. The last and smallest of these, Napoleon's Army of Italy, would attack mostly as a diversion, allowing the other two to strike for the Austrian heartland. The first two armies, however, saw their offensives rapidly bogged down. Napoleon, meanwhile, sliced into northern Italy, dazzling his opponents with his precise maneuvers and his ability to bring superior forces into action at the right time and place. On May 16th, he entered Milan and then turned south. The small states into which the Italian peninsula was still divided could not resist him, and within a month, everything north of Rome had passed under his control. Austria continued to resist holding on to the great fortress town of Mantua. But Napoleon continued his series of victories, Castiglione, Arcola, and finally, in January 1797, the decisive Battle of Rivoli. The negotiations that followed eventually led to the Treaty of Campoformio, signed in October 1797, which left Great Britain the only power still at war with France. Austria acknowledged French rule over Belgium, and also Napoleon's creation of a new puppet state in Italy, the Cisalpine Republic, whose constitution followed the French model. In five years of war, France had decisively broken the old balance of power. In its territorial gains and its Italian victories, it had fulfilled the long-frustrated dreams of the monarchy and reached what its apologists like to call its 
natural boundaries. The Rhine, the Alps, the Pyrenees, and the sea. Such a far-reaching and decisive shift could never have occurred so quickly under the old regime of warfare, with its careful campaigns of maneuvers and its code of aristocratic restraint. Even Frederick the Great, the most daring of 18th-century leaders, did not come close to redrawing the map and reweighting the powers in such a dramatic way so quickly. Would the new era continue? Napoleon sent some clear signals that it would not. The huge prestige he had garnered with his victory allowed him to behave like a little king in the territory he had conquered, and he did. He established a virtual court for himself at Montebello and insisted that it follow strict rules of social etiquette. He dined before spectators, like the Bourbons at Versailles, and when he arrived in Rastatt, Germany, for negotiations, did so in an elaborate berline pulled by eight horses, a privilege traditionally reserved for monarchs. Most significantly, in the negotiations themselves, which he tried to present to the directory as a fait accompli, he no longer even gave lip service to the right of peoples to self-determination. To compensate Austria for its loss of Belgium, he blithely agreed to let it annex the Republic of Venice, which had existed as an independent republic, if no model of democracy, for centuries. The decision, worthy of an aristocratic diplomat of the old regime, shocked the French neo-Jacobins, who had heretofore counted the young general as one of their own. But in the end, Napoleon's taste for royal splendor and realpolitik was deceptive. If he was embracing traditional forms of legitimation, he would do so without rejecting the new regime of war. This desire to have things both ways would be an enduring characteristic of Napoleon's career. And in fact, War in the late 1790s was taking yet another radical turn. To understand this turn more closely, there is no better place to start than with Napoleon himself at the moment he took command of the Army of Italy, March 27, 1796. He was still just 26, and by all accounts he did not yet cut a very impressive figure. Numerous descriptions of him from the period call attention to his poor clothes and untidy appearance, especially his hair, badly cut, badly combed, and badly powdered, falling down to his shoulders in a lank mess. Subordinates in the Army of Italy initially had trouble believing that he was the general-in-chief. The wife of General Junot later wrote, I can still see him crossing the courtyard of the Hotel de la Tranquillité with an awkward and uncertain gait, with a horrible little round hat thrust down over his eyes, long, thin, dark hands, wearing badly made, badly polished boots, and that overall sickly appearance which came from his scrawniness and yellowish complexion. He spoke incorrect, heavily accented French, Yet Napoleon had several qualities that augured well for his success. First, he had genuinely extraordinary mental capacities that included, by some accounts, a near photographic memory. Second, he had a phenomenal energy and capacity for work. As proof, one need only consult the nearly 2,000 letters he wrote or dictated in the years 1796 and 1797 alone which take up over a thousand tightly packed pages of his general correspondence. In it, we see him taking charge of matters ranging from the number of carts needed to carry a regiment's paperwork, to the amount of munitions carried by soldiers, to the position of drummer boys in a marching column. In his campaigns, his success came in large part from his ability to keep the positions of thousands of men in scores of separate units in his head along with information about munitions and supplies, and to calculate how to maneuver them all for maximum effect. Napoleon could also draw on a military training perfectly suited to the way warfare was developing. 
well before 1789, the French army had developed a new system of mobile heavy guns, equipment, and service personnel to facilitate the movement and rapid concentration of separate units. As a young artillery officer, Napoleon received intensive training in it, which gave him a natural inclination for the tactics that the French army embraced during the Revolution, involving rapid deployment of large, mobile masses of soldiers and the concentration of overwhelming force against a single enemy position, whereas the commanders of 1793-94 to had to deal with crudely organized masses of poorly trained troops, Napoleon could count on smaller units of seasoned and disciplined soldiers, the same men as before, but now with the experience of several campaigns behind them. He could and did push them very hard, marching men with 60-pound loads on their backs as much as 50 miles over a 36-hour period. As one of his soldiers proudly complained years later, the emperor has discovered a new way of waging war. He makes use of our legs instead of our bayonets. These are the factors that Napoleon's biographers have called the most attention to in explaining his rise to prominence. They certainly help explain the stunning military successes he had in Italy. But just as important was the way Napoleon crafted his own image as an extraordinary figure, as the god of the new age of war. In Italy and throughout his early campaigns, he demanded more of his soldiers than any general of the period, and could not have done so without their active enthusiasm, indeed, without what sometimes amounted to fanatical devotion. He also quickly established a popularity in the French population unmatched by any other figure, civilian or military. He could not have accomplished this all without a very keen sense of how to speak to his fellow countrymen, and more, how to touch them emotionally. The first key element was simply to show his soldiers he cared for them. On taking command of the Army of Italy in 1796, he immediately devoted himself to improving its living conditions. He raised pay and tried to frighten crooked contractors into supplying his forces at an honest rate. Much of his correspondence from the end of March deals with the banal but fundamental subject of meat, which one of his divisions had not seen for months. He ordered that it receive fresh meat every second day and salt meat on the others. Within three days he was boasting, I have given out meat, bread, forage. My soldiers are showing me inexpressible confidence. Once in Italy, he did not hesitate to pick the country bare to keep his men well-fed and comfortable. Wherever his armies arrived, there followed demands for hefty contributions. Oxen by the hundred, bread rations by the hundreds of thousands, bottles of wine and brandy by the tens of thousands, as many coats and pairs of shoes as possible. In battle, he often led his soldiers in person, ostentatiously sharing their dangers. Napoleon also understood the importance of less tangible rewards, of honor and distinction, and never thought to limit these things to the officer class. In November 1797, for instance, he drew up a list of a hundred soldiers, including simple privates and drummer boys, who would receive specially engraved sabers for such feats as carrying letters through enemy lines, or refusing to surrender even after receiving seven sword wounds. He then had the awards splashed across the front page of the French-language newspaper, published under his supervision in Milan. His coat of honor could dole out disgrace just as easily. When two French units broke and ran in Italy, he excoriated them in astonishing terms. Soldiers, I am not happy with you. You gave in at the first setback. Soldiers of the 85th and 39th, you are no longer French soldiers. The men in question begged for a chance to redeem themselves, and at the next battle suffered horrific casualties, but covered themselves with glory.
just as important, Napoleon treated his soldiers as equals. As a second lieutenant, his training had included a stint as a simple gunner, learning how to load, fire, and swab cannon. It was an experience that taught him a crucial lesson, not to condescend. As he told his brother Lucian as early as 1792, chiding him for composing an overly abstract, verbose public proclamation, This is not the way to speak to the people. They have more tact and more sense than you think. In his own first proclamation to the army of Italy, he chose to call himself the soldier's brother in arms. And six weeks later, at the Battle of Lodi, he supposedly stepped in to help aim at the artillery pieces. It was a piece of bravado that won Napoleon an enduring nickname, which no general of the old regime would have tolerated. The Little Corporal. He even allowed some common soldiers to address him with the informal tu. In proclamations and speeches, which he made more frequently than any other general, he addressed the soldiers in loose, familiar, emotional language. I can't express the feelings I have for you any better than by saying that I bear along in my heart the love that you show me every day. Yet, like a talented composer, Napoleon could speak to his men in different registers and frequently modulated the intimate warble of the second person singular with the basso profondo of the epic proclamation. April 26th. 1796. Soldiers, the fatherland has the right to expect great things of you. Are there any of you whose courage falters? No, there are none. All of you burn to carry onwards the glory of the French people. All of you wish to be able to say with pride, upon returning to your villages, I was part of the conquering army of Italy. May 20th. 1796. Soldiers, you have rushed like a torrent from the heights of the Apennines. You have overthrown, dispersed, and scattered everything that hindered your advance. Yes, soldiers, you have done much. But does not much remain to be done? So then, let us depart. We still have forced marches to make, enemies to subdue laurels to gather, and insults to avenge. May 10th, 1798 Soldiers, Europe has its eyes on you. You have a great destiny to fulfill. You will do more than you have yet done. For the prosperity of the fatherland, the happiness of mankind, and your own glory. To modern sensibilities, the bombast is almost unbearable. But it worked. The soldiers responded. Although Napoleon's rapport with the troops had many precedents, in one sense, he was entirely original. He was the world's first media general, exploiting every possible means of communication to diffuse and popularize the image he crafted of himself. Most important, he founded newspapers. In the Italian campaign, the Courier of the Army of Italy and France Seen from the Army of Italy. The first, printed every other day, reported army news and French news to the soldiers and probably had a considerable free circulation in France as well. Its closely printed four-page issues borrowed copiously from left-wing Paris papers but Napoleon himself contributed a number of articles. The second, filled with longer, more thoughtful, and more politically moderate articles, aimed at a French civilian audience. The Courier, in particular, faithfully reflected the various aspects of Napoleon's carefully constructed image. It breathed concern for ordinary soldiers, echoing their complaints and reporting lovingly on them. It faithfully reported on the doings of the little corporal as well, stressing how he shared his men's dangers and discomforts. But it could adopt the epic tone of his proclamations with relish. <laughs>
particularly in a long report on the campaign, which appeared in October 1797. Today, glory has written a new name on its immortal tablets, with no fear of it ever being erased. The divinations which predicted a brilliant destiny for the young islander have come true. The time is past in which he locked himself up in his tent, a voluntary prisoner, a new Archimedes always at work. He knows that he is one of those men who have no limit to their power, but that conferred by their own will and whose sublime virtues complement their overwhelming genius. He promised victory, and brought it. He flies like lightning, and strikes like thunder. The speed of his movements is matched only by their accuracy and prudence. He is everywhere. He sees everything. Like a comet cleaving the clouds, he appears at the same moment on the astonished banks of two separate rivers. Such shameless self-promotion, so far removed from the cold abstractions of the radical revolution, does not deserve simply the label propaganda. It marks the beginning of a cult of personality. If war was now to be seen as an extraordinary phenomenon, utterly at odds with the ordinary life of society, Napoleon was the extraordinary man of almost supernatural accomplishments who embodied it. The cult quickly spread. In Paris, another newspaper began publication under the modest title Journal of Bonaparte and Virtuous Men. Popular engravings proliferated, including one that showed Napoleon being crowned with laurel leaves like a classical conqueror. Theaters in 1796 to 97 put on no fewer than twelve separate plays and at least one opera devoted to his exploits. Several popular biographies appeared as well, which invented all manner of boyhood exploits for him, including the famous victory in the schoolyard snowball fights and a dramatic balloon flight over Paris at the age of fifteen. Poets who had hailed kings now turned their flattery on Napoleon. Hero, dear to peace, the arts, and victory. In two years he conquered a thousand years of glory. The leading French poets of the late 1790s are a forgettable bunch, but the leading French painters are not, and they too made Napoleon a favorite subject. Antoine Jean Gros, in particular, immortalized the moment when Napoleon supposedly led his men to glory at Arcola, seizing a flag and advancing over the bridge under Austrian fire. In fact, the attack did not succeed, and Napoleon's subordinate, General Augereau, who first led men onto the bridge, had the more truly heroic role. Yet little of this mattered to Gros, who painted a stunning, complex work Unlike popular engravings of the battle, which show Napoleon, or Augereau, holding tricolor Republican flags and supported by their men, in Gaulle's rendition, Napoleon is alone, and his non-tricolor flag dissolves into the somber background, the better to highlight his shining face and brilliant costume. He strides confidently forward, but looks back toward his men perfectly conveying the image of a superior leader. It has been argued that Gros consciously modeled Napoleon's pose after a famous Renaissance engraving of the winged figure of history, making the bridge of Arcola a symbolic bridge between past and future. It is difficult to say just how much of this tremendous media production was orchestrated by Napoleon himself. He certainly sponsored the newspapers. He also commissioned Gros's portrait, although legend has it that in his impatience he had trouble standing still for the painter, and that his wife had to sit and grasp his knees to keep him from striding off. But his popularity was genuine, not manufactured. <laughs>
How could it be otherwise for someone who could already claim, in 1797, to be the most successful general in French history, and who had just negotiated a triumphant peace settlement with Austria after five years of weary combat? Memoirs of the period all testify to the widespread adulation for Napoleon. And while the 1790s were blissfully free of opinion polling, there was a rough equivalent. Police spies who lurked in cafes and squares in order to assess the state of public opinion. In their reports, they repeatedly attested to the flood of praise the young general received. How did Napoleon craft an image for himself so much more successfully than any of his revolutionary predecessors did? Was it simply a matter of his successes? Or of his freakish genius? In fact, although Napoleon nurtured the cult of his heroism with unparalleled skill, the shape that the cult took, and its impact on European war and politics, also grew directly out of new understandings of the human self that were emerging in the late Enlightenment and Revolutionary period, particularly in the world of literature. To understand this point, we first have to recognize just how thoroughly the cult of Napoleon broke with earlier forms of celebrating great men. The elites of 18th century France had a gluttonous appetite for such celebrations, for they fervently believed that virtue was best stimulated by placing great examples of it continually before the people. The Académie Française began annual essay contests honoring designated Great Frenchmen in 1758, and the French crown commissioned expensive series of paintings and sculptures of great men, statesmen and soldiers, of course, but also, increasingly, artists and writers, including Bishop Fenelon. The revolution crowned the trend by transforming the vast, gloomy new Paris church of Sainte Geneviève into a pantheon of national heroes, a function it still holds today. Yet the 18th century eulogies and monuments were curiously one dimensional. They adopted as their principal measure of greatness a person's selfless dedication to the common good and tended to push everything else out of the focus. As a result, a long line of tediously self sacrificing patriots blended colorlessly into one another. The cult of Napoleon was different. It had a palpable, vivid quality. Although focusing on his great deeds, it delighted in his unique, even idiosyncratic qualities. It did not try to occlude the Corsican upbringing or the early struggles for attention. The portrait by Gros, while conforming to a model of classical heroism, nonetheless depicted a distinctive, original personality. In general, the cult owed less to the earlier celebration of great men than to the way literature was beginning to shape new perceptions of the individual human character. Napoleon's own literary tastes help reveal the nature of these perceptions. As we have learned, he had a genuine love for literature, which did not desert him even after he gave up hope of a literary career. He adored history, philosophy, and the tragedies of Corneille and Voltaire. Poetry mostly bored him, although, like many other Europeans of the day, he fell for the bombastic verse of the ancient Celtic bard Ossian, recently discovered and translated by James Macpherson, in fact, forged by him. On board ship to Egypt in 1798, Napoleon read out loud from Ossian and declared him superior to that rambler Homer. But the most important creative literary form for Napoleon was the novel. He did not himself say as much, yet, although he never tried his hand at poetry or drama, he wrote, or at least started, several short stories, and even a novel, Clisson and Eugenie, 
the sentimental story of a young officer in love. He read many of the most popular novels of the day, including Goethe's Young Werther and Rousseau's The New Eloise. Later in his career, he put together a traveling library that included, amid a flood of history books, 40 volumes of epic, 40 of theater, and 100 novels, including Goethe, Rousseau, and, surprisingly, Fenelon's pacifist Telemachus. As literary critics have explained, the rise of the novel in the 18th century brought readers a fundamentally new way of relating to literary characters, which Napoleon clearly shared. Although these creations might take part in extraordinary adventures and come across as extraordinary human types, the genre also seemed to provide unprecedented access to their innermost, unique selves, allowing for a new degree of psychological intimacy between character and reader. It is a commonplace of cultural history that 18th century readers could take characters for real people in a disturbingly literal manner. Fanatical readers of Rousseau sent letters to the characters, care of the author, drawing attentions to the stains of their tears on the paper. Stephen England has written, elegantly, that Napoleon chose to write his novel on the world, not on paper. I would go further and suggest that Napoleon saw himself, throughout his life, as something of a character in a novel. Novels gave him a way of understanding his own unique and extraordinary life story. In exile on St. Helena, he famously declared, What a novel my life has been! He also claimed that with a few more years in power, he would have made Paris the capital of the universe and all of France a true novel. His companion added, The emperor often repeated these last words. But there is more serious evidence from the period of the Italian campaign itself and nowhere more than in his relationship with women. Napoleon's love affairs certainly seem worthy of a novel. In 1794, in Marseille, he met and briefly fell in love with Désirée Clary, the pretty, charming daughter of a local merchant. She, like Napoleon himself, later became the subject of a good many real novels, because after marrying a different French general, the era's tornado of possibilities landed her, him probably, in Stockholm as Queen of Sweden. Her descendants sit on the Swedish throne to this day. Her relationship with Napoleon did not last long, but while it did, he gave her a new name, Eugenie, like the heroine of his novel. A few months later, Napoleon met a woman whose life seemed even more worthy of novelization. Rose Taché de la Pagerie came from a family of wealthy, noble plantation owners in the sugar islands of the French Caribbean. She married Alexandre de Beauharnais, a liberal noble who remained in the French army even after 1792. But, during the terror, they were both imprisoned as aristocrats, and Alexandre died under the guillotine. After Thermidor, Rose became the mistress of Napoleon's patron Paul Barat, and through him met Napoleon himself. He was instantly besotted with the beautiful, worldly Rose, caring nothing for the fact that Barat had effectively handed her down to him. In 1796, in the midst of his preparations to depart for Italy, they married. His letters to her are extraordinary documents. Once again, he gave his love a new name, Josephine. Did he name her after his older brother Joseph? The man to whom my heart entirely belongs. A question best left to a psychoanalytical biographer. And once again, he strained desperately for romantic eloquence. December 1795 Sweet and incomparable Josephine, what a strange effect you have on my heart. 
I draw from your lips, from your heart, a flame that burns me. I will see you in three hours. In the meantime, mio dolce amor. Here are a thousand kisses, but give me none, for they burn my blood. Or March 31st, 1796. Josephine, Josephine, remember what I have sometimes told you? Nature gave me a strong and determined soul. It built you out of lace and gauze. At times, his thoughts turned positively purple. A kiss lower, lower than the heart. Even your little white breast, springy, so firm, in the little black forest. I send it a thousand kisses. Josephine herself, however, could not respond with anything like this ardor, and clearly felt rather oppressed by it. Indeed, once Napoleon left for Italy, she took a young officer, Hippolyte Charles, as a lover. Pressed by her husband to come to Italy, she pleaded illness and false pregnancy, and stopped writing. He responded with letters worthy of the most overblown romantic melodramas. June 8th, 1796. Cruel one! How could you make me hope for a feeling that you didn't have? Farewell, Josephine. Stay in Paris. Do not write me again. A thousand daggers tear at my heart. Do not stick them in any farther. October 17th. 1796. Your letters are cold like middle age. They resemble fifteen years of marriage. Fie, Josephine, it is so mean, so bad, so treasonous of you. November 23rd, 1796. I no longer love you at all. To the contrary, I hate you. You are fiendish, awkward, stupid, and decrepit. What do you do with yourself all day, madame? What is so important that you have no time to write? Who could this marvelous new lover be who takes up all your time? Beware, Josephine. One fine night the doors will be smashed in, and there I will be in your bed. Remember, Othello's little dagger. But are these writings pure effusions of emotion? A window into the depths of Napoleon's heart? If we analyze them closely, it becomes clear that Napoleon didn't mean for Josephine to take them entirely seriously. In truth, I'm worried, my dear friend, he continued, immediately after his outlandish threat of murder. I haven't had any news from you. Write me quickly. I hope I'll be holding you in my arms soon. In other words, the outburst was at least in part an act. Napoleon was consciously taking on a role and expressing his emotions in the way that he had learned, at least in part, from novels. It is not so strange. We all follow models, literary or otherwise, consciously or unconsciously, when we release our feelings. But Napoleon seems to have taken this banal cultural habit to something of an extreme. In this move from the battlefield of Arcola to the intimacy of Josephine's boudoir, we may seem to have strayed rather far from the theme of total war. But, in fact, love and war are hardly so far removed from each other. If you doubt it, read Stendhal and Napoleon's sense of himself as a character in a novel, which comes out so forcefully in his letters to Josephine, was in no sense incidental to his military and political careers. His novelistic sensibility, his ability to make a spectacle of his inmost original self, goes a long way toward explaining how he could forge the sort of bond that he did with his soldiers, and later with much of the French people. It explains their sense that they knew him, the little corporal, personally, that they could care for him. This sort of public self-presentation, it is worth stressing, was something quite new in French history. <laughs>
France's kings never allowed this degree of intimacy and familiarity with their subjects. As for the leaders of the revolution, their literary references were, for the most part, to the great moralizing works of classical antiquity. Robespierre and Saint-Just never let themselves be seen as figures with whom the ordinary French person might feel comfortable, let alone intimate. They were men of grand, windy abstraction. Mirabeau, perhaps, came closer to Napoleon, but died too soon. Marat also had something of Napoleon's inclinations, except that the intimate persona he chose to offer to his readers, that of a raving, fanatical psychopath, attracted only a limited set of admirers. Danton had great popular skill, but rarely committed his words to writing, and the sort of relationship that Napoleon enjoyed with his public was one that could be forged only through the medium of print. Indeed, without the explosion of the periodical press during the French Revolution, Napoleon's success would have been unimaginable. Napoleon, in short, was the first true, great populist of the revolutionary era the first who could speak to his audiences in familiar, personal terms, and be accepted as a man of the people, even while presenting himself as an extraordinary genius. It is this quality, grounded in his literary sensibility, that explains the richness and depth of the cult that he helped develop around himself from the start of the Italian campaign. And, when coupled with his extraordinary successes, it is this quality that explains how he forged such an intense bond with his soldiers, and indeed with the French as a whole. In forging this bond, Napoleon could, on occasion, pose as a character surprisingly close to the Enlightenment tradition of hostility to warfare. Napoleon, the peacemaker of this vast universe, as one pamphlet called him. In Italy, he put up a monument whose inscription called for the breaking of swords and the slaying of death itself. During the campaign, he displayed an ostentatious concern for Italian arts and letters, declaring that all distinguished artists and scholars should have French citizenship, whatever their birth. His troops, meanwhile, were making Italian artworks French in a rather more literal manner, stripping the country of them wholesale and shipping them off to the Louvre. After his return from Italy in 1797, he ostentatiously joined the new scholarly National Institute and showed up regularly for its sessions, wearing civilian dress. But Napoleon was never going to adopt Telemachus as a role model. To the extent that he saw himself as a literary character, his story was first and foremost one of military glory. As he himself recounted it, its key moment was the Battle of Lodi, on May 10, 1796, when he personally directed operations, forcing his way across the Adda River, and spectacularly defeating an Austrian army that was already in retreat. Years later, in exile, he told the members of his little entourage that it was only on the evening of Lodi that I believed myself to be a superior man, and that the ambition came to me of executing the great things which so far had been occupying my thoughts only as a fantastic dream. In his own reckoning, then, his innermost self was defined by war. War was its ultimate test what marked him as a unique personality. And indeed, as the cult of Napoleon grew, a re-glorification of war took place in France, centered on the notion that war might prove a regenerative, redemptive experience for individuals, as well as societies. The Enlightenment creed of peace now came in for more direct criticism than at any time in the revolutionary period. Fittingly, it was in Napoleon's newspaper, the Courier of the Army of Italy, that a journalist wrote what amounted to its obituary.
and an explicit renunciation of the National Assembly's 1790 Declaration of Peace. If we only consulted our feelings, we would wish ardently for fate to put an end to this deluge of blood. But if we turn our glance to the future, we will see the sad necessity of new battles. The National Assembly declared that France renounced all conquests. This idea might seem sublime at first, but it was driven by false philanthropy rather than by an enlightened love of humanity. A conquering republic is the benefactor of the nations that it conquers. And you, young hero, who have already shown yourself the equal of the greatest men of all time, and who may yet surpass them all, you can yet bring together the double glory of conqueror and of benefactor of the nations. Note the last sentence. Despite the author's care to defend war in the name of a higher revolutionary good, he nonetheless makes the title of conqueror a source of glory in its own right. And as Napoleon's career progressed, the glory of conquest would shine forth ever more powerfully from behind the thin gauze of ideological justification, until the latter was barely visible at all. Consider, for instance, the hero's next great adventure. On July 1, 1798, a French armada appeared off the sun-bleached, palm-studded coast of Egypt, bearing an army of 25,000 men under Napoleon's command. That night, in a difficult operation, some 4,300 of them disembarked and drew up at dawn in front of the gates of the ancient city of Alexandria. Its governors refused the French demand to surrender, and so at midday, the invaders brought up ladders, scaled the walls, and attacked. Soon, Alexandria was in French hands. A week later, the army began a 120-mile advance on Cairo. Napoleon made the usual grueling demands on his men, forcing them to march every day, even in the mid-afternoon, in the savage midsummer heat of North Africa. A staff officer wrote to his parents that many soldiers, dressed in heavy cloth and bent double under their heavy packs, could not take the strain. We saw them die of thirst, of starvation, of heat. Others, seeing how their comrades were suffering, blew their brains out. Others threw themselves into the Nile with their guns and their packs and drowned. The army had no bread and made the march on a menu of pumpkins, melons, scrawny chickens, and the occasional withered vegetable. But Napoleon himself shared these discomforts, and sometimes himself went a whole day without food. The army remained intact. On July 21st, in sight of the pyramids, the French confronted the forces of the Mamelukes, the warrior caste that ruled Egypt under the distant aegis of the Turkish sultan. Napoleon later claimed to have told his men, Soldiers, forty centuries look down upon you. Six thousand Mameluke horsemen, supported by twelve thousand foot soldiers, gallantly charged the French positions. But they had no hope of prevailing against Napoleon's well-drilled army, which fired salvos from impregnable infantry squares and wrought havoc with its powerful, mobile artillery. The battle was more of a massacre, and on July 24th, the French made a triumphal entrance into the capital. Over the next several months, Napoleon made efforts to transform Egypt into a model French colony, a supposed example of enlightened civilization at the heart of the Middle East. He set up a new government, grounded in a system of native councils, although he routinely overruled them. He ordered up a new system of courts, a postal service, a mint, hospitals, and a national guard. He began a process of land reform. He set up printing presses and published a weekly newspaper. Whatever his lingering admiration for Robespierre, he had obviously forgotten the man's warning that no one likes armed missionaries. Just as significantly, 
Napoleon established an Institute of Egypt, staffed with 160 eminent French scholars, artists, and engineers. It met twice a week and discussed everything from the wings of Egyptian ostriches to the composition of the slime of the Nile to the discovery of Egyptian antiquities. In this last area, it did heroic work, including, famously, the discovery of the Rosetta Stone, which allowed for the deciphering of Egyptian hieroglyphics. Unlike earlier European invaders, the French had not come for the greater glory of the Christian God and hoped that a lack of religious conflict would smooth their conquest. Napoleon loudly declared his respect for Islam and hinted, amazingly, at even more. We Frenchmen, he wrote to the Pasha of Aleppo, are no longer the infidels who came to fight against your faith. We realize how sublime it is. We profess it ourselves. And the moment has come for all Frenchmen to become believers like yourselves. He took to reading the Koran and engaged in discussions with Muslim clerics. A piece of Arabic verse published in his newspaper praised him as God's instrument, in terms that would have made even his European panegyrists blush. Kings bow their proud heads before the invincible Bonaparte, the lion of battles. The heavens of glory bow down before him. But all the reforms and religious flirtation did nothing to prevent an insurrection against his forces in Cairo in October, which they brutally suppressed. Nor did Napoleon stay in Egypt long enough to bring his ambitious plans to fruition. At the beginning of August 1798, a British fleet under Admiral Nelson decimated the French in Aboukir Bay, cutting Napoleon off from home and making his long-term Egyptian prospects improbable at best. The next February, fearing an attack by the Ottoman Turks, he marched 10,000 troops east from Egypt, across Sinai, and up what is now the coast of Israel. His troops again bore most of the burden, putting up with brackish water and dogs and camels to eat. Nonetheless, on March 7th, they took Jaffa, near the site of present-day Tel Aviv, and continued up the coast toward the Turkish fortress of Acre. But close to 3,000 of his men fell ill with the plague, and marines from a British frigate captured much of the French artillery. Despite several frantic attacks, led by Napoleon in person, Acre, surrounded on three sides by the sea and resupplied by the British, did not fall. The French did manage to secure Egypt temporarily. In April, Napoleon met up with a second French army under Kleber and routed a Turkish force at Mount Tabor. Returning to Egypt, he then crushed an attempted Ottoman landing at Aboukir. But as long as the British controlled the Mediterranean, he could not hope for sufficient reinforcements to keep the colonies strong enough to survive. Worse, the letters making it through the British blockade were bringing desperate news from Western Europe, where, in part as a result of the Egyptian campaign, a second armed coalition had formed against France. The Turks had declared war, and so had Tsar Paul I of Russia, aghast at France's ambitions in the East. Austrian and Russian forces, under the flamboyant General Suvorov, were sweeping back into Italy, helping to set off huge anti-French insurrections and reducing France's puppet Italian republics to flotsam on the stream of war. French forces were falling back in the north as well, while in France itself, the ashes of the Vendée were reigniting. The rebels even briefly seized Nantes and Le Mans. Parts of the new Belgian territories rose up as well, in a two-month-long insurrection. Total French forces had fallen to perhaps fewer than 200,000 men, a small fraction of their size in 1794 and they could not initially hold back the flood. For a brief moment, the dark summer of 1799, in fact, looked very much like the dark summer of 1793 
which had brought forth both the levee en masse and the terror, and a repetition of both now seemed possible. To remedy the manpower shortage, the Directory implemented the Jourdain Law, passed the previous year, which established a regular system of conscription. Unlike the one-time measure of the levee, it made the draft a permanent feature of French life. In July 1799, a law of hostages held relatives of émigrés liable for the émigrés' actions. A forced loan from the population followed, amid calls for a formal declaration of la patrie en danger, which would allow for yet more repressive measures. Events, in short, were again moving with hurricane speed, and it was time for Napoleon to return home. Incidentally, he had also received reports of Josephine's infidelity and ached to confront her. The conclusion of the Egyptian expedition did its architect no credit. At the end of August 1799, Napoleon and nearly all his top commanders embarked on two fast frigates. They slipped through the British dragnet and reached France in early October. Napoleon left his successor, Kleber, to contend with increasing unrest and renewed Turkish attacks, with little chance of resupply. In 1800, a Muslim zealot would murder Kleber in Cairo, and a year later, his successor, Menu, the same man we met as a liberal aristocratic deputy to the 1790 National Assembly, would finally surrender to the Turks and British bringing the brief-lived French colony to a predictable, inglorious end. Historians often present the fall of French Egypt as a tragic end to an otherwise glorious adventure. But this episode, which cost tens of thousands of French lives and many more Muslim ones, was problematic, verging on absurd, from the start. Historians have given too much credence to the claim that it constituted a serious strategic thrust against Britain. They have speculated too energetically on Egypt's possible role as a French colony. They have lavished attention on the work of the Egyptian Institute. In fact, there were few rational reasons for the invasion. Egypt could, just possibly, have served as a base against British India but at a time when most British traffic to India took the long route around Africa. The Suez Canal lay a century in the future. Its strategic value remained relatively small, especially given Britain's clear maritime superiority. As French travelers in the region had long reported, the country had only very limited economic potential as a colony and the work of the Institute, ambitious and interesting as it was, by itself could hardly justify such a massive expenditure of lives and resources. There is some truth to the notion that Napoleon went to Egypt in part because it suited nearly everyone for him to be out of France. After the 1797 peace with Austria, he had first contemplated an invasion of England, then given it up as impractical. He had far-reaching political ambitions, but as yet no realistic hope of achieving them. Remaining in France, though, and taking sides in its increasingly tawdry politics, would only tarnish his image. Better to win new laurels elsewhere. As for the five directors at the head of the government, they too welcomed the chance to be rid of an uncomfortably ambitious and popular general. But the invasion of Egypt was also about something even less substantial than political convenience. Glory. By early 1798, Napoleon's vision of himself as a superior man had been confirmed to him time and again by events and by the echo chamber of his own propaganda machine. To judge by the comments he made at the time, he truly believed that he might be another Alexander. Where better to prove the point than in Alexander's own domain, the East? Like most educated Europeans of the day, his youthful literary diet had included, amid the novels and history, a good dose of 
Oriental Exotica. These works provided little reliable information about the chain of civilizations that stretched from North Africa to East Asia, instead depicting the East as a mysterious realm of extremes, of luxury, debauch, and despotism, but also heroic deeds. It was a place where the daring, superior self might express itself more fully than amid the restraints of civilized Europe. It was undoubtedly this alluring fantasy that inspired Napoleon when he told his friend and secretary, Bourrienne, Everything wears out here. My glory has already disappeared. This little Europe does not supply enough of it for me. I must seek it in the East, the fountain of glory. Even after his less than glorious return, he could not abandon these delusions. In a letter he wrote to Madame de Remusat in the early 1800s, it was already as if the real expedition had never taken place. In Egypt, I found myself freed from the obstacles of an irksome civilization. I was full of dreams. I saw myself founding a religion, marching into Asia, riding an elephant, a turban on my head, and in my hand a new Koran that I would have composed to suit my need. In my undertaking, I would have combined the experience of the two worlds, exploiting for my own profit the theater of all history. The time I spent in Egypt was the most beautiful of my life, because it was most ideal. An absurd fantasy, of course, but beguiling especially to himself. As during the revolution, fantasy drove military policy to a degree that modern observers might barely think possible, were it not, that is, for the most recent Western invasion of a large Middle Eastern country under equally implausible pretexts. Absent from Napoleon's later reveries was any consideration of the actual tactics he had used to conquer and then keep order in Egypt. But far from representing any return to the chivalric warfare of times past, the Egyptian campaign fits squarely into the pattern of revolutionary total warfare. No prince of the old regime would have attempted to impose an entirely new political and social order on a conquered state, the way Napoleon imposed his reforms on Egypt. And few princes of the old regime would have treated the Egyptian population as he did. Consider the revolt of Cairo. In late October 1798, insurgents shook the French hold on the city and killed several high-ranking French officers, including Napoleon's own aide-de-camp. In response, the French did not hesitate to use the tactics they had perfected in the Vendée, sacking the neighborhood of Al-Azhar and killing as many as 3,000 Egyptians. When the principal group of rebels took refuge in Cairo's Grand Mosque and asked for quarter, Bonaparte allegedly replied, The hour of vengeance has sounded. You began, and I will finish. Napoleon's official correspondence preserves the chilling order that he then issued to his chief of staff. Citizen General gives the order to the commander in the square to cut the throats of all prisoners who were taken bearing arms. They will be brought tonight to the banks of the Nile and their headless corpses thrown in the river. Nor was this the worst atrocity committed. When the French took Jaffa in March 1799, 4,000 Ottoman troops surrendered to them. Napoleon ordered all but the officers taken to the beach, lined up, and shot, allegedly over the protests of his own senior staff. Bourrienne later constructed an elaborate justification for this action, insisting that the French had no food or drink to give to the prisoners. It is a spurious argument. If Napoleon cared only about provisions, why would he bother insisting, in his written orders, that precautions be taken to prevent any of the prisoners from escaping. Whatever his logistical situation, 
Napoleon may well also have been trying to impress the allegedly ruthless Turkish governor of Syria. It was the sort of obscenely grand gesture that Alexander might have made. And it was not the sort of gesture that Napoleon reserved exclusively for the East. For although not immune from the prevailing racism of the day, he was very much an equal opportunity killer. From the very start of his significant military exploits in 1796, he had imposed unprecedented demands on occupied civilian populations. When these populations resisted, he responded with unrestrained violence. Consider, for instance, what had happened in northern Italy in May 1796. Napoleon's forces had just entered Milan, and the area remained unsettled. Rumors spread of French defeats, and in several areas, thousands of peasants assembled, armed with farm implements, pikes, and fowling pieces, to chase out the occupiers. The city of Pavia rose up as well, trapping its small French garrison. Napoleon quickly sent out mobile columns against the insurgent forces. One of them intercepted a thousand peasants near the small town of Benasco, killed a hundred, and put the rest to flight. Benasco itself had not taken part in the insurrection, but Napoleon, desperate to prevent the troubles from spreading, ordered it put to the torch. A vast conspiracy was being hatched against us, he wrote to his chief of staff by way of justification. In an official proclamation, he bluntly announced that those who did not demonstrate their loyalty will be treated as rebels, their villages will be burned. May the terrible example of Binasco open their eyes. Napoleon then stormed Pavia and held off ordering the city's total destruction only when the besieged French garrison appeared, safe and sound. Instead, he contented himself with letting his soldiers run wild for twenty-four hours, raping and looting. He also arrested several hundred leading citizens from the region and sent them back to France as hostages. Such scenes repeated themselves throughout the years of the Directory. After Napoleon's forces turned south in the summer of 1796, it was the turn of Lugo in the Papal States to suffer the fate of Benasco. When the French moved into Switzerland in 1798, several Catholic cantons resisted, leading French observers to dub them the Swiss Vendée and to respond with tactics worthy of Thoreau. In and around the Swiss town of Stons, some six hundred houses were burned, and twelve hundred men, women, and children died. Further scenes reminiscent of the Vendée occurred throughout Italy during the massive revolts of 1799, especially in the south, where French general Championnet had attempted to transform the kingdom of Naples into the Parthenopian Republic. Some of the worst atrocities, though, occurred outside of Europe, in what had once been the crown jewel of France's sugar colonies, Saint-Domingue, today known as Haiti. In 1790, 50,000 white colonists had ruled with unspeakable cruelty over a largely African-born slave population ten times larger. The French Revolution, however, destabilized this fragile situation and triggered the largest slave rebellion in human history. In 1801, after a decade of terrible but ultimately inconclusive fighting, an expedition arrived to restore French rule, led by Napoleon's brother-in-law, Charles-Victor Emmanuel Leclerc. Initially, it met with some success, and Leclerc even managed to deport to France the charismatic Haitian general Toussaint Louverture. But when he tried to disarm thousands of former slaves, he provoked an insurrection and replied to it with exterminationist tactics. Here is my opinion on this country, he wrote to Napoleon in the fall of 1802. We must destroy all Negroes of the mountains, men and women, keeping only the children younger than twelve. 
destroy half of those in the plains, and not leave alive in the colony a single man of color who has worn epaulettes. Without this, the colony will never be peaceful. Words worthy of General Duro in the Vendée. Before virulent yellow fever doomed the French force, killing Leclerc in the process, its leaders did their best to live up to this sanguinary promise. They summarily executed captured rebels, engaged in bouts of indiscriminate slaughter, and even imported man-eating dogs from Cuba. Although Haiti's death toll is even harder to calculate than that of the Vendée, it is certain that many tens of thousands died from all causes, inconceivably as much as a third of the pre-war population. We will look more closely at the story of French occupations in Chapter 8, but one basic point is worth making here. The horrors experienced in occupied territories were not simply the result of poor or criminal French leadership. They arose out of the transformed nature of war itself, following the breakdown of old regime restraints and the experience of the Revolution. Where the French army arrived as an occupier, Bloody insurrections often followed, answered by brutal counterinsurgency. Every territory the French occupied had the potential to become a Vendée. Why? Start with the fact, most often cited by historians, that unlike the armies of the old regime, the French forces tried as much as possible to live off the land, to have war feed war. In most areas where they took control, they imposed large taxes and fines on the native population. They confiscated artistic treasures and religious properties on a large scale. Napoleon did attempt to repress pillage and theft by individual soldiers, but his men nonetheless saw the campaigns as a literal chance to make their fortunes. Napoleon probably did not promise Italian honor, glory, and riches to his naked and hungry men, to quote words he later claimed to have uttered, but they acted as if he had done so. But the coming of the French meant more than financial burdens. In European countries, it also meant the end of the old regime. Unlike occupations carried out in earlier 18th century wars, which tended to leave traditional institutions in place, at least until a final peace settlement, the revolutionary forces repeated in the conquered territories what they had already carried out at home. They swept away or modified complex ancient systems of taxation, administration, and justice. They cut back or abolished social privileges. As in France itself, the changes touched the lives of virtually the whole population, threatening established livelihoods and everywhere generating tremendous anxiety even where particular groups stood to gain from the occupation. Seeing a hated tax lifted, a law court moved closer to home, or coveted land suddenly offered for sale. The sheer uncertainty made it easy for insurgents to gain support. In the areas annexed by France, attempts to introduce conscription in 1798-99 to had much the same effect that it had had in the Vendée in 1793. The demands of total war sparked bloody revolt. As in France itself, religion provided some of the driest, most combustible tinder, and the French sprayed showers of sparks onto it. By 1796, most French officers and men had spent at least three years in an effectively godless army, from which chaplains and religious services had vanished even if the Republic itself no longer considered Christianity an enemy. So the armies and the occupied populations gazed on each other like strange alien species, even before the French started to ransack local churches and confiscate local lands. In Lugo, the insurrection began when local authorities, acting for the French, tried to confiscate a statue of St. Dilaro, the town's patron saint, a crowd led by priests and friars forcefully repossessed it, brought it back to its church amid the pealing of bells, 
and then went on to assault the town citadel in the name of our holy religion. Napoleon's vigorously anti-clerical deputy, Augereau, who had served in the Vendée, showed no desire to negotiate with the people, he called, these miserable reptiles. Instead, he stormed Lugo, killing hundreds. Just as in France itself, the war quickly took on the character of a civil war. Wherever the French took power in Europe, significant numbers of people, especially in the cities, welcomed them in the name of revolutionary values. Dutch patriots, German Jacobiner, Italian Jacobini. These men staffed the governments of the new satellite republics and carried out, gladly at least to begin with, French-inspired reforms they themselves had often dreamed of for years. Heavily urban and cosmopolitan, they saw the rural and lower-class insurgents much as the French did, as ignorant, superstitious obstacles to the forces of historical progress. As a result, the occupation became the occasion for any number of settling of old scores between city and countryside, between regions, between competing institutions. The greatest potential for bloodshed did not occur where French authority was most oppressive, but where it appeared most fragile. In 1799, with the Second Coalition driving French armies back throughout Europe, hopeful revolts spread across the continent like streams of flaming gasoline. In the southern Italian province of Calabria, Cardinal Fabrizio Ruffo proclaimed a crusade against the French and raised a popular army that carried out horrible atrocities against captured French soldiers, Jacobini, and Jews whom the rebels all too easily associated with the French. Similarly, in Tuscany, 13 Jews were burned alive and 400 suspected Jacobini massacred. Where the French still could, they responded brutally, in keeping with their own dynamic of total war. The spread of insurrections would suggest that the distinction between military and civilian populations remained blurry in 1794-99. On the irregular battlefields of French-occupied territories, it certainly did. As in the Vendée, entire populations were treated as combatants. But in France itself, the same period saw something of the opposite phenomenon a growing cleavage between military and civilian spheres. The political consequences would be immense. As we have learned, European states in the 18th century had already shown some tendencies to segregate their military forces from the rest of society, above all by building permanent camps and barracks for soldiers and by trying to remake officer corps into full-time professional bodies. But in France, these reforms did not go far enough to change the military's essentially aristocratic character. And at the start of the revolution, it was precisely this aristocratic character that made the army an object of such enormous, almost paranoid, suspicion to radicals. As a result, not only did the Jacobins bloodily purge aristocrats from the officer corps, but also, through the levée en masse, they sought to erase the distinction between army and nation entirely. What is the army? A deputy asked. It is France as a whole. All French citizens are the army. Most radicals still believed in the coming end of the age of war and did not want to see France transformed into a permanently warring Sparta. But until the final peace, everyone would fight. After 1794, however, new and far deeper cracks opened up between the military and civilian society. The soldiers recruited in the first two years of the war remained in the field, largely outside of France and isolated from civilian society. Naturally, they began to identify principally with the army itself and with generals like Napoleon, who so ostentatiously looked out for their welfare. The revolutionary indoctrination through speeches, songs, and newspapers, to which the Jacobins had subjected the rank and file, 
did not long survive the end of the terror and its radical enthusiasms. Now, the generals encouraged soldiers to take pride in victory for its own sake and for its extension of French power. Soldiers, Napoleon typically proclaimed, do once more what we have done so often, and Europe will not challenge us for the title of the bravest and most powerful nation in the world. The generals forced the weakened central government to do away with the political commissioners who had accompanied the armies under the terror. Increasingly, like Napoleon in Italy, they behaved like princes. Most significantly for the future, they also drew a severely unfavorable contrast between the patriotism that allegedly prevailed in the armies and the corruption and partisan bickering back home. Napoleon, with his unmatched talent for spectacle, knew precisely how to impress on his soldiers this sense of their own moral superiority. On July 14, 1797, Bastille Day, he staged a military parade in Milan in which soldiers marched past a monument bearing the names of the dead of the campaign. You see before you, he told them, the names of our companions in arms who died on the field of honor. Then, shifting gears, he turned to a darker theme, the misfortunes which threaten the patrie, a clear reference to the deteriorating political situation back home. As the parade continued, a well-prompted corporal stepped out of the ranks and shouted to him, General, you have saved France. Your children, who glory in belonging to this invincible army, will shield you with their own bodies. Now, save the Republic. Back in France itself, the remnants of the Jacobins unwittingly helped to widen the cracks while also accelerating the regime's disintegration. In the elections of 1797, when the resurgent right wing triumphed, the left looked to the army for rescue. One left-wing paper put the matter as bluntly as possible. The great deluge was necessary to purge the earth. We now need the armies to purify France. A left-wing director similarly declared, in a speech, that the Republic exists almost nowhere but in the armies. Napoleon cast his lot with the conspirators and committed his already huge prestige to their cause. Thus the spectacle on July 14th, in which he prepared the army and declared that the Republic had nothing to fear from the Royalists. He then dispatched one of his subordinates to Paris, along with troops. With their help, the assemblies and the directory were purged on September 4th, the 18th Fructidor, under the new calendar. The left had prevailed, but at the huge cost of legitimizing military interference in domestic politics and making the army, in the words of historian Jean-Paul Berthaud, a counterpower. As for Napoleon, the episode only confirmed him in the superiority he had felt toward politicians since the start of the Italian campaign. His secretary later remembered him saying, I ought to overthrow them and make myself king. He dismissed the directors as a pack of lawyers. A diplomat similarly quoted him calling the Republic a fancy that will pass away. The nation must have a chief. But Napoleon added, according to both men, The time is not yet come. It is difficult not to agree with the royalist newspaper that quipped, even before the 18th Fructidor, that Napoleon fought like Alexander, but was a citizen in the manner of Julius Caesar. After the coup, another paper asked, Is the Rubicon already crossed? Will we avoid a military republic? Napoleonic France would never be a true military dictatorship, but the coup of Fructidor nevertheless marked a key stage in the appearance of modern militarism. A separation had taken place between civilian and military, and the leaders of the latter had come to the conclusion that they, more than any politicians, most truly represented the nation.
Therefore, they had the right to impose their own military values of order, discipline, and unquestioned patriotism on civilians. By 1799, some figures in the army were saying so explicitly. When a people becomes conquering, wrote an army captain that year, it is indispensable that the military spirit dominate over the other orders. According to General Picol de Deride, our rarely interrupted wars prove to the French that they should be an entirely military people. Such ideas had been almost literally unthinkable under the old regime, when the aristocratically led armed forces were considered an integral part of the social fabric rather than a distinct society of its own. A military coup had been impossible, because at the heart of the aristocratic military code lay the principle of absolute loyalty to the king. But now the code and the king were gone, and the most popular general of the age was waiting for his opportunity. It came two years later. While Napoleon drank from his Egyptian fountain of glory, the directory continued to decompose, and the unscrupulous Sieyes, the early revolutionary hero turned cynical executive, began his search for a sword. The military situation had turned dire as well, as the Republic's forces fell back and insurrections ignited across Europe. The need for a savior had never been greater. By the time Napoleon landed back in France, in early October, the military situation at least had improved. His former deputy from Italy, André Massena, had defeated the Russians in a climactic battle near Zurich, and Russian General Suvorov had been pushed into the Alps, where cold and famine decimated his army. General Brun defeated the Anglo-Russian forces in the Netherlands, and on October 22nd, the unstable Tsar Paul frustrated with the defeats and unhappy with his Austrian allies, withdrew from the coalition. Sillez, however, remained adamant in his search for a general. A cold, precise man, who had once advocated the interbreeding of monkeys and humans to provide a new species of born slaves, he had long lost the political enthusiasm of the early revolution. When asked what he had done under the terror, he replied laconically, I survived. Now, he wanted simply to restore order and perhaps enrich himself in the process. Napoleon was not his first choice for the role of man on horseback. Sieyes would have preferred a puppet who would not tower over all other political figures. However, his first choice, General Barthélemy Catherine Joubert, died at the Battle of Novi in August. Sieyes then approached General Jean-Victor Moreau, and the two were reportedly together when they heard the news of Napoleon's return. There is your man, Moreau supposedly remarked to Sieyes. News of Napoleon's failures in Egypt had not yet caught up with him. Instead, the expedition had only inflated his legend further precisely as he had hoped. In workers' districts in Paris, police spies reported that he was now being hailed as the exiled hero and as our father, our savior, in popular songs. When he came to Lyon in October, people danced in the streets, and less than a day after his arrival, a play entitled The Return of the Hero or Bonaparte at Lyon was staged there. When the news of his return was announced in Paris theaters, crowds rose to their feet and cheered. On every face, in every conversation, was written the hope of salvation and the presentiment of happiness. Napoleon, to these ordinary men and women, represented security, stability, and glory. Once in Paris, Napoleon met with C.A.S., and a plot was quickly hatched. He also reconciled, stormily, with Josephine. The regime of the directory was to be dissolved and replaced by three interim consuls, Napoleon, 
Cies, and Cies's colleague, Roger Ducol, a non-entity. On November 9, 1799, the 18th of Promare, the upper chamber of the Parliament, meeting in the absence of left-wing deputies, duly declared that with France under threat, both chambers would adjourn the next day to the suburban town of St. Cloud. Napoleon, before his troops, let loose a stream of abuse against the government. What have you done with the France? I left you so brilliant. I left you peace. I find war. I left you conquests. I find the enemy at our borders. True, the renewed war was as much his fault as anyone else's, and the enemy had already been driven back, which was more than he had accomplished at the other end of the Mediterranean. But, as always with Napoleon, the legend had a force quite independent of the truth. The next day, the Parliament, under the protection of Napoleon's soldiers at St. Cloud, met for its appointment to commit institutional suicide. But the event almost failed to transpire, for in the lower chamber, whose members dressed in faintly ludicrous simulacra of Roman togas, a large number of deputies balked. What dangers, they demanded to know, amid much grandiloquent swearing of oaths, were so pressing as to demand their dissolution. When Napoleon appeared before them, he was unprepared for the challenges and stammered out vague threats. Don't forget, I walk with the god of war and the god of victory. Loud protests greeted him, and he fled the meeting hall. One deputy even pulled out a dagger. Had a strong figure emerged in the chamber? It is quite possible that the Parliament might have declared Napoleon an outlaw then and there, and sent him to the guillotine. But once again, as at Madalena, Toulon, and Arcola, Napoleon survived, and the history books therefore do not remember him as a glorious Republican general who died in the midst of a squalid failed coup. No Mirabeau emerged to rally the deputies. Outside, Lucien Bonaparte encouraged the soldiers by waving a dagger and threatening to plunge it into Napoleon's breast if he ever became a tyrant. The soldiers then marched inside, dispersed most of the deputies, and gathered a small rump, 100 out of 750 who obediently voted to dissolve the regime and appoint the three consuls to replace it. This recourse to force, Citizens, you are dissolved, General Murat told the deputies, altered the nature of the coup, stamping it with a far more explicitly military character than Cies had planned for. And of the three consuls, as Cies would quickly discover, only one counted a soldier had come to power. To be sure, Napoleon had support that ranged far beyond the ranks of the military, and the 18th Brumaire, as it became known, did not amount to the simple triumph of the army over the civilian population. Napoleon appealed to a broad swath of the French, wealthy property owners first and foremost, who longed for social and political stability after so many years of turmoil. He generated enthusiasm among influential intellectuals. He soothed his more hesitant supporters with promises that his rise to power would not mean the installation of a military regime. However, the bond Napoleon had forged with the French was a bond born out of, and dependent on, military glory. Bromère happened in the midst of a full-scale, revolutionary war, with much of France already under military rule. Napoleon's ascent might point to the return of internal strength, but it also promised war without end. In practice, the two were inseparable. Chapter 7 Days of Glory Today, no government would dare say to its nation, let us go conquer the world. Benjamin Constant, 1813 I wanted to rule the world, 
Who wouldn't have in my place? Napoleon Bonaparte to Benjamin Constant, 1815. Marengo, Northern Italy, June 14, 1800. 5 p.m. The day is turning into a disaster. On the flat, muddy plain of Bormida, 45 miles north of Genoa, a well-drilled Austrian army is slowly and methodically pushing Napoleon Bonaparte toward defeat. As France's first consul, he is wearing, under his gray topcoat, a sumptuous dark blue uniform, trimmed with gold leaf, and is carrying a heavy ceremonial sword with a hilt elegantly sculpted into twin lion's heads. But the splendor cannot distract him from the fact that he has made a dreadful mistake. Thinking that a confrontation with the Austrian army of General Michael Melas was days off, he has spread his army thinly across the plain and dispatched his best subordinate, Louis de Say, southward with 6,000 men to block Melas's escape route. Even after the Austrians came across the Bormida River in force in the morning, it took Napoleon more than an hour to realize that the attack was not a mere feint. Now, he is feeling the lack of men with desperate intensity. A note he has scribbled to Desay reads, For God's sake, come up if you still can! His soldiers are exhausted and dangerously demoralized. In the French 96th Demi Brigade, the grenadiers can barely see each other in the smoke. Despite rain the day before, the artillery has set the wheat fields on fire and cartridge boxes left on the ground are exploding, sending shockwaves of panic through the ranks. No reinforcements have come in hours, and so the ammunition is running out. Worse, the French musket barrels are so hot from repeated firing that they can't be loaded without the risk of exploding in their owners' faces. In desperation, the soldiers are using a classic remedy, opening their trousers and urinating into the guns to cool them. But one powerful Austrian cavalry charge may be all that is needed at this point to break the French lines and turn a measured retreat into a rout. And what then? Possibly Napoleon can regroup and beat Melas elsewhere. But at this moment, here at Marengo, with Melas already accepting a round of applause from his staff officers, things look distinctly unpromising. Just ten days ago, the last French satellite state in Italy, the Ligurian Republic of Genoa, fell to the Austrians. All Napoleon's earlier gains in the country have been wiped out. If he is decisively beaten at Marengo, he will look dangerously like yesterday's man. Other generals are waiting for news and gently casting exploratory lures into the cloudy and treacherous waters of Parisian politics. Will Napoleon survive any better in these waters than Louis XVI or Robespierre? But now, with the late spring sun still high, comes the first hint of deliverance. Desay is back. Indeed, he had turned his troops around even before receiving Napoleon's note, correctly judging from the distant sound of guns that a major battle had begun. Desay clearly enjoys the attention as he gallops in to consult. At thirty-two, he is something of a dandy, with sharp, delicate features and luxuriant dark hair, worn long and loose over the shoulders. The battle is completely lost he supposedly remarks, but we have time to gain another today. Across the wavering French lines, the troops cheer the news of his arrival. And so the battle begins again. Dissay places his division directly in the path of the principal Austrian column. To his right, the French put together a battery of eighteen cannon, and to the left, there moves up a cavalry unit led by General François-Étienne Kellermann, son of the victor of Valmy. They cannon-blast canister into the Austrian vanguard, but the bulk of the enemy column holds fast. Desay leads a frontal attack on horseback, 
Then, potential catastrophe. Almost immediately, a bullet takes the general in the chest, and he slumps off his horse, dead. His corpse will lie on the ground for hours, until someone finally recognizes him by his distinctive hair. His troops pull back in disarray. But the French have one last chance. The 30-year-old Kellerman has brought 500 horsemen around to the right of Desay's position and now leads another charge directly into the side of the Austrian column. Whether by skill or good luck, he has chosen exactly the right moment, immediately after another French artillery salvo, and he crashes into the Austrians at a moment of maximum confusion. His men's sabers slice down from their charging, snorting horses with hideous effect, and the Austrian column breaks apart in a sudden splash of fear as men run or plead for their lives. Within minutes, 3,000 are dead or prisoners, and the battle has swiveled decisively in Napoleon's favor. Other Austrian cavalry, exhausted and without orders, remain out of the action and the Austrian commanders finally have no choice but to order a general retreat back across the Barmida. General Melas has lost nearly 10,000 men, dead and prisoners. Still, the bulk of his army has survived in one piece, and a more adventurous commander, a more Napoleonic one, might try to roll the dice again. But Melas, a 71-year-old, who has spent more than half a century in the Austrian army, is no gambler. A cautious, aristocratic officer, in the old regime style, he has more than a little in common with his contemporary, the Duke of Brunswick, who preferred to march the Prussian army away from Valmy intact in 1792, rather than risk continuing the battle, and thereby handed the French revolutionaries their most famous victory. Now. Melas does something similar. He withdraws, asks to negotiate, and on June 16th, finding his troops in a disadvantageous position, signs an armistice under which he agrees to pull Austrian forces out of Lombardy and Genoa. The Prussian military theorist Heinrich Dietrich von Bülow, the keenest contemporary observer of the 1800 campaign, will conclude that Napoleon did not grasp success, Melas threw it away. But the success is there, nonetheless, and thanks to a Napoleonic propaganda machine, now powered by the full resources of the French state, Marengo will soon become nothing short of an epic victory. <laughs> not to mention a famous chicken recipe, supposedly derived from Napoleon's dinner before the battle. The usual battalion of journalists, poets, orators, sculptors, and painters will magically transform the French leader's unusually lackluster campaign performance into near-magical strategic acumen, his battlefield luck into an effusion of pure tactical genius. Kellerman's brilliantly timed charge will be played down or overlooked entirely or attributed to direct orders from the omniscient commander. Desay will be hailed as a glorious hero, but then he is conveniently dead. The propagandists will also adroitly steer attention back from the battle itself to Napoleon's decision, at the start of the campaign, to march his army into Italy over the high, treacherous St. Bernard Pass in the Alps, in the hope of surprising Melas. The army benefited from favorable weather, and even then nearly came to grief in the mountains before emerging into the Italian plains to the consternation of the Austrians. The crossing will become a key chapter in the Napoleonic legend, suggesting comparisons with Hannibal and Charlemagne. It will also give rise to the single most famous image of Napoleon, painted by the resilient Jacques-Louis David originally in a commission for the king of Spain. In it, the young leader, shorn of the furs he wore in the mountains, and seated on a bucking charger rather than the mule he actually rode, seems to dominate the very rocks, wind, 
and sky. On July 2nd, Napoleon returns to Paris in triumph. The rumors of his fall have vanished like droplets in the bright sun. His power is now ensured. And after General Moreau beats the Austrians again at Hohenlinden a few months later, forcing them out of the war altogether, it will be reinforced. As the historian François Furet has observed, Marengo, far more than Bromère, has served as the true coronation of Napoleon's power and his regime. But it is a coronation that has come at a price. It is nothing less than the result of the most one-sided contract that a nation had ever made with its leader, who was forced into a commitment never to be beaten. Napoleon will do his best to keep this commitment. But over the next fifteen years, France's adversaries will learn to play the game of total war. And as they do, Napoleon will find the large-scale struggle for Europe as difficult to control as the small-scale events on the plain of Bormida. With hindsight, it is tempting to think of Napoleon's entire career as hurtling irresistibly toward that colossal confrontation. But for many years, even after he took power, this supposedly inevitable final destination was anything but clearly in sight. During the period known as the Consulate, 1799 to 1804, Napoleon himself could still scarcely dream that by the age of 40 he would rule the greatest empire Europe had seen since the days of the Caesars, striding as a victor into the royal palaces of Austria and Prussia, with Russia soon to follow. Amazing as his career had been so far, the still more amazing conclusion remained largely unthinkable. The path to the great empire, and thence to its swift cataclysmic collapse, was surprisingly tortuous. The consulate itself was a period of extraordinary achievements, but also of extraordinary tensions. On the one hand, despite quickly seizing supreme power and grinding down the surviving shards of French democracy, Napoleon ostentatiously reinforced critical elements of the revolutionary social order, including equality before the law and religious freedom. He even paid lip service to popular sovereignty by submitting his rule to repeated plebiscites. Such was his genuine popularity, except for Washington in America, no chief magistrate of any republic has ever been so universally popular wrote an opponent, that he scored genuine victories in these, although he still cheated, so as to make his support seem even more overwhelming. A few years later, after having executed a Bourbon prince for conspiring against him, he declared, with apparent conviction, I am the France Revolution. I say it again, and stick by it. Yet even while cementing these elements of the revolutionary heritage, he moved quickly toward older forms of legitimation as well. In 1802, he signed a concordat with Pope Pius VII, restoring Roman Catholicism to a formal public role in French society, even while subordinating it firmly to the state. The same year, he moved closer to the monarchy by making himself consul for life and in 1804, he finally dispensed with the Republic altogether, proclaiming himself emperor. On December 2nd, he took a crown from the hands of Pope Pius in the Cathedral of Notre Dame and placed it on his head. Inimitably, he turned to his brother Joseph on the occasion and remarked in Italian, Si babu ci vedi. If only Dad could see us now. David's former student, Jean-Auguste Dominique Ingré, painted the new emperor in his coronation robes as an eerie medieval icon, flat, pale, and expressionless below his massive robes. One critic called the work an attempt to push back art four centuries. Yet, significantly, 
Even here, Napoleon refused to break with modern constitutional forms. The empire came into being not with the coronation, but with an act of Napoleon's tame senate. The consulate was also torn between the militarism that Napoleon had ridden to power and his sincere ambition to forge an explicitly civilian regime. Certainly, there can be no gainsaying the centrality of military glory to his rule. His insistence on leading his armies in person and the adulation heaped on him after Marengo testify amply to it. The hand-picked senators founding the empire in 1804 invoked his military achievements again and again. What other glory? asked one in a typical effusion. Does not eclipse and efface itself before that of the incomparable hero who has conquered them all, who has plucked everything out of chaos and created another universe for us? But the consulate was not a military regime. Napoleon did not staff his ministries with soldiers and did not rely on the army to maintain order. In fact, such was his success at pacifying French territory that by 1804, the army's role in policing had diminished considerably since the unruly late 1790s. Napoleon told one colleague that, I do not govern as a general, but because the nation believes that I have the civilian qualities required for governing. He devoted much of his time and energy to administrative reform and the new law code and cultivated the support of wealthy property owners at least as much as that of his generals. Finally, and most important for our story, Napoleon posed not simply as a glorious conqueror, but also as a peacemaker. The same propaganda machine that celebrated Marengo's lightning bolts of war also insisted that Napoleon had fought in 1800 to bring the wars to an end. In a message to his parliament in 1801, the first consul explained that the end of the revolution at home meant an end to it abroad as well. The time of vain abstractions was over. France would now respect both old and new forms of government. It could now be hoped that the nations of the South and North alike have abjured hateful passions and decided to put an end to their quarrels. The echoes of the Enlightenment language of peace and progress were unmistakable, and a year later, one of Napoleon's legislators invoked it even more explicitly. Now that, in our day, the furor of war has given way to social ideas, now that France has returned with glory to its proper place in the European family, it should coordinate its intentions with those of other peoples to preserve that harmony of principles which perpetuates that peace which is so necessary to the happiness of all nations. This was not the utopian hope for immediate and perpetual peace, which had gripped the left-wing deputies of the National Assembly in 1790, and which Napoleon would later, in exile, unconvincingly assert that he had always kept close to his heart. But neither was it the hysterical yearning for regeneration through blood, which had gripped the Girondins during their push for war in 1791-92. In fact, throughout Napoleon's career, the loudest defenses of war as a positive good came not from him, but from France's opponents. In 1797, the oracular Savoyard reactionary Joseph de Mastre published a ferocious, enormously influential book entitled Considerations on France, which denounced the French Revolution as the work of Satan. In one chapter, he described nature as inescapably violent, thanks to mankind's original sin. And in words eerily reminiscent of the Girondins, although he would have shuddered at the comparison, he added, When the human soul has lost its driving force thanks to softness, skepticism, and the gangrenous vices that stem from an excess of civilization, 
it can only be reinvigorated by blood. Three years later, the conservative German publicist Friedrich Gentz reprised the theme in an essay couched as a reply to Kant's perpetual peace. Although he agreed with Kant that human reason drove mankind toward an end to war, the law of raw nature, he insisted, pointed in the other direction. Animal creation lives and prospers only through war. The echoes of the earlier Enlightenment enthusiasts for war, such as Emser and Humboldt, were clear. Napoleon, despite striking many as the very epitome of raw nature, never adopted this sort of language. Instead, his public proclamations on war tended to waver between invocations of the old aristocratic code of honor and Enlightenment concepts of peace and between 1800 and 1803, he managed to act the part of peacemaker with remarkable conviction. In this short period, he reached separate diplomatic agreements with the United States, Spain, Austria, Naples, Bavaria, Portugal, Russia, and the Ottoman Empire. Most important, on March 25, 1802, he signed the Peace of Amiens with Great Britain, ending hostilities with France's strongest and most determined opponent, and bringing the Revolutionary Wars, properly speaking, to an end. His propaganda choir predictably hailed him as the Angel of Peace and Pacifier of Nations. But the peace did not last. In fact, Scarcely a year elapsed before hostilities resumed between France and Britain, to be followed two years later by the formation of another great anti-French coalition. From then on, fighting would continue, uninterrupted, until the collapse of Napoleon's empire in 1814. Historians have debated for two centuries why the peace did not last, and will surely continue to do so for at least another two. The majority followed Napoleon's opponents in placing the blame primarily on the man himself, his unquenchable ambition and addiction to conquest. They dismissed the peace rhetoric of 1800-3 as a feint, and some, such as Paul Schrader, go so far as to brand Napoleon a criminal. In France, though, a few scholars continue to take a more nuanced view or even to follow Napoleon in arguing that his adversaries forced him into war. The emperor, in his prolix final years, provided plentiful evidence to both sides, protesting his peaceful intentions at length, but also remarking casually to Benjamin Constant, I wanted to rule the world. Who wouldn't have in my place? The Napoleon haters probably have the stronger case, but both sides underestimate the extent to which the wars had a dynamism and logic independent of anyone's intentions. They do not fully recognize just how much the meteor strike of the revolution and its continuing violent aftershocks had destabilized European international relations, making any peace settlement even more fragile than earlier ones. After more than a century in which Western European borders had changed mostly in small increments, the decade 1792 to 1802 had seen France annex modern Belgium, the German Rhineland, and parts of northern Italy, while turning the Netherlands, Switzerland, and more of northern Italy into satellite states. These large-scale transfers left countless border issues unsettled, while France, simply to guard its newly swollen territory and sphere of influence, now perceived vital strategic interests in areas that had once barely excited its attention. Napoleon also believed that France deserved to regain the colonial empire it had lost during the Seven Years' War of 1756-63 and the Haitian Revolution of 1791, so, a very long list of potential flashpoints quickly accumulated. From the Netherlands, where Napoleon insisted on keeping troops in defiance of the treaty, to Malta, 
which the British refused to evacuate in defiance of the treaty, to Egypt, which Napoleon openly spoke of retaking, to Haiti, which, as we discussed in the previous chapter, he did send an expedition to retake, with disastrous results, to the Louisiana Territory, which he reacquired from Spain before selling it to the United States, and so on. In Italy, he annexed additional territories beyond the natural frontier of the Alps. In Germany, he helped bring about a large-scale territorial reorganization, known in the inimitable German as the Reichsdeputation Schaubschluss, that ruthlessly swept up the swarming statelets that had depended for survival on the Habsburg Emperor. Not surprisingly, what Napoleon presented as simple defense of France's new position, his adversaries perceived as naked aggression. Second, it has not been sufficiently appreciated that for all Napoleon's gestures toward older forms of legitimacy, he never managed to re-establish with his enemies the relationship of honorable adversaries that had characterized war before 1789. In Britain in particular, suspicion of him remained enormous. His hold upon France is the sword, and he has no other. Prime Minister William Pitt had warned in 1800. Can he afford to let his military renown pass away? To let his laurels wither? To let the memory of his achievements sink in obscurity? Although Pitt left office in 1801, his views remained widely shared in Britain, in large part because of Napoleon's Jacobin past and his unmistakable loathing of all things British. If my voice has any influence, he had promised in 1798, England will never have an hour's respite from us. Yes, yes, war to the death with England, always, until she is destroyed. He dreamed of the islands becoming a mere appendix of France. Something like Corsica. So it was hardly surprising that the British, in turn, viewed him largely as a usurper. Finally, we need to remember that to a large extent, Pitt was right. Napoleon's political survival did depend on unceasing military accomplishment. He himself said as much at the time of the Peace of Amiens. A first consul is not like kings, who see their states as an inheritance. He needs brilliant deeds, and, therefore, war. He might put on the mantle of a peacemaker, but only one who imposed peace from a position of strength. He could not afford the appearance of weakness, and so stubbornly refused to compromise in one dispute after another. Napoleon's own foreign minister, Talleyrand, would later write of 1802-3 that this peace had not yet received its complete execution before Napoleon was sowing the seeds of new wars. In May 1803, Britain seized all the French ships in British ports, and Napoleon ordered the arrest of several thousand Britons unlucky enough to be caught on French soil. The war had resumed. It remained total war. For all Napoleon's gestures toward the old regime, he could not easily reject the style of large-scale, lightning warfare he had perfected in his two Italian campaigns. Furthermore, the sheer number of possible flashpoints with the Allies, the sheer size of the territories he now felt he needed to protect, and the sheer number of troops he needed to raise, equip, and support as a result, required mobilization on a scale not even seen during the Revolution. Meanwhile, Britain's refusal to treat him as a legitimate sovereign drove Napoleon back toward fantasies of destroying the new Carthage as thoroughly as Rome had destroyed the old one. He cared enormously what the British thought of him, to the point that during the peace he had demanded that the British government suppress attacks on him and his family in the British press. They appeared in profusion and with a ferocity that puts even modern British tabloids to shame. When the war started again, not only did he take the radical step of arresting all British subjects in France, 
but he also hired Bertrand Barrère, author of the Take No Prisoners Decree of 1794, to recycle the bilious revolutionary writings that had called for the extermination of treacherous Albion. When he returned to the battlefield, the resources Napoleon could now draw on did in fact make an overpowering assault on his adversaries a realistic possibility. These resources included France's unmatched wealth, now rebuilt after the revolutionary turmoil, its large population, now swollen well beyond the 30 million mark by the annexations, the revolutionary tradition of the nation in arms, which the legislation of 1798 had transformed into a system of regular conscription, his own efficient reforms of the French state, the military experience of his now long-serving soldiers, and, finally, his own extraordinary abilities and energy. Typically, he worked an 18-hour day, starting soon after midnight, sleeping for an hour or two before dawn, and then continuing straight through until 8 or 9 in the evening. He could still keep in his head the relevant details about the position, command, and condition of all the units in the army, and exhausted his staff. What a pity the men wasn't lazy, Talleyrand quipped. The new war also marked the coming of age of revolutionary military tactics, which were perfectly suited to delivering the sort of blows Napoleon envisioned. Instead of slow, careful maneuvering and a suspicion of large-scale engagements, the French armies now made forced marches in order to compel decisive battles. Instead of trying to capture enemy cities and fortresses, the French aimed at the complete destruction of the enemy army. Instead of the ballet of column and line, they continued to employ swarms of skirmishers and staked success on massive attacks, followed by relentless pursuit of the broken enemy. Above all, instead of a number of separate armies campaigning with only loose coordination between them, Napoleon now commanded a massive, tightly centralized, but flexible Grande Armée, divided into distinct corps, each composed in turn of several divisions. It was the perfect vehicle for the implementation of total war. For two years after the end of the peace, Napoleon kept this weapon of mass destruction in camp on the Channel Coast, training the men obsessively for an invasion of England. To take them across the ditch, as he called it, he ordered the construction of over 2,500 gunboats, barges, and landing craft. Yet the invasion never materialized. For all the emperor's scorn for British shopkeepers, British sailors very effectively kept the French fleet stuck in the Mediterranean, and without its protection, the planned flotilla could not sail. Admiral Villeneuve finally did manage to bring French ships out into the Atlantic in the fall of 1805, but took shelter in the Spanish port of Cadiz rather than confront the British in the Channel. And when Napoleon ordered Villeneuve back to sea in October, Admiral Nelson caught the French and Spanish fleets off Trafalgar and annihilated them. Nelson himself famously perished in the battle, but his victory ended all hope of France competing with Britain on the seas, let alone invading it. Even before Trafalgar, however, the Grande Armée had acquired a different objective. In the summer of 1805, Following Napoleon's continued interference in German politics and his kidnapping and execution of the conspiratorial Bourbon prince Dangien, more than a crime, a blunder, in Fouché's famous apostrophe, Austria and Russia joined Britain in the war. In response on August 23rd, Napoleon marched the army, nearly 200,000 strong, out of its Channel coast camps heading for Germany at a speed that regularly exceeded 20 miles a day and sometimes approached 35, despite the men's heavy equipment. Five weeks later, with remarkably few losses to disease and desertion, the tough, seasoned troops crossed the Rhine. By mid-October, 
they had reached the Danube, and, after some of Napoleon's most brilliant maneuvering, surrounded Austria's General Mack in the Bavarian city of Ulm, which quickly turned into a pestilential, shot-racked hellhole. Mack raged, groaned, came close to being relieved by reason of insanity, and finally surrendered. Less than a month later, the French army entered Vienna. On December 2nd, the anniversary of his coronation, Napoleon caught up with the remaining Austrian forces and the Russians near the Czech village of Austerlitz. The rulers of Austria and Russia were there in person, making Austerlitz the Battle of the Three Emperors. But a concentration of royalty did the Allies no more good at Austerlitz than it had at Valmy. The Russian commander, Kutuzov, urged further withdrawal, but the new Tsar, Alexander I, impetuously insisted on battle. The French obliged and won a crushing victory, leaving the Tsar literally weeping under a tree over the wreck of his army. When Russian troops fled across frozen lakes, Napoleon ordered cannonballs fired onto the ice. As it cracked, a French general remembered, We saw thousands of Russians with their horses, guns, and wagons slowly settle down into the depths. A third of the Allied force was killed, wounded, or taken prisoner, and hundreds of its cannon became a literal pedestal for Napoleon, or rather, the statue of him erected in the Place Vendôme in Paris. Days later, the demoralized Austrians again sued for peace. Having delivered this military hammer blow, Napoleon then proceeded to deliver a political one as well. Unlike the old regime sovereigns, whose company he claimed to have joined, he did not use victory to make moderate adjustments in a relatively static balance of power. Instead, he imposed draconian terms, leading to further large-scale alterations in the map of Europe. In the Treaty of Pressburg, after Austerlitz, the Austrians were forced to surrender Venice and the Dalmatian coast to what had now become Napoleon's Kingdom of Italy, successor to his puppet Cisalpine Republic. They also had no choice but to watch as he continued his reorganization of German territory cobbling together the mid-sized German states west of Prussia and Austria into a new subservient Confederation of the Rhine. Between 1792 and 1815, some 60% of the German population changed rulers. In the wake of this reorganization, an important symbolic event took place, almost as an afterthought. On August 6, 1806, a ceremonial herald blew a trumpet in a Vienna church, and on its plangent note, the long moribund Holy Roman Empire of the German nation, once considered the legitimate successor to the realm of Charlemagne, and beyond that to Rome itself, softly ceased to exist. But impressive as the Austerlitz campaign had been, Napoleon's most spectacularly crushing victory came a year later, against a different enemy. His defeat of Prussia in 1806 not only eerily foreshadowed the total wars of the 20th century, but also helped bring them about by lighting a torch of German resentment that would take 140 years to burn out. The philosopher Hegel, who saw the events at rather too close a remove, considered them the hinge on which the history of the world had turned. The connecting bonds of the world are dissolved and have collapsed like images in a dream, he wrote, even before the end of the campaign. He called Napoleon, whom he saw riding near his home in Jena, nothing less than the world soul who, sitting here astride a horse, reaches out across the world and dominates it. Prussia had not fought France for more than a decade. Its young, insecure King Friedrich Wilhelm III had distressing personal memories of Valmy and had long preferred to turn his attention to the East. Since the final partition of Poland in 1795, 
its richest territories had lain, half digested, in the maw of the Prussian state. Nearly 90% of present day Poland belonged to it. So the Prussians initially had no particular desire to challenge Napoleon. They even entered into a brief alliance with him, prompting an abortive declaration of war against them from Britain. But in the summer of 1806, anxieties about Napoleon's activities on their western borders led the king to switch sides and enter into a new Fourth Coalition, which also included Britain and Russia. It was a disastrous mistake. The Prussian army still lived, to far too great an extent, on the legend of Frederick the Great. Indeed, too many of its generals had personal memories of his days of glory fifty years before. The historian Gordon Craig once quipped, It seemed literally true that, in Prussia, old soldiers never died. The ponderous old Duke of Brunswick, who had lost the Battle of Valmy, remained the kingdom's highest commander. Friedrich Wilhelm's army of 235,000 was large and relatively well-trained, but only by the standards of the old regime. Composed in large part of unwilling peasants, mercenaries, and former prisoners of war, held together by traditionally savage Prussian discipline, it continued to use its conventional order of battle, despite the new tactics Napoleon had perfected. In late August, not waiting for Russian reinforcements, the Prussians gave Napoleon an ultimatum to withdraw his army beyond the Rhine or fight. In response, Napoleon took part of the Grande Armée, already in Germany, and formed it into a powerful square of 180,000 men, the so-called Bataillon Carré, which allowed him to concentrate a huge force quickly on a decisive point. On October 14th, it engaged the Prussians in the twin battles of Jena and Auerstadt. Like so many battles, they began with a comedy of errors. As dawn broke, Napoleon, commanding a concentrated detachment of 46,000 on strategic heights near Jena, where Hegel had glimpsed him the day before, found himself facing some 38,000 Prussians under the 60-year-old Prince of Hohenlohe. Taking them for Brunswick's main force, he quickly summoned reinforcements and by noon had 96,000 men available. Hohenlohe stood no chance against such numbers and compounded his defeat by stubbornly keeping 20,000 infantry standing exposed in line as if they were still fighting the Seven Years' War under merciless fire from French skirmishers hiding behind garden walls. By the end of the day, the French had killed 10,000 of his men and wounded another 15,000. Meanwhile, nearby, Brunswick had been engaged in a characteristic maneuver, withdrawal, but blundered into a French corps under Marshal Louis Davout. In a desperate, brilliant action, Davout beat the larger Prussian force. Brunswick himself fell mortally wounded and the battles left the Prussian military shattered beyond repair. But the French triumph did not end there, for Napoleon's forces relentlessly pursued the Prussians. On October 16th, Erfurt fell to Marshal Murat, with 6,000 men taken prisoner. The next day, Hal surrendered to Marshal Bernadotte. One by one, the remaining Prussian fortresses passed into French hands, often without offering even token resistance. Hameln, Plassenburg, Stettin, Spandau, Magdeburg. In early November, Napoleon marched triumphantly into Berlin, displaying prisoners from Friedrich Wilhelm's noble guard. The king himself had fled to East Prussia. Of the 171,000 soldiers he had sent against Napoleon at the end of the summer, he had lost no less than 96%. 25,000 dead or wounded and 140,000 prisoners. Napoleon, meanwhile, issued a bulletin declaring that the defeat of Rosbach 
France's epic loss to Frederick the Great in 1757, had been expunged. He also paid a visit to Frederick himself in his tomb at Potsdam. He stopped at the entrance in a grave, meditative attitude. His aide Segur recalled, He remained there nearly ten minutes, motionless and silent. Then he left, although not without first helping himself to Frederick's sword, sash, and black eagle decoration for display in Paris. As the future military strategist Clausewitz, an eyewitness to the campaign, would later write, the Prussian army had been ruined more completely than any army has ever been ruined on the battlefield. Despite this epical defeat, the conflict dragged on for another eight months. The Russians had not yet come to terms, and in February 1807, Napoleon fought them and the remaining Prussians in the ghastly Battle of Elial in Poland, under blinding, stinging snow, without a significant result. But in June, Napoleon crushed the Russians at the Battle of Friedland, and a month later met Tsar Alexander on a raft in the middle of the Niemen River near Tilsit, at the Russian frontier. In keeping with his monarchical pretensions, Napoleon called the young Russian monarch his brother, pledged to treat him as an equal, and seduced him into an alliance. He forced Friedrich Wilhelm to wait on the shore like a naughty child, and the subsequent treaty reduced Prussia to the status of a second-rate power. It lost fully half its territory and subjects, from 10 million to 4.6, was forced to pay massive reparations, saw its army reduced to a token force of 42,000, and as a result of all this, suffered an economic collapse. In modern European history, only one campaign compares with Napoleon's defeat of Prussia for its sheer, overwhelming speed and force, Hitler's conquest of France in the spring of 1940. Both took less than six weeks. Napoleon, at 33 days, was faster, despite his lack of tanks. Both destroyed the adversary's morale, as well as their physical ability to resist. Both ended with an entire army taken prisoner. At the cessation of hostilities, both losing powers had territory amputated, Prussia far more than France. And both victors described the war as revenge for an earlier defeat. Hitler famously forcing the French to sign the armistice in the same railroad car where the Germans had surrendered at the end of World War I. Even Napoleon's visit to Frederick's tomb eerily foreshadowed the visit that a pensive, silent Hitler would pay in 1940 to the Invalides and the tomb of Napoleon himself. In other words, 1806 was a blitzkrieg. And just like the Blitzkrieg of 1940, it left Great Britain alone in the fight. Another year, another deadly blow, another mighty empire overthrown, and we are left, or shall be left alone, the last that dare to struggle with the foe. Thus wrote William Wordsworth in November 1806. The keenest observer of the campaign, however, was Clausewitz. This product of the minor Prussian nobility, then just 26, had already spent half his life in uniform. He was a serious, hard-working man dedicated to the Prussian army, so its massive failure struck him hard both personally, he spent two years as a prisoner in France, and philosophically. And over the next few years, shock congealed into furor as he watched King Friedrich Wilhelm meekly follow Napoleon's dictates. Finally, in 1812, Clausewitz committed the ultimate apostasy for an officer, abandoning his country in wartime and pledging himself to the Russians, who were now at war with France again. In a passionate justification of his act, which amounted to a military profession of faith, 
he bitterly denounced not only his own dishonored government, but also, significantly, the style of war at which it had once excelled. Formerly, war was waged in the way that a pair of duelists carried out their pedantic struggle. One battled with moderation and consideration according to the conventional proprieties. War was caused by nothing more than a diplomatic caprice, and the spirit of such a thing could hardly prevail over the goal of military honor. There is no more talk of this sort of war, and one would have to be blind not to be able to perceive the difference with our wars, that is to say, the wars that our age and our conditions require. The war of the present time is a war of all against all. It is not a king who wars on a king, not an army which wars on an army, but a people which wars on another. And the king and the army are contained in the people. War will only lose this character with much difficulty, and in truth... The return of that old, bloody, yet often boring chess game of soldiers fighting is not to be desired. The passage brilliantly encapsulated the changes that had taken place in war since 1792, while foreshadowing Clausewitz's great work on war. He now saw the old, aristocratic conventions as mere frippery and artifice, that distorted the true, natural course of war. That true and natural course involved the commitment of every possible resource and all possible violence of the sort France had inflicted on his fatherland. No wonder that he quoted Thomas Hobbes's famous phrase, It felt like a war of all against all, indeed. In the summer of 1807, Having again defeated all his opponents in continental Europe, Napoleon, at thirty-eight years old, stood at his zenith. Again, a chance seemed at hand to escape from the unremitting cycle of war and to establish the empire on a solid, permanent basis. The emperor could now boast of having taken his rightful place among brother sovereigns and now aimed to make the Bonapartes into a dynasty, to outshine the Habsburgs or Bourbons. He imperiously placed his brother Joseph on the throne of the southern Italian kingdom of Naples, whose Bourbon ruler, with exquisitely poor timing, had declared war on France just after Austerlitz, made his brother Louis king of Holland, and carved out a new German kingdom, Westphalia, for his brother Jérôme. He himself was already wearing the crown of the new Kingdom of Italy and installed his stepson, Eugène de Beauharnais, there as viceroy. His longing for a son of his own was already outweighing his waning adoration for Josephine, and within three years he would divorce her and marry the Austrian princess Marie-Louise, great-niece of the late, unlamented Marie Antoinette. In keeping with these grandiose designs, he also created a new nobility, making followers into dukes of Otranto, Rivoli, and Parma, princes of Benevento, Pontecorvo, and Echmul, and so forth. A natural authoritarian, he tolerated little opposition from his parliaments and imposed the strictest press censorship in French history in what amounted in many ways to a return to enlightened despotism. Still, he preferred muzzling his opponents to imprisoning or killing them, and the harshness of his rule cannot compare to that of twentieth-century dictators. But even after 1807, the empire did not mark a return to the old regime, and the tensions that had riven the regime from the beginning remained strong. The emperor continued to maintain the principles of civil equality and meritocracy, defended the revolution's redistribution of landed wealth, and kept the top ranks of his administration staffed by former revolutionaries, such as his long-serving head of internal security, Joseph Fouché, who had spent the terror overseeing massacres of traitors, 
forcing priests to marry, and posting over cemeteries signs that read, Death is an eternal sleep. Despite his formal accommodation with the Church, Napoleon remained deeply anti clerical. Pope Pius eventually excommunicated him. He, in turn, kept the Pope a prisoner for over six years. The armies, which Napoleon deliberately neglected to supply with chaplains, retained this same hostility to religion. The revolutionary heritage manifested itself most powerfully in the lands Napoleon conquered. The territories annexed to the empire, regardless of their history and traditions, were melted down into standard-issue French départements, with administrative structures mirroring those of France itself. And with the French administration came the entire panoply of revolutionary reforms, enforced, if necessary, at gunpoint. The satellite kingdoms, although not always forced to swallow such large doses of Jacobin medicine, still underwent profound transformations. Thanks to this process of amalgamation, Napoleon went further than anyone in modern history toward creating a true European superstate, much further than the architects of the current European Union. I must make all the peoples of Europe one people, he told Fouché, and Paris the capital of the world. In his last years, he would reminisce fondly about his unfulfilled plans for a single currency, metric system, and law code. These same plans also testify to Napoleon's continuing hope to forge an explicitly civilian regime. The new administrative machinery of the empire, from the August State Council in Paris down to the humblest sub-prefectures of the newly annexed provinces, was civilian in nature. For his principal political support, Napoleon continued to depend, above all, on France's wealthiest landowners, men of business, and rentiers, the so-called notables, drawn from the old nobility and bourgeoisie alike, for whom the regime represented stability, prosperity, and progress. He sought insistently to present himself as a civilian patron of the arts and sciences. In keeping with the pattern set under the consulate, he even continued to protest, in the midst of unending war, of his continuing devotion to an ideal of peace. He cast every campaign as a response to foreign aggression. First and foremost, Britain's supposed efforts to strangle France's trade, seduce away its loyal allies, and incite rebellion in its provinces. Yet these loudly stated intentions had to compete with a thick skein of militarism that had wound its way through the Napoleonic story from the start, and that, in a time of repeated, incredible French victories, remained a powerful force shaping imperial society and culture. To begin with, the addition of ermine to Napoleon's wardrobe and Ruritanian titles to his marshal's calling cards brought no return to the aristocratic military ethos of the old regime. The French military was still what the revolution had made it, a world distinct from civilian society. Its continuing commitment to revolutionary principles of merit only reinforced this distinctiveness, for now over three-quarters of French junior officers had spent years in the ranks while Napoleon tried to fill the higher ranks with graduates of a new, intensive military school. The officer corps remained very much a full-time profession, to the extent that some of Napoleon's marshals grumbled audibly at having no time to enjoy their new titles and ill-gotten wealth. The days in which a Laozun could flit languidly from court to campaign and back were long past. As for the ranks, while the machinery of conscription ground away until the empire's final years, the stereotypical peasant draftees yearning for family and field constituted only about half its soldiers, the rest being long-serving professionals. Even without a restoration of the old aristocratic order, Napoleon gave the military overwhelming prestige and privilege. 
confirming the sense that it was not simply distinct from civilian society, but superior to it. Although he might not have ruled through the military, he ruled to a significant extent for it. For example, fully 59% of the 3,000 odd noble titles he created went to high ranking military officers. As for the Legion of Honor he established as a reward for merit, it revealed with particular clarity how Napoleon often failed to follow through on his civilian rhetoric. If this honor only went to the military, he insisted at its foundation in 1802, then the nation would no longer amount to anything. Yet, no less than 97% of the 48,000 people who earned its coveted red ribbon before 1815, in fact, came from the military. In official state ceremonies, marshals of France had the right to walk ahead of even the highest civilian officials. Even more significantly, the army became, in some ways, a model for civilian society. Many civilian officials wore uniforms, based on military ones, and their clerks worked according to harsh rules that mimicked military discipline. Public festivals and celebrations took on an increasingly military character, and theaters presented an endless stream of plays. At least 143 in France between 1799 and 1815, highlighting the glorious deeds of soldiers. In the 45 new all male elite lycées, high schools, that the regime created, the boys were organized into companies, commanded by sergeants. They wore uniforms, walked to class to the sounds of drum beats underwent military training, and listened to endless lectures on honor, patriotism, and duty to the emperor that deliberately tried to adapt the language of the old regime to the new world of the First Empire. A typical example, delivered on August 14, 1806, by a rhetorician named Pierre Crozet, informed his students in no uncertain terms of what might await them after graduation. Fatigue, danger, iron, blood, carnage, and death. But they could not flinch, he added, for cowards would bear the brand of dishonor forever. Honor mattered above all. Indeed, such is a Frenchman's love of honor that he will sometimes turn it into the cruelest fanaticism and drench his altars in his brother's blood. Fine stuff, one will agree, for teenage boys gathered together on a summer afternoon. In short, Napoleon's great opponent, the Duke of Wellington, did not entirely err when he claimed that the empire was constituted upon a military basis. All its institutions were framed for the purpose of forming and maintaining its armies with a view to conquest. The simple fact that the draft established in 1798 continued to function pulling in up to 80,000 new recruits a year between 1805 and 1810, and more than six times that figure between 1812 and 1814, had its own effects. Historians of the subject have called attention above all to the way conscription represented an unwelcome, much-resisted imposition on French society. The abundant soldiers' letters that have survived from the period indeed testify eloquently to their homesickness and sheer befuddlement. They did not always know what country they were in, to say nothing of how to spell the place names. Austerlitz became Austerlik, Austerlitz, Esterlix, and so on. One soldier marching east toward Russia in 1812 believed that he was on a secret overland route to England. Yet other soldiers felt delight in the opportunities the army brought. For promotion, for enrichment, by pillage, for abundant drink, for education, for simple novelty, for escape from lives of drudgery and toil. In any case, whether they welcomed it or detested it, the army became their home, with its discipline, 
its largely all-male camaraderie, its fatigues, its dangers. They had left civilian society to join military society. And on what we can start to think of as the home front, families likewise found themselves bound together by the common anxiety of loved ones in peril far away. All dreaded receiving the visit from the sub-prefect or other local official, bearing horrid news of a death or disappearance, often many months in the past, accompanied by stiff, boilerplate sentiment that hardly consoled them in their agony. In giving this terrible news to Monsieur Montigny's parents, you can tell them that this young officer in death takes with him the grief and the esteem of his commanders and his comrades. He was a gallant officer who has paid with his life for the fine reputation enjoyed by the 127th Regiment. In his brilliant 1808 painting, The Reading of the Bulletin, Louis Leopold Boilly gave a sense of just how intently the families of the soldiers now followed the news of distant battles and traced the progress of French armies on the map. And then there was architecture. Anyone who walks through central Paris today can hardly miss the military stamp that Napoleon put on much of his capital. He devised a grandiose building program centered on monuments to his victories. The Arc de Triomphe, begun under his rule, although only finished decades later. The Vendôme Column, in the style of Trajan's Column in Rome, cast from the metal of Russian cannon, seized at Austerlitz, and topped by the Emperor's statue. The Arc du Carousel, in the courtyard of the Louvre. Napoleon intended the severely classical structure that is now the Church of the Madeleine to serve as a military temple of glory. He renovated the Invalides, built under the old regime for disabled veterans, and recast its principal church as a temple of Mars. In an elaborate ceremony, one of France's greatest military heroes of the old regime, Marshal Turenne, was reburied there in a sarcophagus adorned with the cannonball that had killed him. In the Place des Victoires, statues from the days of the Bourbons gave way to a gigantic bronze nude of Desay, the hero of Marengo, which shocked the local bourgeoise with its anatomical accuracy. Needless to say, this culture of militarism did not lack a full-grown cult of personality of the supreme commander. The same shameless self-promotion that had characterized Napoleon's rise to power now spewed forth in industrial strength from amply endowed cultural institutions to blanket three-quarters of Europe. For those who preferred their heroes to wear a religious costume, the intimidated Pope even obligingly discovered an early Christian martyr named Neopolis, rechristened him Saint Napoleon, and fixed his Saint's Day on August 15th, Napoleon's birthday, which became France's new national holiday, conveniently eclipsing the Catholic Feast of the Assumption. Engravings of the holy man bearing a suspicious resemblance to his modern namesake turned Napoleonic hero worship into a literal cult of the saint. True, Napoleon the Emperor and Napoleon the Saint never succeeded entirely in displacing Napoleon the man of the people. The supreme commander continued to make a point of treating ordinary soldiers, if not ordinary citizens, as equals, and his soldiers avidly repeated the stories of how he took over guard duty from an exhausted recruit or allowed a gruff old veteran to call him Tu. But as Napoleon and his empire grew older, his famed popular touch seemed to be felt less and less. Militarism also inevitably encouraged the same quasi-erotic celebration of violence that had flowed through French culture since the beginning of the Revolutionary Wars. Despite the ease with which he slipped into the language of peace, Napoleon still had a tendency to exalt military actions for their sheer grandeur. In conversation in 1810, 
he defended Louis XIV's glorious destruction of the Palatinate, which Enlightenment authors had condemned as the greatest atrocity of the age. During the Russian campaign of 1812, he took delight in the burning of Smolensk and responded to his grand equerry's shocked protests with the words, Bah! Gentlemen, remember the words of a Roman emperor. A dead enemy always smells sweet. The regime exploited General Desay's heroic sacrifice at Marengo in a long series of portraits, engravings, and statues, including the embarrassing nude in the Place des Victoires, that recalled the sensual beauty of the boy martyr Barra, as painted by Jacques-Louis David. Among the many war paintings shown at the prestigious salons, the largest number, and most popular, gave straightforward overviews of battles. But visitors could also gaze on Anne-Louis Girardet's astonishing 1810 Revolt of Cairo, with its seething mass of entwined male bodies. The painting, in the words of one art historian, makes the moment of death look beguilingly beautiful. In short, although Napoleon did not explicitly praise war as a positive good in the manner of Humboldt or Gentz, his regime nonetheless continued the re-glorification of war that had begun under the Directory. Toward the end of the First Empire, the keenest liberal thinker of the day, Benjamin Constant, arraigned Napoleon for these militaristic tendencies before the philosophes' court of history in a brilliant essay entitled The Spirit of Conquest and Usurpation. Without mentioning the emperor by name, Constant charged him with hypocrisy for speaking the language of peace, even while living by the credo that military glory is the greatest glory. True, Constant wrote, open celebration of war had become almost unthinkable in the modern age. No government would dare say to its nation, let us go conquer the world. The nation would respond unanimously, we have no wish to conquer the world. Two years later, Napoleon would, in fact, confess this very desire to Constant himself, but in private conversation. Nonetheless, Constant charged, conquest was Napoleon's goal, and the writer drew on the historical thought of the Enlightenment to condemn it in the strongest terms. In some ages of history, he wrote, war was in the nature of man. But the modern world is, in this regard, the opposite of the ancient world. We have reached the age of commerce, which must necessarily replace the age of war. Unlike the philosophes, Constant described commerce less as a solution to international conflict than its continuation by other means. He also, most likely unwittingly, shared Humboldt's opinion that in the classical age, war had brought out the most noble qualities of the human soul. But unlike Humboldt, he insisted that in modern times, its human and economic costs far outweighed any possible benefit. And so, any modern government that waged wars of conquest was guilty of a crude and deadly anachronism. Constant concluded the first part of his essay by suggesting that France had only to abjure this anachronism to retake its place among the civilized peoples of the globe. But in doing so, he severely underestimated the extent to which the wars had a logic and inertia of their own and to which Napoleon himself was ultimately trapped by them, reacting to events and struggling to maintain his position, rather than simply trying to satisfy his insatiable ambition. Furthermore, as the emperor would discover, despite his repeated triumphs, final, permanent victory proved to be like an asymptote on a graph, impossible to reach. The closer he seemed to approach it, the more powerful the forces he generated against himself until, finally, the empire itself burst apart under the strain. Certainly, it proved just as difficult for peace to take hold after Tilsit 
and the pause that followed the defeat of the Fourth Coalition in 1807, as after the earlier 1802 Peace of Amiens. As before, the seizure of new territory, the creation of new satellite states, and the expansion of spheres of influence created a larger frontier to defend, now far larger than before, and more potential flashpoints. As we will learn in the next chapter, it also led to ever more revolts against French authority, a string of new Vendées that ignited wherever French rule seemed fragile, just as had happened in 1798-99. to In fact, after the Fourth Coalition, the entire coastline of continental Europe became a flashpoint of sorts. Despite Napoleon's settlements with the continental powers, Great Britain, again his sole remaining opponent, remained as strong as ever, thanks to its decimation of the French and Spanish fleets at Trafalgar. Unable to invade it, or to resist its naval power, and suffering from its strangling of French overseas trade, Napoleon determined instead to wreck it economically by depriving it of access to European markets. This was the continental blockade he outlined in decrees issued from Berlin in late 1806, which would eventually expand into an ambitious economic continental system. But in the absence of naval power, he could enforce this design only by exerting direct or indirect political control over the coastal states of the continent, all of them. And in the final analysis, doing so would frequently require armed force. The deadly risks of this strategy soon became apparent. In July 1807, Napoleon ordered Portugal, a traditional British ally and trading partner, to close its ports to British shipping. When the Portuguese failed to comply, he sent General Junot to seize the country. But the need to move large French forces across Spanish territory further destabilized France's already deteriorating relations with its longtime ally, Spain. In early 1808, Napoleon finally decided to replace the Spanish Bourbons with a Bonaparte, Joseph, whom he moved from Naples for the purpose. But this coup prompted a large-scale Spanish rebellion, the Spanish ulcer through which the acid of guerrilla war ate away at the vital organs of the empire. British expeditionary forces under Arthur Wellesley, the future Lord Wellington, and John Moore came to help the Portuguese and Spanish, forcing Napoleon to take personal charge of the campaign in the summer of 1808. But although he won more crushing victories and forced a temporary British evacuation of Spanish territory, the rebellion stubbornly continued. To make matters worse, in 1809 the Austrian Empire, tempted by the weaknesses that the Spanish War had exposed, renewed the fight against France. Archduke Karl, Austria's most competent commander, forced Napoleon to a terrifyingly costly draw at Aspernesling, and it took another strenuous campaign and French victory at Wagram in July to bring the Austrians to the table again. It was their fourth defeat at his hands. This time, the peace terms included Napoleon's marriage to Princess Marie-Louise, who in 1811 would give him his long-desired son and heir. But where would the next leak in the continental blockade spring from? It is difficult not to think of Napoleon in this period as a cartoon Dutch boy frantically sticking finger after finger into a none-too-stable dike. The logic of total war now began to tell against Napoleon in other ways as well. As the war spread, the sheer scale of combat grew inexorably. It was not simply that, by 1809, France's armies found themselves stretched across theaters of operation that ranged from Iberia to Italy to the North German coast, to say nothing of the major campaign against Austrian regulars. It was not simply that Napoleon had to entrust more and more authority to subordinates who lacked his talent as a commander. 
the battles themselves were swelling dangerously in size. At Marengo, in 1800, roughly 60,000 soldiers had taken part in the fighting on both sides. Five years later, at Austerlitz, the number had grown to nearly 165,000. Four years after that, at Wagram, the largest battle yet seen in the gunpowder age, it was 300,000, with some 80,000 dead and wounded. And in 1813, at Leipzig, the total number exceeded 500,000, with fully 150,000 dead and wounded. The front along which Napoleon's army stretched at the start of a campaign expanded from 80 miles in Italy in 1796 to 130 miles in Germany in 1806 to 240 miles on the Russian border in 1812. Chateaubriand wrote eloquently that these enormous battles go beyond glory and contrasted them sharply to the old civilized warfare which leaves peoples in peace while a small number of soldiers do their duty. In theory, with its deep reserves of cheap, dispensable conscripts, France could manage such numbers. For every hundred thousand soldiers who lay dead or wounded and desperate to die on the battlefield, there were always another hundred thousand to replace them. It gave Napoleon little pause to send his men to slaughter in such huge numbers despite his famed rapport with them. The Austrian statesman Metternich claimed that Napoleon told him, in a June 1813 meeting, I grew up on the battlefield. A man like me does not give a shit about the lives of a million men. But these oversized battles threatened Napoleon for reasons that had little to do with their gruesome human costs. Napoleon's success as a general had always stemmed from his own tight, centralized control over every aspect of his campaigns, which in turn depended on his amazing memory and agility of mind. But by the time of the 1809 war, the battles were simply growing too large and uncontrollable for one man to oversee in this manner. Worse, just when Napoleon needed his abilities the most, he began to lose them. In 1805, he supposedly remarked to his valet, One has only a certain time for war. I will be good for six years more. After that, even I must cry halt. Well before the six years had elapsed, his associates noticed that his reactions had slowed and that his body had thickened and grown more prone to disease. Napoleon frequently suffered from dysuria, a condition under which urine turns thick and grainy and almost impossible to pass without great pain. At the critical Battle of Borodino in 1812, a bout of it induced a violent fever. Napoleon had to manage the battle while suffering from violent fits of shivering, constant pain, and swollen legs. Although the French eked out a victory of sorts, they lost the chance to destroy the Russian army as they had destroyed the Prussians in 1806. Nonetheless, between 1807 and 1814, the dike held, in large part because of the hesitancy of the Allies. True, by 1807, it had become obvious to many observers on the Allied side that defeating Napoleon would require painful rebuilding of their armies and governments alike. Even before Napoleon's seizure of power, reformers such as Prussia's Gerhard von Scharnhorst had called for the creation of truly national militaries to compete with the army of the Levée en masse. Yet the governing elites agonized over whether a revolution from above, as one Prussian official called it, could take place without provoking a French-style revolution from below. Austria offered the clearest case of this resistance on June 9, 1808, in a seeming bow to reformers, Emperor Franz established a Landwehr, or Home Army, and declared every male between 18 and 45 
in the hereditary and bohemian lands of the Austrian crown eligible for service. In theory, something like conscription was now in place, at least for the most trustworthy portion of the Austrian Empire's diverse population. Yet it remained largely symbolic. Recruiting during the War of 1809 did not come close to the target of 230,000 men. Those who did come into the service, provided with poor weapons and worse leadership, fared from badly to disastrously on the battlefield. The government did not push to expand the experiment and shut it down entirely in 1813. A far more important reform movement, it is true, got underway in Prussia during these years. The catastrophe of 1806-7 left that kingdom's elite collectively pale, jittering with shock, and humiliated by their army's quick collapse. Following Jena and Tilsit, the king sought the help of longtime reformers, particularly the pragmatic absolutist Karl von Hardenberg and the aristocratic liberal Karl von Stein, whom later German legend cast as visionary romantic nationalists. In fact, both were practical men who cared more about modernizing the Prussian state than about the mystical union of all Germans. But in pursuit of their goals, they pushed through changes that indeed amounted to a revolution from above, an abolition of rural serfdom and urban guilds, the opening up of professions to all comers, an equalization of the tax burden, and a measure of religious toleration, including for Jews. A military committee dominated by Scharnhorst and Neithart von Gneisenau worked to turn the Prussian military into a professional force in which merit rather than birth or the monarch's favor determined advancement, and in which the men obeyed because of genuine loyalty rather than fear of savage punishment. The German historian Friedrich Meinecke concluded approvingly that the reformers managed to change the army from a mere tool in the hands of the commander-in-chief into a living institution. This meant, of course, that they turned it into a self-contained, non-civilian realm, facilitating the emergence of militarism. In a sign of the desire to separate the realms as thoroughly and visibly as possible, the high command tried to ban women entirely from army life. Yet although they had immense long-term consequences for German history, the Prussian reforms did not have an immediate impact on the military situation. For more than five years after Tilsit, the cautious, dithering king, all too aware of his shrunken territory and diminished resources, did not dare challenge Napoleon. To the disgust of Clausewitz, as we have learned, the king refused Scharnhorst's call for a Prussian Landwehr, declined to join Austria in the War of 1809. Some of his more hot-headed officers led troops out on their own with disastrous results, and heeded the limits France had imposed on his army. He discouraged anything like nationalist rhetoric. Nation? That sounds Jacobinish. Giving in to pressure from Napoleon, he eventually dismissed most of the reformers, including both Stein and Hardenberg. In March 1812, he even entered into a formal alliance with France, and committed 30,000 troops to help in the invasion of Russia. Oddly, as Linda Colley has shown, some of the most significant changes instead took place in Britain, which, well protected by its navy, never resorted to conscription. The British army nonetheless managed to expand sixfold between 1789 and 1814, although even then it numbered only a quarter of a million men. Part-time and volunteer units at home added half a million men more, although only half of them had weapons. In the first years of the war, Kali writes, the government was as afraid of its own people as it was of the enemy. But by 1803, voices could be heard urging the government to follow the French example of the people in arms. <laughs> 
Even more striking were the actions the British took after 1808 in Portugal, where General William Carr Beresford reorganized and strengthened the army, and for a time acted as a virtual dictator. He used traditional Portuguese institutions to impose effective conscription, insisted that the inhabitants evacuate and lay waste to any territory in danger of French occupation, and in general mobilized the entire country for war. By January 1812, he had 110,000 Portuguese serving in the army and militia, a much greater proportion of the population than the French ever managed to call up. The uneven reform processes among the Allies were matched by uneven development in their military strategy and tactics. Napoleon's greatest adversary, the Duke of Wellington, was probably the least Napoleonic of them. An unmistakably aristocratic general who relied on the careful, cautious maneuvering of relatively small bodies of highly trained professional soldiers. My great object was in general to avoid fighting a great battle, he later recalled, in terms reminiscent of Maurice of Saxony. Still, when the occasion demanded it, he had little hesitation ordering lightning attacks. Archduke Karl, brother of the Austrian emperor, who forced Napoleon to the gory draw of Aspernessling in 1809, also remained partly loyal to older principles, although he willingly accepted the lessons of the French Revolution as to mobility and open-order fighting. The most Napoleonic figure among the Allies, Russia's Alexander Suvorov, had his moment of glory early, even before Napoleon's heyday. A devout believer in rapid mobility and the total destruction of enemy forces, he inspired a Napoleonic cult of personality among his soldiers. But he also had an aristocratic, entirely un-Napoleonic disdain for detail and paperwork, which helped to limit his successes. And his eccentricity was a byword. One English observer wrote of him, I never saw anything so stock mad. He died in 1800, and his successors, particularly Marshal Mikhail Kutuzov, proved considerably more cautious in their styles of command. In important ways, then, the wars remained, until 1812, the odd mismatch that they had been since the start, with a much-transformed France fighting against adversaries still partially enamored of the aristocratic, old-regime ways of war. In only one sense had the Allies adopted something like revolutionary attitudes with real enthusiasm, although also, with a more frankly religious twist, their apocalyptic vision of the enemy. For despite Napoleon's acquisition of an imperial title and his marriage to a Habsburg, he remained anything but an honorable opponent for the powers that fought him. He stood, rather, as the personification of revolutionary evil, the Corsican ogre, or Mediterranean mulatto, as the British press liked to put it, or, indeed, the Antichrist. A much-circulated engraving portrayed him as the literal son of the devil, and the hugely popular German poet Ernst Moritz Arndt identified him with Satan in the aptly named 1811 Song of Revenge. Den der Satan ist gekommen, er hat such Fleisch und Bein genommen, und will der Herr der Erde sein. For Satan has come, he has taken on flesh and bone, and wants to be lord of the earth. In November 1806, the Holy Synod of the Russian Orthodox Church formally condemned Napoleon as a false messiah who had conspired with Jews against the Christian faith. Until 1812, those in the Allied camp seeking portents of deliverance from the Napoleonic scourge had as much disappointment as pleasure. They hopefully seized on the 1807 Battle of Eylau, Napoleon's least successful since Egypt, as proof of his strategic fallibility. Even the French bulletins, 
which normally put the needs of morale well before those of the truth. Lying like a bulletin was a proverbial expression. Used horror and massacre to describe the frozen, hideous aftermath of the battle. But Eilau was followed by victory at Friedland and the summit meeting at Tilsit. The gory draw of Aspern Essling in 1809 again kindled excitement across Europe. One German newspaper enthusiastically announced Napoleon's death on the battlefield. But Archduke Karl did little to exploit his success, and Napoleon eventually imposed yet another humiliating peace on the Austrian Empire. But the end came quickly. So quickly that Chateaubriand could call the First Empire nothing but an immense dream, as brief as the fretful night that had engendered it. In 1812, all the tendencies I have already discussed, France's imperial overstretch, the continual rebellions against French authority, the uncontrollable expansion in the size of armies and battles, Napoleon's own weakening abilities, finally came together in the perfect storm that was Russia. At the start of this campaign, the First Empire was still somewhat unsteady, but remained the greatest power ever seen in European history. Six months later, it was a gravely wounded giant, spurting blood under the ravenous gaze of its enemies and allies alike. Nothing illustrates the implacable logic of total war more than Napoleon's decision to attack Russia. He had good political reasons for doing so. By 1812, Tsar Alexander had become a singularly unreliable ally, undermining the continental system and threatening France's control over Germany and Poland. Yet the campaign made little military sense, and Napoleon went to war with largely undefined military goals just as the French revolutionaries had done twenty years earlier. Of course, he hoped to destroy the Russian army, as he had destroyed the Prussians in 1806. But in Russia, he faced an opponent with a population greater than France's, and with territory stretching 1,500 miles in its European portion alone. And beyond that, 5,000 miles farther across Siberia, the Tsar insisted that he would retreat to the Pacific before surrendering. Its army, staffed largely by long-serving conscripts, already outnumbered an intimidating 600,000 men at the start of 1812 and would swell to over 900,000 by September. Napoleon himself admitted that he did not know precisely what goal he was marching toward. In 1808, he had fancifully proposed to the Tsar a joint invasion of British India, and four years later, thoughts of the Orient again ensnared him, as they had done in Egypt. I do not fear that long road which is bordered by deserts, his aide Narbonne remembered him saying. After all, that long road is the road to India. Alexander the Great to reach the Ganges, started from just as distant a point as Moscow. Narbonne claimed Napoleon spoke these lines as if in a trance-like exaltation. They certainly reflected a trance-like imperviousness to reality, for Napoleon could hardly march the Grande Armée 4,000 miles into Asia without his empire exploding behind him. As it was, even the Russian campaign saw dangerous conspiracies against his rule develop in Paris. Napoleon also knew perfectly well of the folly Sweden's King Charles XII had committed a century previously, when he had led his army to destruction deep inside Russian territory at Poltava. The emperor had read Voltaire's history of Charles XII closely, and even carried it with him during the campaign. If he needed an excuse not to go, he could have even cited portents. At the very start of the campaign, finding a bridge over the Velia River destroyed, he scornfully ordered a squadron of Polish cavalry to wade across at a ford. In the middle of the stream, 
the current swept the horses off their feet, and the heavily equipped riders floundered and drowned. As they were about to go down, remembered Napoleon's aide, Ségur. They turned towards Napoleon and shouted, Vive l'Empereur! Even before this incident, the heavens themselves seemed to display a warning in the form of a large comet that had appeared in European skies in the spring of 1811. In Tolstoy's unforgettable words, Almost in the center of this sky, surrounded and convoyed on every side by stars, but distinguished from them all by its nearness to the earth, its white light and long uplifted tail, shone the huge, brilliant comet of the year 1812, the comet which was said to portend all manner of horrors and the end of the world. And yet, he went. In June 1812, the largest army ever assembled in European history approached the Niemen River, Russia's western frontier. It included some 200,000 men from France's pre-1792 borders, another 100,000 from the newly annexed territories, 160,000 Germans, 90,000 Poles and Lithuanians, and a wide smattering of other nationalities, a truly European force. The ongoing war in Spain pinned down an additional 200,000 troops who otherwise might have accompanied Napoleon. Nonetheless, he counted 450,000 in his main army group and some 655,000 altogether. In the next six months, at least half of them would die. The popular imagination associates Napoleon's Russian disaster, like Hitler's, with the victories of the famous General Winter. But another season arguably played just as great a role. Soon after the invasion began, temperatures climbed to as high as 97 degrees Fahrenheit, putting the troops, with their heavy uniforms and packs, into a parched agony that, for the older veterans, must have recalled the Egyptian campaign. But in Egypt, the French initially had to march barely 150 miles. To reach Moscow from the Niemen, they had to go nearly four times that distance. The peasants of the region had largely fled, taking their food supplies along or hiding them in the woods. For the Grande Armée, food and water quickly ran short. Jacob Walter, a 24-year-old stonemason from southern Germany, later recalled the march in nausea-inducing detail. So hungry were the men that when they found a hog, they did not even stop to cook it. Often still living, it would be cut and torn to pieces. Several times I succeeded in cutting off something, but I had to chew it and eat it uncooked, since my hunger could not wait for a chance to boil the meat. In order to obtain water for drinking and cooking, holes were dug into the swamps three feet deep in which the water collected. The water was very warm, however, and was reddish-brown with millions of little red worms, so that it had to be bound in linen and sucked through with the mouth. Dysentery quickly followed on this revolting fare, further exacerbating dehydration and turning the Moscow road into the largest, foulest open latrine in human history. Soldiers lay down and held their breath, desperately trying not to vomit. I'm looking forward to getting killed, one conscript wrote home, for I am dying as I march. Somehow, the shrinking Grande Armée held together and chased the Russians eastward. But rather than risk destruction, the Russians retreated, and the French failed to catch them. Napoleon was operating on a larger scale than ever before and had to rely more than ever on his less brilliant subordinates. At one point, he chastised his own brother Jérôme for lacking the most elementary grasp of soldiering. At several moments, he pondered retreating, 
but in each case decided to push forward, still hoping to annihilate the Russian army. In mid-August, he almost managed the feat at Smolensk, but failed to close his planned trap and gained little but a burned and ruined city. We pass through the smoking ruins in military formation, with our martial music and customary pomp, triumphant over this desolation, but with no other witness to our glory than ourselves. Thus wrote Segur. On September 7th, with their commander shaking from fever and urinary pain, the French won another Pyrrhic victory at Borodino, outside of Moscow, opening the city but losing 28,000 killed and wounded, including 48 generals. And the Russians escaped again. A week later, the French occupied Moscow, which St. Petersburg had replaced as Russia's capital a century before. The city had just been evacuated, and the clocks in the Kremlin were still ticking. Finding food and drink, the starving French troops gorged. Then they pillaged, stripping houses of clothing, furniture, tapestries, jewelry, icons, anything that could be carried. But there were scarcely 100,000 of them. Even taking into account the many thousands stationed behind, along the route, or heading toward St. Petersburg under Marshal MacDonald, the losses had already dwarfed anything yet seen in any European war. It was uncertain whether the remainder of the Grande Armée could hold out in the city through the winter, or even try. And then, most likely thanks to deliberate Russian acts of arson, the city burned on a scale not seen in Europe since the Great London Fire of 1666. Nero-like, Napoleon looked on in fascination. As he later reminisced in exile on St. Helena, It was the spectacle of a sea and billows of fire, a sky and clouds of flame, mountains of red rolling flames like immense waves of the sea alternately bursting forth and lifting themselves to skies of fire, and then sinking into the ocean of flame below. Oh, it was the most grand, the most sublime, and the most terrifying sight the world ever beheld. The one-time aspiring novelist had certainly produced a real-life spectacle that matched any piece of art but the genre had shifted from heroic epic to Shakespearean tragedy. The final act came with the retreat. Having lost so much of his army in the march to Moscow, Napoleon now sacrificed nearly all the rest. Although we are less acclimatized than the Russians, we are fundamentally more robust he insisted unconvincingly, amid Moscow's smoking ruins. We have not had autumn yet. We shall have plenty of fine days before winter sets in. On October 19th, the depleted army, loaded down with the fruits of its pillage, began to leave the city. Nine days later, they staggered past the battlefield of Borodino, where tens of thousands of unburied corpses still lay in the open, half-eaten by animals and vermin, amid a staggering wreck of charred tree trunks and the detritus of war. Battered helmets and breastplates, broken drums, fragments of weapons, shreds of uniforms, and blood-stained flags. Then, on November 6th, the snow began. The thermometer plummeted eventually reaching as low as negative 35 degrees Fahrenheit. And the tragedy devolved into a phantasmagorical horror, almost beyond imagining. Jean-Michel Chevalier, a French officer from Versailles, We no longer saw French soldiers on the roads, only phantoms covered in rags, pallid figures with long, dirty, ashen beards their heads a tangle of handkerchiefs, their hands and feet wrapped in lambskins, with old bedspreads, women's skirts, 
horse blankets and animal skins covering their heads and bodies, so that one barely saw their dull, gaunt eyes. And all these piles of torn, burned, disgusting scraps, all of it marched mechanically, aimlessly, at random, without a shade of hope. Little by little, the blood stopped circulating. The feet swelled first. Then the blood rose towards the head. The eyes turned haggard, seeing nothing but fantastic phantoms. Then blood came out of the nose. A satanic and convulsive laugh. An unintelligible rattle. The wretch went blind, spun about like a drunk, and fell, laughing an infernal laugh. Jean Roche Cognier, a long serving grognard of peasant origins, who had risen to officer rank in the elite Imperial Guard. There was no longer any discipline or any human feeling for one another. Each man looked out for himself. Every sentiment of humanity was extinguished. No one would have reached out his hand to his father, and that can be easily understood. For he who stooped down to help his fellow would not be able to rise again. The men fell, frozen stiff, all along the road. If, by chance, any of them came upon a bivouac of other unfortunate creatures, who were thawing themselves, the newcomers pitilessly pushed them aside and took possession of their fire. The poor creatures would then lie down to die upon the snow. One must have seen these horrors in order to believe them. The starving soldiers threw away their pillage or desperately traded precious jewels and icons for the smallest scraps of food. Some ate raw flesh carved out of the sides of live horses, which didn't even notice because of the cold. Others, finding small supplies of flour, made a foul bread dough with axle grease substituting for fat and gunpowder for salt. The men slept in the open, and in the morning, the living would wake amid a field of snow-covered corpses. Lice and vermin gnawed at them. Toes, fingers, noses, and penises fell victim to frostbite, eyes to snow blindness. On November 23rd, the remains of the army reached the Berezina River, only to find the other side occupied by the Russians. Over the next few days, heroic soldiers, mostly Dutch, built two makeshift bridges farther north, standing up to their chins in the freezing water. Most of the army passed, but one bridge collapsed under the strain, and as the Russians approached, a mad panic ensued on the other. Thousands of soldiers and civilians rushed onto it, knocking each other into the ice-choked currents. At least 9,000 people died. Total war ends with an army transformed into a starving, skeletal, lice-ridden, barely human mass, covered in motley rags, its eyes blank and hopeless. This had been the case in the Vendée, at the end of the North Wind Turn, as the huddled remnants of the Catholic and Royal Army staggered to slaughter at the banks of the Loire. It was the case now in Western Russia, as the Grande Armée limped back across the Niemen. Assuming that Napoleon's object was to destroy his own army, wrote Tolstoy, the most expert strategist could hardly conceive of any other series of actions which would so completely and infallibly have accomplished that purpose. Indeed, Napoleon had not simply matched the Russian folly of Charles XII, but far exceeded it. According to the historian David Chandler, he lost a total of 370,000 men to death and 200,000 to Russian captivity. The numbers included nearly all of his 50,000-strong elite Imperial Guard, as well as 200,000 horses and 1,050 cannon.
The crusts on my hands, ears, and nose had grown like fur bark, with cracks and cold black scales, recalled Jacob Walter about the end of the retreat. My face resembled that of a heavily bearded Russian peasant, and when I looked into the mirror, I astonished myself. Napoleon's empire had likewise changed almost beyond recognition. Even this almost unimaginable catastrophe, though, did not by itself doom Napoleon. He still controlled most of continental Europe and still had Prussia and Austria as at least titular allies. He still had in place an efficient system of conscription and hoped in 1813 to raise no fewer than 656,000 new troops to carry on the war. He did not come close, but the number still suggests something of the scale of his capacities. But as the survivors of the Russian campaign reached a temporary safe haven in Poland, they had to deal with the consequences of two military disasters, not one. For total war in this period had two faces. One was the mammoth clashing of armies of the sort seen at Austerlitz, Wagram, Borodino, and Leipzig. But there was another as well, one more reminiscent of the Vendée. Chapter 8 War's Red Altar Millions to fight, compelled to fight or die, in mangled heaps on war's red altar lie. Percy Bysshe Shelley, 1809 Shall I die in prose? Theodore Connor, 1813 Back in the fall of 1806, even as Napoleon Bonaparte's Grande Armée was smashing irresistibly across northern Germany, a much smaller detachment of his soldiers was faltering in a seemingly much simpler task 900 miles to the south. In the Abruzzi region of southern Italy, Major Joseph Leopold Hugo was leading some 800 men deep into the Apennine Mountains. They were a motley group, even by the standards of Napoleon's new multinational empire. Mainland French, Corsicans, Italians, and, most strangely, black Haitians. Prisoners of war, taken in the suppression of Toussaint Louverture's independence struggle. Shipped to Europe, and formed into a French unit known as the Black Pioneers. Later, the Royal Africans. All owed nominal allegiance to the Kingdom of Naples, now ruled by Napoleon's brother Joseph. But in practice, they followed orders from Paris. They were chasing a legendary rebel leader, Michel Pesa, who went by the nickname of Fra Diavolo, Brother Devil. It should have been an easy task. The previous year, the French had conquered the Kingdom of Naples, which covered the bottom of the Italian peninsula. And in February, Joseph had arrived to take possession. As in the previous French invasion in 1799, a brush fire insurrection had quickly erupted, most fiercely in Calabria, the toe of the boot. This time the French had far more force at their command. But the British fleet controlled Neapolitan waters, and repeatedly landed insurgent leaders on the coast to keep the rebellion alive. In late August, they delivered Fra Diavolo to Sperlunga, north of the city of Naples, and he raised a force of 1,500 irregular troops. Throughout September, Hugo pursued him through the thickly wooded Apennines. In his memoirs, the French officer left a vivid sketch of the expedition the men struggling to climb steep, treacherous paths, slipping on the rocks, constantly at watch for ambushes. The autumn weather set in early, with repeated downpours that soaked the troops and left their guns almost useless. Once, Hugo saw several men killed by lightning. A strong earthquake had hit the Abruzzi earlier in the year, and the villages were half in ruins houses wavering precariously on skewed frames. Everywhere, the population knew the legend of Fra Diavolo, 
a peasant and former mule driver with small black eyes, who had risen from obscurity in 1799 and now claimed the title of Duke of Cassano, as well as the rank of brigadier in the Neapolitan army. Fra Diavolo repeatedly slipped through Hugo's hands. On September 24th, the French finally cornered his force and dispersed most of it, but he escaped with 150 followers. Throughout October, while Napoleon was chewing the Prussian army into sawdust and making his triumphant visit to the tomb of Frederick the Great, Major Hugo was desperately dividing his men to comb broad stretches of land, hoping to stop Fra Diavolo from reaching the coast and the safety of a British ship. Hugo, the 32-year-old son of a Lorraine carpenter and an 18-year veteran of the French army, must have wondered whether failure would bring his military career to a premature end. His mercurial wife had already managed to damage it badly by having an affair with a notorious anti-Napoleonic conspirator. Hugo may well have cast his thoughts back to an earlier, equally frustrating moment in his military life, chasing survivors of the Vendée Rebellion through the Breton countryside, at which time he had received a severe wound to the foot. It was only through a lucky break that, on November 1st, an apothecary in the village of Baranisi spotted Fra Diavolo and denounced him to the local constabulary, who handed him over to the French. Ten days later, the insurgent leader died on a scaffold in Naples. Hugo, now forgiven his wife's trespasses, could resume his rise through the ranks, eventually to become a general and a count in Bonapartist Spain. For the rest of his life, he would bore dinner-table companions with the story of the dramatic chase in the Abruzzi. He would wrinkle up his nose like a rabbit, a characteristic expression of the Hugos, wink as though he had a new joke up his sleeve, and then tell us what we had already heard twenty times before. The evocative description comes from Hugo's son Victor, born in 1802, who more than inherited his father's capacity for vivid prose. And yet, for all Hugo's personal satisfaction, his feat made surprisingly little difference. The insurgency in Calabria did not end with the capture of even so important a leader as Fra Diavolo. It would continue for another four years, and the French would need brutal, scorched-earth policies to extinguish it. For every leader they captured and executed, others rose up. Partisan bands would continue to raid French convoys, kill French soldiers, and force the French to divert scarce resources. In short, Calabria remained an open sore on the skin of Napoleon's empire an unneeded distraction at best, a source of dangerous infection at worst. And it was just one of many. The story of Hugo's chase therefore reveals another way that the Napoleonic Empire was overwhelmed by forces Napoleon himself had unleashed. As the territory under French control ballooned, a series of fierce, damaging revolts erupted across significant parts of it. From Portugal to the Tyrol to Russia, insurgents declared total war on France. In ironic echoes of the French levée en masse itself, they pledged every adult male to the fight, insisted that the entire population contribute in any way possible, and called for the death of every French soldier polluting their soil. The Empire responded much as the Republic had done in the Vendée, it branded the insurgents and their supporters brigands and outlaws who deserved none of the rights of ordinary combatants or even of ordinary criminals. They could, it declared, be summarily put to death, their homes and villages destroyed. In short, there loomed the sort of conflict that Carl Schmidt called absolute enmity. In some ways, of course, these merciless brushfire wars resembled a long string of earlier ones. Most immediately, 
the 1798-99 to uprisings that had stretched in a broad arc from Belgium and Western Germany through France itself to Italy. Before that, the Vendée. Before that, numerous old regime rebellions. One point in common was that the anti-Napoleonic insurgencies retained a strong religious component, with many invoking a Christian cause against the secular empire, just as their predecessors had done against religious opponents or the godless French Republic. Nonetheless, the anti-Napoleonic movements also represented something genuinely different, both in their sheer scale and in the place they came to occupy in the European imagination. In the long, grinding, hate-filled struggles of 1806-14, motley rebel bands were transfigured into a new sort of historical figure, the guerrilla, or partisan, symbol of a conflict without rules and without mercy, where each side utterly denied the other's right to fight, or indeed to exist. Symbol, in other words, of total war. Even the 1798-99 to uprisings, massive as they were, did not last long enough to produce these effects. Mostly, the French either restored order with reasonable speed or fled in disarray. Only in the Napoleonic years did a new word, guerrilla, itself drawn from the Spanish for little war, arise to describe what Europeans saw as a very different kind of conflict. Needless to say, this myth and rhetoric disguised a much more complex reality. The guerrillas did not in fact represent entire populations. In many countries, Napoleon had significant support. They did not always act out of patriotic self-interest, and often resembled actual brigands far more than their modern admirers would like to admit. They tended to mobilize and attack where French rule was most precarious, not most oppressive. And they proved most successful where they most closely mimicked regular armed forces, not where anarchic popular enthusiasm bubbled most intensely through their ranks. The French, for their part, did not fight systematic campaigns of extermination. Indeed, they often lost control of their operations leaving commanders on the ground to operate in conditions of near chaos, as had happened in the Vendée. Some of them came to informal or tacit agreements with their outlaw opponents. Others resorted to large-scale atrocities out of blind frustration or in a desperate attempt to prove to their superiors that they were doing something, anything, to restore order. Nonetheless, the myth and rhetoric had real importance, and helped give the insurgencies an influence that cascaded beyond their immediate effect of pinning down hundreds of thousands of French soldiers whom the Empire badly needed elsewhere. They reinforced the widespread image of Napoleon himself as an ogre, an outlaw, who did not deserve the status of honorable adversary, no matter how many emperors he embraced and they inspired his opponents to conceive of war in a new way, most importantly in the country where he had marked his greatest triumphs, Germany. For it was there, amid the battlefields that marked the definitive end to Napoleon's imperial ambitions in 1813, that the spectacle of the insurgencies helped turn enthusiasm about war for its own sake which had previously gripped only a small current of intellectuals, into a movement whose tones resounded deeply among the middle and upper classes, and that would have tremendous consequences in the century to come. It is tempting to think that Napoleon might have avoided all these events simply by showing more restraint. But the logic of total war was impossible to escape. As we discussed in the previous chapter, by 1812 France held effective sway over nearly the entire European continent, excluding the British Isles, Scandinavia, Russia, and the Turkish Empire. Most of the territory either fell under the direct rule of Paris, 
or belonged to an ally or satellite state, several headed by Bonaparte's. No conqueror could have easily kept control over such vast stretches of land, and the nature of Napoleonic imperialism made the task even more difficult. Victors of earlier wars, taking over a peripheral state such as Naples, might have contented themselves with looting it thoroughly and installing their own satraps at the head of its government, while leaving the bulk of its political and social system intact. But as the scope of the wars grew, Napoleon needed the new lands to provide him with revenues and, increasingly, conscripts to feed his ever-famished military machine. The result was drastic and hugely unpopular reform. In the Kingdom of Italy, the French doubled personal taxes and excise taxes, imposed an extraordinary contribution of 15 million lira, and instituted conscription with a four-year term of service. In Naples, despite the simmering rebellions, the government managed to nearly double its tax revenues under Joseph and his successor, Joachim Murat. Throughout Europe, Napoleon sought to tax clerical and noble wealth, which previous regimes had exempted from contributions, and to confiscate the fat land holdings of the Catholic Church, as the revolutionaries had done in France. These policies implied a radical change in the nature and weight of government influence in daily life. Large areas of Europe discovered a new phenomenon, pervasive bureaucracy, particularly new agencies for tax collection and conscription. With the bureaucracy most often came the Napoleonic Law Code and a reorganization of the territory into French-style départements, both of which disrupted traditional forms of government and social relations. To implement the new order, there came new police forces, often staffed largely by Frenchmen. In the end, Napoleon often found these complex changes easiest to implement through simple annexations to the empire itself. By 1812, the high watermark of Napoleonic imperialism, its borders had washed up over the Netherlands and the German North Sea coast, down across Catalonia, and as far as the eastern coast of the Adriatic, today belonging largely to Slovenia and Croatia. As the historian Stuart Wolfe has put it, annexation became a skilled art, practiced by a trained body of professionals who moved from one territory to the next, managing the absorption of each in turn. But these dislocations, especially when compounded by attacks on the Catholic Church, fed insurrection. True, the major rebellions broke out only in relatively restricted areas, Calabria, Tyrol, Portugal, and Spain. But lower-level resistance to French rule smoldered throughout much of the rest of Europe, and it often took only small sparks of conflict to ignite high-octane disaffection. In 1809, for instance, the introduction of new taxes and regulations on the milling of wheat in northern Italy led thousands of peasants, armed mostly with scythes and pitchforks, to attack major cities, including Bologna. The peasants held Rovigo in the Veneto for four days, robbing wealthy houses and inflicting particular violence on the Jews, who, just as in 1798 to 99, served as the peninsula's first choice of scapegoat. It took the combined efforts of the Italian Gendarmerie, National Guard, and Army, backed by French soldiers, to restore order. Drawing on examples from France itself during the Directory, imperial officials established heavy-handed military commissions in place of civil courts and gave them the power to mete out death sentences without appeal, 150 by the end of 1809 alone. Napoleon himself expected such difficulties and, to a certain extent, took them in stride. Soon after he had dispatched his brother Joseph to Naples in 1806, he warned him, 
Include in your calculations the fact that within a fortnight, more or less, you will have an insurrection. It is an event that constantly occurs in occupied countries. As a result, he gave hardened military men a prominent place in the ranks of the annexation professionals. Jacques-François Menu, the one-time liberal aristocrat who had belonged to the Constituent Assembly, survived the terror and accompanied Napoleon to Egypt, where he converted to Islam, was one of them. He served effectively in Piedmont, rose to become Governor-General of Tuscany, where he gained a reputation for excessive severity, and finally moved to the Veneto, where he oversaw the suppression of the 1809 Troubles. Despite the excesses, men like Menu knew their business, and for a surprisingly long time, the Napoleonic regime did manage to keep a semblance of order. But when the empire attempted to suppress the large Spanish insurrection that began in 1808, it simply could not do so. Instead, Spain became the famous ulcer that ate away at the vitals of the empire, even before the limbs succumbed to Russian frostbite. In particular, Spain saw the development of a guerrilla war every bit as destructive as, and eerily similar to, the insurgency now underway in early 21st century Iraq. Before Spain, however, there was southern Italy in 1806-10, where much of the pattern was set. The festering memories of 1799, when French General Championnet had attempted to transform the Kingdom of Naples into the Parthenopian Republic, primed the inhabitants for later resistance. It was during the collapse of this unstable puppet state that Fra Diavolo had made his name, and that Cardinal Fabrizio Rufo had organized tens of thousands of men, from small guerrilla bands known as the Mas, into a Vendean-style army called the Santa Fede, Holy Faith, which carried out dreadful atrocities against retreating French soldiers. It would take little for these bands which drew on well-established patterns of smuggling, banditry, and resistance to central authority, to come together again. At first, the new French conquest seemed to go much more smoothly. In late December 1805, after the Bourbon rulers had unwisely entered the war, Napoleon declared that the dynasty of Naples has ceased to reign. He backed up his bombast with three French corps, two of which advanced easily down the Italian peninsula. By the end of March, they had brought all the mainland kingdom under French control, and the Bourbon rulers fled across the straits to the protection of the British navy in Sicily. In place of the Bourbons came Joseph Bonaparte, Napoleon's more reflective, pleasure-loving older brother, who shared his literary inclinations and had even, in 1799, published a novel, Moina, or The Peasant Girl of Mont Cenis. Previously, Joseph had often chafed under Napoleon's hectoring, protesting about his tyranny and insatiable ambition, and his tendency to turn even family members into slaves. But the promise of a kingdom brought about a rapid and predictable change of heart. King Giuseppe I was soon holding royal audiences in Naples. Yet the situation in Calabria, isolated, mountainous, close to Sicily, remained volatile. On March 22nd, in Silveria, near the Ionian Sea, a brawl over the requisitioning of horses by French soldiers led General Jean-Antoine Verdier to send 200 troops to restore order. A band of more than a thousand armed peasants ambushed them, killed or wounded 40, and captured 26, whom they tortured and, in some cases, castrated. The French army then returned in force, raising the village and taking hundreds of prisoners, French military commissions tried and shot 200 of them. Nonetheless, in the next weeks, scores of other towns rose up against the French, 
and for the moment the French forces were spread too dangerously thin to stamp out each spark of resistance. The corps commanded by Marshal Massena remained bogged down north of Naples, while General Rainier in the south had scarcely 9,000 men, many sick, out of the 20,000 he deemed necessary to bring Calabria under firm control. In the vacuum, the mass quickly came back into action, under leaders who operated under colorful bandit chieftain nicknames such as the Executioner, Il Boya, the Bizarre, Il Bizarro, the Monk, Il Manajo, Little Joseph, Giuseppeo, and, of course, Fra Diavolo. The British made matters worse by transporting insurgents by sea and finally landing several thousand redcoats in Calabria itself. On July 4th, they routed Rainier's corps at the Battle of Maida, leaving him with barely 4,000 men in fighting shape. In the aftermath, even more villages rose up, and isolated detachments of French troops suffered gruesome fates, along with Italians who had supported Joseph's regime. In Acre, the guerrilla leader Spacapita, the stonecutter, roasted pro French office holders alive. An insurgent leader gave a speech in Fiumefredo, arguing that a people's war was different from ordinary fighting. Oh, we must hammer the enemies, ambush them, cut off their communications and supplies, and then, attackers and bystanders alike, withdraw to safe places. Above all, Italians needed to wage a war of extermination against those in their ranks who supported King Joseph. The words amounted to a manifesto of guerrilla war. The insurgents did not fit the model of selfless, nationalist freedom fighters. The French officer Nicolas de Vernois, admittedly not the most impartial of witnesses, claimed that the monk and the deacon devoted more energy to extorting food, arms, money, and even women from the wealthy Calabrian property owners than they did to attacking the French. But even the insurgents' ally, British General Sir John Moore, called them Mafia, a lawless banditti, enemies to all governments, whatever, fit to plunder and murder, but much too dastardly to face an enemy. Both the insurgents and Italians who serve the new regime frequently pursued long-standing vendettas and rivalries under the mask of their competing patriotic rhetorics. Nonetheless, they inflicted real damage on the French, in what Rainier himself called the most monstrous of wars. At the end of June 1806, the French seemed to recover somewhat. The Massena finally moved south with an additional 6,000 men. The temporizing British again withdrew to Sicily, allowing Rainier to move freely throughout the region. The French also struggled to raise a local force of civic guards and a native cavalry unit. Eventually, they hoped, native Italians would take over responsibility for maintaining order in the kingdom, with French forces left with the sole task of guarding against British invasion. This is a classic response to guerrilla war, from Napoleon down to Richard Nixon's policy of Vietnamization and the present-day American attempts to create a new Iraqi army. In the long term, in the Kingdom of Naples, it would have some success. In the short term, however, Joseph Bonaparte's government mostly preferred a different, more brutal strategy. Total suppression, as in the Vendée. On July 24th, his cabinet council approved a manifesto drawn up by Antoine Christophe Salicetti, an early Corsican patron of Napoleon's who had now become one of the leading professionals of annexation. It declared Calabria in a state of rebellion and ordered the confiscation of rebel property, the burning of rebel villages, and the erection of public scaffolds to display the bodies of captured insurgents. All these measures commented Joseph's counselor Mio de Melito significantly, 
were similar to those which had been taken by the Convention during the Vendean War. Within days, Massena proved the accuracy of the comparison. On August 8, 1806, the vanguard of his 6,000-man force, marching south into Calabria, arrived at the town of Loria, where the Mas had decided to take a stand. Swathed by steep wooded cliffs, boulders, and ravines, surrounded by thick walls, and boasting an impressive ancient citadel, it made for a strong defensive position. A French officer approached, under a flag of truce, to demand submission and supplies. But the Mas refused in the most dramatic fashion possible. They sent the man back in pieces, in a basket, along with a letter reading, Here is the ration of supplies which the town of Laurius sends to the French, the only one suitable for them. In response, Massena ordered a general assault without quarter. Jean-Michel Chevalier, who would later accompany Napoleon to Russia, remembered, Our enraged soldiers clambered up the rocks all around, and despite the inhabitants' desperate defense, despite a hail of bullets, we reached the main town square, and then everything was sacrificed to our implacable vengeance. The old men, women, and children fired on us from the windows or threw stones down at us. We were finally forced to set the entire town on fire. And there then took place, under our eyes, the most terrible scene. Women, old men, and children rushed out of the burning houses and threw themselves at the feet of their conquerors. But the maddened and furious soldiers slaughtered them. In a letter to King Joseph, Massena insisted that he had been unable to prevent excesses in the flush of victory, but added, It cannot be doubted that Loria will have a salutary effect. Joseph himself reported to his brother that This terrible example appears to have restored order. The French, who went on to sack an additional twenty-five villages in the vicinity, found 734 bodies in Lauria and the surrounding heights. A Neapolitan colonel estimated the dead and wounded together at 3,000. Over the next months, the French continued to use such tactics, all too reminiscent of the Vendée's infernal columns. After Rainier dispersed several hundred insurgents near San Giovanni, he hanged the fifty who tried to surrender. In another insurgent village, the French imprisoned all the inhabitants until they denounced the insurgent leaders. De Vernois would recall with pride that he exhibited the heads of 184 insurgents in iron cages along the road south from Loria. It was important, he wrote, to maintain the salutary terror spread by such examples. Yet, frustratingly, for all these examples, the most powerful army on earth still could not impose its will. It could seize the major towns, but this success meant little in a region where the two largest, Monteleone and Reggio, had scarcely 27,000 inhabitants between them. The French army corps themselves could move about unmolested, but smaller detachments regularly fell prey to attacks from hundreds, even thousands of peasants and artisans, armed mostly with blunderbusses and pitchforks, who sometimes tortured their prisoners to death. As the guerrilla leader at Fiumifredo had urged, French communications and supplies were regularly cut off. But no sooner had the attacks, chaotic and terrifying, taken place then the insurgents melted back into the hills. It took until the winter of 1810-11 to 11 for the empire to prevail, by which point Napoleon had shifted Joseph to Spain. A new French general, Charles-Antoine Manès, dispatched civic guards to areas suspected of supporting the partisans, with orders to shoot anyone leaving their village at night or carrying food outside it during the day. Starved of supplies and increasingly isolated from the peasantry, the partisans turned reckless 
and one after another of their leaders fell into French hands. Calabria, for all the occasional ferocity of its resistance, had ultimately proved too weak and too divided to disrupt Napoleon's war machine on a permanent basis. For this reason, theorists such as Carl Schmitt generally overlook its role in prefiguring the later, more successful Spanish insurgency. Nonetheless, a crimson thread leads straight from the Vendée to Calabria, and from there throughout Europe. It would take a very long book to discuss in detail all the places this crimson thread touched. It touched Russia in 1812, where flying detachments approved by General Kutuzov harassed French stragglers in supply lines, and where the hussar officer Denis Davidov, wearing peasant costume in a large cross of St. Anne, led thousands of peasants and irregular troops against units of Napoleon's army. It touched Germany, as we shall discuss, and it touched the alpine fastnesses of the Tyrol, a region today divided between Austria and Italy. In 1805, Napoleon had passed the Tyrol from its traditional Austrian rulers to the heavy-handed control of his ally, King Max Joseph of Bavaria. But when Bavarian control turned wobbly in 1809, an insurrection broke out, led by the pious, charismatic innkeeper Andreas Hofer. The Bavarians responded with a disastrous mixture of savagery and incompetence, forcing Napoleon to deploy his own more efficient forces of repression, who eventually overwhelmed Hofer's poorly armed but enthusiastic bands. At one point, the emperor ordered his commander, Declare that I will put the country to fire and sword if they don't turn in all their guns. Every house in which a gun is found shall be razed, and every Tyrolean on whom a gun is found shall be put to death. But it was Spain, whose violent resistance began even before the Tyrolean revolt, and continued long after that the crimson thread touched most profoundly, and where the ground wave of insurrections grew strong enough to shake Napoleon's rule. As early as the summer of 1807, Napoleon had begun to contemplate overthrowing the Spanish branch of the Bourbon dynasty, which had proved anything but a reliable ally to him. He blamed it for the naval disaster at Trafalgar, and after taking Berlin in 1806, he found evidence that Spain had briefly conspired with Prussia against him. To top things off, the conduct of the Spanish royal family lurched embarrassingly between melodrama and farce. For years, the lumpish, mentally unstable King Carlos IV had effectively surrendered power to a favorite, Manuel Godoy, who was generally known to be the lover of Queen Maria Luisa. Fernando, the royal couple's 23-year-old son and heir, was a vain, ignorant bigot who had conspired against his father and written to Napoleon to enlist his help. In October 1807, these letters came to light, and the king put his son under arrest. Godoy was meanwhile seeking, with embarrassing servility, to placate his French patron. The very day of Fernando's arrest, Spain and France signed the Treaty of Fontainebleau, under whose secret terms a French army could cross Spanish territory en route to its invasion of Portugal, which had defied the continental blockade. The treaty foresaw the partition of Portugal into three parts, with one part destined for Godoy himself. In November, General Jean Andoche Junot crossed the Pyrenees with 28,000 troops. Despite poor logistics that left his men starving and in large part almost barefoot, they overcame weak Portuguese resistance and stumbled into Lisbon in early December. The Portuguese ruling family fled to its colony of Brazil. Yet Napoleon did not proceed with the partition plan. Instead, he sounded out his brother, by now relatively secure in Naples, 
about moving to Spain. Initially, Joseph refused, but Napoleon bided his time and continued to reinforce his army in Spain until, by spring 1808, it had reached a strength of nearly 120,000. Resorting to ruses, including, at one point, distracting Spanish soldiers with a snowball fight, these troops peacefully occupied important Spanish fortresses. Marshal Murat made a flamboyant entrance into Madrid on horseback, accompanied by trumpeters, drummers, lavishly uniformed cavalry, and 87 turbaned Egyptian Mamelukes, a living relic of the Egyptian expedition. Murat, who was Napoleon's brother-in-law, hoped that the emperor might give the crown of Spain to him, and his upbeat reports to Paris about Spanish opinion served this ambition. Your Majesty, he wrote Napoleon at one point, is a weighted heir like the Messiah. A slight exaggeration, to say the least. But initially, few Spaniards saw the French as invaders. Even before Murat's arrival, the conspiratorial Fernando, released from parental imprisonment, had given Napoleon his opening for the desired change of dynasty. On March 17th, his supporters rioted at the royal residence of Aranjuez, forcing Godoy's dismissal and Carlos's abdication. But Napoleon refused to recognize Fernando's ascension and instead summoned both father and son to meet with him personally. In the meantime, the Spanish population had finally grown anxious about the swelling French presence, and when rumors spread that Murat had abducted a Bourbon prince, an uprising took place in Madrid itself. The French suppressed it amid gory street fighting, and the next day, firing squads summarily executed hundreds of prisoners. The painter Francisco de Goya later devoted two of his most brilliant works to these two days in May. One painting highlighted the small number of Mamelukes in the French force so as to evoke Spain's long struggle against Islam. Another offered a phantasmagorical tableau of implacable soldiers taking cold aim at an illuminated, Christ-like victim. The paintings made the Dos de Mayo and Tres de Mayo iconic dates of the Spanish War. Meanwhile, in Bayonne, just over the French border, the most imperious man of the age was behaving at his imperious worst. Rather than try to reconcile royal father and royal son, he insisted that they both abdicate in his favor, alternately cajoling, threatening, and bursting into fits of sheer rage. Napoleon had utter contempt for Fernando in particular. He is so stupid, I have not been able to get a word out of him, he wrote to Talleyrand. Whether you scold him or praise him, his face remains blank. To Fernando's counselor Escoiquiz, Napoleon boasted that nations with a lot of friars are easy to subjugate. I have had experience with them. When Escoiquiz protested that all Spain would rise up in rebellion, the emperor answered, as it turned out prophetically, Even if that happened, even if I had to sacrifice two hundred thousand men, it would be the same. In the short term, the threats worked. Father and son both surrendered their rights and departed for exile in France. The emperor then played a game of musical thrones, ordering Joseph to trade Naples for Madrid, and giving Murat, a former grocer and army private, the lesser but nonetheless royal reward of southern Italy. In Madrid, the Bonapartes at first attempted conciliation, with a moderate new constitution that respected at least some Spanish political traditions. The confidence and scorn that Napoleon's men felt as they poured into Spain in the late spring of 1808 could not match Napoleon's at Bayonne, but was still breathtakingly vast. Surely, they believed, this corrupt and somnolent country could pose no serious resistance to the greatest empire since Rome. <laughs> 
to judge from their letters and memoirs, Imperial soldiers and administrators mostly seem to have the same impressions. The dirty, poor, and old-fashioned appearance of Spanish houses, the profusion of monastic robes in the streets, the dark and wild look of the men, who all seemed lice-ridden. The more literary-minded among the French compared crossing the Pyrenees to a journey in time. The financier Ouvrard wrote eloquently, I was leaving a country where all traces of the past had disappeared, where everything dated from the day before. In a moment, I was finding myself thrown back several centuries. The monastic costumes mixed in with the people. It was a representation of the 17th century. It was history in action. According to the officer Heinrich von Brandt, one of many Germans who served the empire in Spain, Spaniards still believed that heretics and Jews had horns and tails. Following the philosophes of the Enlightenment, who judged societies by their place on the great ladder of historical progress, and following the revolutionaries who had transformed such judgments into political action, Napoleon's men condemned the Spanish as weak and archaic in equal measure. What the French did not expect was the following. Oh, happy Gothic barbarian and fanatical Spaniards! Happy with our monks and with our Inquisition, which, according to the ideas of the French Enlightenment, has kept us a century behind other nations. Oh, if we could only go back two centuries more! These lines, written by Spanish General Manuel Freire de Castrillon, in 1808, formed part of a smoking lava flow of broadsheets and pamphlets that answered Napoleon's actions and helped prompt the uprisings. These writings had little real ideological coherence. Some spoke of liberty and independence in terms that French liberals would have found familiar, and even set their words to the tune of the Marseillaise. Some adopted a language of national hatred similar to that of Robespierre or Barrère, depicting the French as barbaric, even inhuman. What sort of thing is a Frenchman? A being monstrous and indefinable. A being half-created. There is nobody who does not have the right to kill these ferocious animals. Others, many others, appealed to religious faith. You... Napoleon, are insulting all of heaven. You are blaspheming God and his very holy mother. You are trampling the very sacred heart of Jesus Christ. But what all the writers did, in one way or another, was to sling the invaders' judgments back in their faces and to claim Spain's apparent weaknesses as strengths. And they were accompanied by uprisings across the country that seemed to prove the point. Barcelona, Saragossa, Oviedo, Seville, Valencia, Madrid, and many more. This was not the inevitable insurrection in a fortnight against which Napoleon had warned Joseph in Naples. This was rebellion on a massive scale. The so-called Peninsular War would follow a twisting and complex course for more than five years in the initial fighting, popular resistance across the country, combined with the action of Spanish regular forces, nearly drove the French back across the Pyrenees. The Spanish even forced an entire French army into the humiliating surrender of Belen on July 19, 1808. Soon afterward, the British expeditionary force under the future Lord Wellington compelled Junot to evacuate Portugal. Napoleon, however, personally took charge of the return engagement, crushing the Spanish at Burgos and Somosierra in the fall of 1809 and putting Joseph back in Madrid with a new, more radical constitution that struck at feudal rights and instituted religious toleration. From then until 1813, French, Spanish, Portuguese and British armies ranged back and forth across the peninsula, while bands of guerrillas grew steadily larger, better organized, 
and more similar to regular armed forces. Fighting between the regular armies concentrated particularly around the Spanish-Portuguese border, with fortress towns such as Ciudad Rodrigo and Barajos changing hands several times. A legitimist Spanish government, loyal to the longed-for king Fernando, el rey de Seattle, challenged King José Bonaparte, mostly from the southern city of Cadiz. At times, the French faced little opposition from regular armies, but the guerrillas were a different matter, and the number of troops Napoleon had to maintain in the peninsula testify eloquently to their importance. From 165,000 in June 1808 to more than 300,000 in October, and to well over 350,000 men in July 1811. Only when the Russian campaign greedily sucked men away did the number shrink, falling below 100,000 by July 1813 with catastrophic consequences. Estimates of total French military deaths in Spain vary widely but they may have amounted to as many as 180,000, eerily close to Napoleon's 1808 prediction. In the meanings it held for its participants, the peninsula